My three wives are beautiful vampires. Chapter 651, The Path of Power Vine looked at the Blood Dome curiously, she knew this kind of ability was exclusive. Blood was the soul's currency, after all, only progenitors of a specific race had this ability and the ability to devour souls. Vine opened her eyes wide as she realized something. Several elemental powers, an extremely handsome man, the power of blood, and the ability to devour souls. Alucard. She couldn't be one of the pillars that were tasked with the new conquest of Diablo, the king of demons, after all, she was a traitor who was allied with Lilith, but she was definitely aware of the list of dangerous individuals that the Diablo himself created. His informants in the highest hierarchy were exceptionally competent, and on this list, this man was at the top of it. Everyone knew it, all the best informed demons in hell knew it. Am I going senile? Was I too blinded by my lust? The evidence was blatantly in front of me. When Vine had first set her sights on the beautiful demon, she thought about taking him for herself. She had thought he was some variant of Incubus or something, after all, he didn't have wings, a tail, or horns that Incubuses had. I was foolish. She thought bitterly. Well, she was a demon, committing sins was her essence and she didn't want to admit that demons were often lost in their own sin. In her case, the sins of lust and pride being more predominant. But, if he really is Alucard, how is he here? Did he die? And if he died, who killed him? Vine could be described as a cunning demon, everyone who'd reached the ranks of 72 pillars was. Of course, some of these pillar demons excelled in the matters of cunning, and one of those names was Baal, and a rank 61 demon named Zagan. That demon was an unknown variable even to his fellow pillars. Vine considered herself one of the most cunning because she always knew how to take advantage of everything and everyone. However, this trait was usually overshadowed by her desires, which she had a handle on most of the time. But something about this man made it impossible for her to control her inner desires. He was very attractive to her. It was as if a very juicy piece of meat stood before her, and she couldn't control herself. His look, his smell, his strength, everything about him drew her like a moth to the flame. Demons weren't beings one would associate with restraint. They are actually the opposite of that, and because of that, she couldn't resist. Vine quickly shook her head internally and tried not to think about it right now. She kicked her horny side away and forced her rational side to act. He doesn't look dead to me, he's not like those evil spirits about to become demons at any moment. He's very much alive. But how is he here? And the most important question, how is he still alive? Progenitor or not, he should be dead with so much miasma around. Vine. With the same neutral expression, with the same relaxed posture, he declared. Serve me forever, body and soul. At. Any thoughts going through Vine's head were thrown out the window. She was stunned. As a mortal, and a progenitor vampire, she never would have believed he'd associate with her race. She thought Victor just wanted information or something like that, an attitude similar to the old progenitor. And in return. I will give this to you. Victor raised his hand, and a red wave of energy formed above his palm. Power. Vine's entire body shuddered visibly. She looked at the red energy in his hand with greedy, obsessive eyes. Now I understand why I wanted him so much. He has so much energy inside him, I was drawn to it. The only way to grow as a demon is through energy cannibalism. Of course, training was also possible, but it was easier and more beneficial just to kill a stronger demon and absorb that demon's energy into herself. This was how the demonic pillars were born. This was how the strong demons, considered legends today, were born. As the keeper of Roxanne, a world tree of negativity, Victor was a full course meal for demons due to the ridiculous amounts of negative energy that his body constantly absorbed. If it were before he came to hell, Victor wouldn't be able to do this, he wouldn't be able to use the pure energy of negativity as he'd just demonstrated. 
but being in his element and feeding Roxanne with that energy, such a feat was possible. He merely needed to draw on Senjutsu energy as he usually did, and Roxanne would focus on the negative aspect of her energy, and voila. If he had it alone, this would not be easy to do, but with Roxanne's help, it was a straightforward process, after all, the energy was originally hers. This lowly demon has a question. Speak. What is your objective, Alucard? Victor didn't show surprise that she knew his name, in his mind, it would be strange if she didn't, after all, he caused a massacre before he ended up in hell. What a silly question. A sneer appeared on Victor's face. What other goal but to conquer? A predatory smile appeared on Victor's face. Vine opened her eyes wide. I will take this hell for myself, I will become its king. He wasn't willing to let this comfortable place belong to someone else. He felt terrific here, Roxanne felt amazing here. Therefore, he would conquer this place for himself and make it his home. It was common sense. This is insanity. Does he even know how many demons there are here? The number surpasses 50 billion easily. And most of them are on Diablo's side. Ha, it seems you don't believe I can do this. Vine winced. I it's not that. She took a deep breath and explained, this specific hell is one of the biggest hells alongside the Buddhist hell. One of the reasons for that is this hell associates with the two biggest religions of the mortal world, which have the largest number of believers. The number of demons in this hell is insane, it's impossible to conquer everything. What she stated was common sense. It was madness to think that one could control such a vast hell. No one could completely rule this hell, not even Lucifer could. Yes, everyone respected him, along with Lilith, but some of the most influential demons were constantly plotting against the two in the shadows. That was the nature of demons. They were beings of strife. They respected the strong and only the strong, and because of this reason, no demon king must falter, or his own allies would dethrone them. Not even the current king respected as a primordial demon born from all the evils of mankind, cannot rule this hell completely. Just because someone has never achieved it in the past doesn't mean someone won't do it in the future. Common sense and rules don't bind me, Victor spoke in disdain. There are no words for limitation or impossibility in my way of life. The only thing that stops me from doing what I want is my will. If I say this hell will be conquered, Vine. It's because it will. Vine opened her eyes even wider, and that's when she understood more of the being in front of her. He wasn't arrogant for declaring that nonsense. He was merely supremely confident in his ability. He had confidence in achieving something that no one had ever attained. The demons were never united under a single banner and will. It was impossible, they were too numerous. But maybe. A being capable of making a demon cry a being that broke my pride, a being that slaughtered all my demonic legions and didn't even break a sweat during the feat. Just maybe. Maybe it's possible? Vine didn't know if it was because of her attraction to the power, or the future possibility she thought of, she didn't know for sure, but the words that came out of her mouth were natural. I, rank 45 of the 72 demonic pillars, she lowered her head, and her determination was heard in her following words. King Vine, swear submission and undying loyalty to Victor Alucard. Those words put an even bigger smile on Victor's face. I felt your lust for power, I felt your conviction, I felt your determination, and I will satisfy you. Red energy began to flow toward Vine's body, fueling the female demon's body. Her body was covered in that energy, healing her, improving her, making her, superior. This power is Alucard's power. Her eyes widened, it feels so good. Dot. Then, her eyes shone with a dreamy look. Soon a pillar of demonic energy exploded in front of Victor. A few minutes later, the blood dome disappeared, revealing Vine with apparent differences. She was smaller, the previously 2.5 meter tall demon had shrunk to 2 meters tall, and her body, her muscles, everything became more compact. 
the bulky and unnecessary muscles disappeared, and her body became wholly defined. Her appearance and beauty had also improved drastically, accompanied by an increase in the area of the buttocks and breasts. The size of her horns, wings, and tail decreased, but these changes in appearance were inferior to what was inside. Her energy, had practically quadrupled. And that fact drove all the demonic pillars watching from a distance crazy. Both those who were at the lowest levels of hell and those who were at the highest. This abrupt increase in power was ridiculous. The only thought everyone had was. What did he do? Vine opened her eyes, that's. She looked down at her hands with a big smile that made Victor very pleased. Power. She clenched both fists tightly. Feeling several beings staring at her, Vine narrowed her eyes. Her eyes, with black sclera and red irises that glowed with power, looked up at the sky in irritation. Worms, how dare you watch my lord? She hadn't noticed before because she was so focused on Victor, but now that she was no longer distracted, she could detect the gazes of the other demonic pillars. A gigantic axe with a handle the size of a halberd made entirely of ice landed in front of Vine. The woman looked at the axe and gripped the handle. When Vine held the axe's handle, she realized it suited her perfectly, even the weight was ideal. This is no ordinary axe. Vine could feel a ridiculous amount of energy in the axe in her hands. She was absolutely certain that nothing below her master's level could damage this axe. He did it just with his power, incredible. A shadow appeared behind Vine, showing off his blood-red eyes and twisted smile glinting with evil. He grabbed the woman's shoulders and whispered in her ear like an evil entity asking the innocent woman to do things most mortals would tremble in fear at the slightest mention. Remember, you serve me and me alone. Never bow your head to anyone but me. Reserve your pride for me. Reserve your lust for me. You are mine and nobody else's. Hum. Vine's body shuddered when she felt Victor's gentle touches on her shoulder and cheeks. Victor held her cheeks and turned her face towards him, you are no longer a demonic pillar. Abandon that useless title. You, from today onward, are my general, my sword. If I say to you attack, you will attack. If I say retreat, you will retreat. Victor's affectionate gestures, the sweet words, and every action were as if he was forcing a mindset shift on Vine, but that was far from the truth. He was simply making the woman in front of him completely his. I value obsessive loyalty but despise blind and dumb loyalty. You're mine, body, and soul, but that doesn't mean I want a mindless tool that can't think. Don't forget, Vine. True strength is not the power I have given you, but what you devote that power to. What I devote it to. Vine thought deeply about Victor's words as she lost herself in those dark red eyes that looked like crimson black holes. Now, prove to me that I wasn't wrong in choosing you, prove to me that you can be mine. Conquer all demons from rank 46 to rank 60. What? Vine woke up from her numb state and thought she was hearing things but the murderous gazes of the demons spying on her assured her that she wasn't. Kill, steal, blackmail, bribe, I don't care how. Victor's smile just grew and grew in a twisted, evil way. He was more demonic than the demons themselves. I want everyone on their knees before me in less than six months. If you managed to complete the task. Victor's demonic tone changed to a seductive manner, like an incubus seducing an innocent woman. Vine shuddered visibly. Her breathing got heavier, her tail wagged, and her wings trembled slightly. I will reward you with anything you desire. Hum. Dot. With just his voice, he made the woman reach climax. A feat that only someone who knew women very well and had the blessing of sexuality and Aphrodite's love could pull off. You can do this. Vine's eyes gleamed with lust, determination, and devotion. Her answer to that question was obvious. Of course. Good. Chapter 652, An Opportunity Vlad, who was preparing to visit a very ancient bloodline of vampire nobles in South Africa, was taken aback by Morgana's sudden visit. If you're here, 
it's because something happened. Speak. Vlad was short and to the point. He didn't want to take too long, whatever happened must have been significant enough for Morgana, a woman who clearly didn't have a high opinion of him, to come here to say something. Victor was ambushed along with Eleanor and her squad. Elder God's direct subordinates wanted to kill everyone with a trap, but thanks to Victor's intervention, that didn't happen. A hush fell over the room. Of all the news Vlad had been waiting for, this was definitely not one of them. Controlling the killing intent that rose due to hearing the phrase subordinates of the Elder Gods, Vlad took the most natural action possible. Has anyone been harmed severely? The reason for the question was simple. Vlad knew how dangerous the skills of the natives of this world were. Just as the Adrastella clan specialized in killing them. The natives of this world specialized in killing their invaders. This turf war that started from the moment Vlad set foot on this planet taught both races many things. Nothing happened. My darling saved everyone at the expense of his safety, Morgana spoke in disdain. Vlad narrowed his eyes when he heard what Morgana said. Hearing his ex-wife say that in front of him wasn't a very good feeling. I assume you were sent here to keep me on my toes about my visit to South Africa. As much as I'd love to see your ass get harmed, I can't jeopardize the safety of my daughters and family because of my selfish desire. Knowing full well that the family she spoke of did not include him, Vlad said. Tell me more about what happened. Vlad's priority was to understand what was going on. Morgana nodded and began to explain from the beginning. Minutes passed, and when Morgana finished explaining the events to Vlad, the Vampire King had a thoughtful look on his face. That description, they are definitely messengers of the Elder Gods, direct subordinates of those bastards. They even brought a servant to channel their immortality. Is Victor being targeted? Why? Oh, they're scared of his potential, hey. Having someone with the same level of power as me in the future is something they don't want. Victor's previous display of power must have made them rush things. Vlad deduced. Vlad knew Victor's casual demonstration of lighting up all of Nightingale with that white fire would not go down well with the natives. Noble vampires might be afraid and even respect Victor now as if he were Vlad himself, after all, the title of progenitor carried a lot of weight, but that was just in vampire society. The vampire's enemies would not like to see the race grow stronger. Despite feeling conflicted about Victor and having a frenemy-type relationship with him, he understood how important Victor was to society as a whole. Like it or not, both progenitors became the point of propaganda for outsiders. This was one of the reasons that the city built by the Snow Clan was receiving so many refugees. Even with the bad reputation of vampires with humans, some human families linked to Nightingale still chose to fall under the protection of vampires. The reason for this was that the second progenitor, Victor Alucard, despite his genocidal infamy, was ironically seen as a just man. After all, news of the genocide he committed only involving people who had a direct or indirect connection to the girl named Ophis Teeps was well spread. The takeaway from that incident? Innocents were spared, only the guilty would suffer. Another reason for this mentality was that everyone knew that if Vlad had gone to Japan, everything would have been wiped out, and a war between Vlad and the Shinto faction could have ensued. Victor was the lesser evil in that story. But one thing doesn't cease to amaze me. Victor managed to escape a trap of beings he'd never encountered before. His sense of combat is very sharp. Vlad decided to give this merit to Victor and Scat Hatch, who taught him so well. Few could escape from a trap made by these beings alive. Morgana looked at Vlad with a neutral gaze. Even after explaining all the events that had transpired, she didn't address Ruby's speculations about who Victor's enemies were. The reason for this was quite simple. She didn't trust Vlad. She didn't trust that the man before her wouldn't contact these enemies and conspire with them to form a sneaky trap for Victor and his family. What better way to eliminate an enemy than to have another common enemy eliminate them for you? Morgana was once a demon. She went through twisted schemes like this in the past several times when she was Lilith's general. Vlad thought and thought, but still, 
he couldn't understand something. Why hell? He couldn't understand that specific point. As someone who had fought directly with the Elder Gods, he knew what kind of powerful beings existed on the other side of the world, beings that only God Kings could fight. If the natives wanted to eliminate Victor and ensure he was ultimately killed, they would not only send their subordinates but an Elder God as well. If you want a threat eliminated, do it yourself. All the Elder Gods Vlad had encountered in the past lived by that thought. The trap made no sense to Vlad. He had the feeling that only a specific group wanted to eliminate Victor as quickly as possible, and because of that, they made this sloppy plan. Something else is going on. Something involving Victor. And I need to know. Vlad's eyes glowed blood red a little, and he looked at Morgana, who looked more beautiful than he remembered, not to mention that her demonic features were more prominent than before. Vlad narrows his eyes in suspicion, what happened to you? Morgana. The woman displayed a gentle smile and spoke with a voice that could cut through steel. That is none of your business. I delivered my message and warned you. If you lose or get your ass kicked in some trap, that's your problem. Her tone of voice changed to a worried one, I will go back because my husband is somewhere in hell, alone and desperate. He needs my help. Vlad just rolled his eyes. Why was she talking like Victor was a helpless child? He was one of the deadliest creatures in the supernatural world. Morgana, have you been out of hell for so long that you forgot something so simple? Hey! Time in the hellish dimensions and heaven pass differently. Biblical hell, in particular, experiences a time dilation that changes the deeper you are, all because of the concentration of miasma. Fuck, I had forgotten about that. I need to warn them quickly. Morgana ran towards the exit of the office and shouted. Natalia. Vlad rolled his eyes. She really hadn't changed that much, she kept missing important details. Didn't she realize this is an opportunity for the bastard? He can get even stronger because of this time dilation. And even more insane too. After all, hell is not good for any being's mentality. The concentrated miasma will drive any mortal mad eventually. Even if he thought about it, Vlad was sure Victor would be fine, after all, he had that damn world tree with him. Hell was more his home than the demons themselves. A portal appeared where Morgana exited, and soon Alexios emerged from it. The man's expression was severe, even his eyes were open, indicating an urgency. My king, they managed to make a countermeasure to my powers. I know, I just got the report of events. This is bad. This way, all your plans will go down the drain. That's not true. Vlad's eyes flashed with a calculating look. If they had the means to block your power completely, they would have already invaded us, they fear your clan too much. Remember that the difference in power between you and your daughter is like comparing an ant to an elephant. The difference is stark. Alexio's apprehensions started to fade, and slowly he started to close his eyes and return to his neutral expression. He's right, I shouldn't get so nervous. Alexios, can you rescue Victor? Vlad asked curiously. That's impossible at this moment. Hell is completely closed, Diablo has ensured that no one other than himself and his demons can enter hell. Tisk, the ruler's authority, hey. I wonder how he managed to bypass the system. What kind of deal did he make with the judges of the abyss? It is quite clear that what he is doing now goes against the balance. He must have done something to ensure my friend does not visit him to throw the primordial demon into the limbo prison. No matter how much Vlad looked for answers, he couldn't find them. Questions involving the primordial seven that regulated existence were hard things to find answers for and the odds of tracking these individuals, who ensured that no traces were left behind, were infinitesimally small. Well, if Scathatch tries to ask me to use Alexios, I already have the answer prepared. Vlad thought. My king, does this change anything about the trip to South Africa? Of course not, I'll still go. With more precautions, of course. 
Vlad added at the end when he saw Alexo's expression change to one of concern. I will prepare everything. Keep me posted, I'm going to visit a friend. I need answers, answers only he can give me. Shall I open a portal to the limbo prison? Yes. Alexos nodded, and soon a portal appeared in front of Vlad. You don't need to look for me, I'll return alone. Meanwhile, prepare everything for our trip. Vlad looked at the portal with an expressionless look. Keep an eye out for off eyes. Alexos shuddered as he sensed Vlad's murderous intent, he was furious but hid it well. I don't want an incident of what happened in Japan to happen again with my daughters. Have I made myself clear? Yes, I will request the shadows to protect them from shadows should they leave the second progenitor's allied protection area. Vlad nodded and ordered as he walked through the door, visit clan Adrastella. I want more accurate information on what's going on. Yes, my king. The moment Vlad stepped through the portal and the portal closed, Alexo sighed in relief. I was wondering why he didn't explode sooner when he discovered this attack from Morgana's mouth. It seems my king has gotten better at controlling his temper, the visits with that Snow Clan lady are helping him a bit. Shall I arrange for her to abandon the Snow Clan name and come here? Alexos shook his head and decided that he would not meddle in this. That was not the attitude of a competent servant like himself. Hey? Why did you forget something this important, Morgana? Jean exploded with rage. I forgot. I haven't been back to hell in years. How could you forget something so basic? I had more important things to think about than something as insignificant as that. Ugh, you're impossible sometimes. This is no small thing, Morgana. Ah. What can I do? I forgot, all right. We should focus on what we should do now. Jean narrowed her eyes in irritation. She was livid. How could someone forget something as crucial as that? She knew her friend was airheaded about essential details, she always was, but she never thought she would forget matters involving her old home. Jean took a deep breath and calmed her irritation. It was not worth getting angry now. Mother Jean. Jean looked at Afis and Nero, who she was training. Nero had incredible physical strength and an abnormal proficiency in the vampire's basic power of shape-shifting. She didn't know if it was because of what happened in her past, but no matter the teachings she was proffering to Nero, the little girl absorbed it all as if she were a sponge. Not to mention that Nero had a strange energy inside her. This energy was very similar to the natural energy that the world trees use, and this energy also significantly strengthened her physical strength and powers in general. Jean didn't find this strange. At the end of the day, Nero was born a hybrid, and when Victor turned her into a noble vampire, the same thing that happened to Morgana must have occurred in her. Although, this case was a little different, after all, werewolves were the opposite race of vampires. Nero was using her vampire powers to mimic werewolf powers. She was basically an imitation of what a werewolf should be. Jean understood that this aspect came naturally to Nero. The reason for this was that when Victor turned her into a noble vampire, her werewolf side disappeared almost completely, but that 1% that remained in her soul gave Nero the energy that only werewolves had in her basic instincts. The proof of this was the girl's sense of smell, which was much sharper than a vampire's, and her almost animalistic sense of danger characteristics only seen in beings like werewolves, kitsons, and supernatural beings that had a connection with an animal. Afis was another unique case. The girl, in a nutshell, was a tiny monster. Everything Jean taught, she learned in a very short amount of time. Not to mention that she had an extraordinarily unique form of teleportation with a lot of potential for combat. Another thing she discovered was that Afis was much stronger than a normal noble vampire child. Even for a daughter of a progenitor, she was still irregular in this regard. Even her regeneration was much stronger than a typical baby vampire, something she, unfortunately, came to discover in the worst way. When Afis was injured in training, the scent of her blood was intoxicating, and Jean felt her racial urges activated, 
a reaction that could only happen with someone with a unique blood type. The blood of the progenitor. In a simple way to understand, Afis had more of Vlad's blood inside her than Vlad's other children, who inherited more things from their mother. Take Adam, for example. Her son took some of the potential from Vlad's blood and fully inherited her traits. Thanks to this merger, he had more advantages than his peers of the same age. But in the case of Afis, it was different. She took more things from her father than from her mother, and the combination of the two bloodlines gave her a strange power similar to how Harina used her power. Afis is not a true progenitor like Victor and Vlad, we'd know instinctively if she were, the signs are pretty obvious when that's the case. But she definitely inherited a great deal of Vlad's progenitor bloodline and that alone puts her on another potential plateau. Jean was having difficulty training Afis, the reason for this was due to the peculiarities of her power. Her charm was very great, which could charm even adult men, and she had no control over it. Another reason was that she couldn't touch people other than those related to the progenitor's main line, like Vlad's children and, currently, all of Victor's wives who were most closely related to Victor's blood. After all, if she touched a being without gloves, all the memories of that being would be absorbed into Afis, thus causing a second personality in the girl, something she already knew and wanted to avoid as much as possible. This is a problem derived from control too. She has no idea how to control her power. Another oddity that she knew about Afis was the power to mark someone. Jean didn't know what that power was, she just knew that Victor had that mark on him, and thanks to that mark, Afis could teleport next to Victor at any time she wanted. Something that Victor himself forbade her from doing. After all, it was something dangerous, depending on where he was. I don't know if this mark can be used as a tracker or if it has other effects, but one thing I'm sure of. Both girls have a lot of potential. Mother. Nero called out to her with a bit of embarrassment, something she was getting over as time went on, although it was strange to have so many mothers, she wasn't going to complain about it. Sorry, I was just thinking about your training. Oh. This is not the time for that dot. Jean smacked Morgana on the head. Ugh, what the fuck Jean? First, calm down. You get agitated easily that it doesn't help at all. Second, this could be an opportunity for Victor to get stronger. The longer he stays in hell, the more he can reach physical maturity and reach the first strength boost that happens when a vampire reaches 500 years old. This strength boost will help Victor immensely to balance his body's powers further. Morgana gritted her teeth, I know that, Jean. I also thought this was an opportunity for Victor, but the problem is. You don't know hell as I do. It's a horrible place. A horrible place for the weak. Morgana opened her eyes a little. Don't let your bad memories get to you, Victor is not weak. Knowing my husband, I'm sure he's feeling like a shark back in very familiar waters right now. Jean smiled. A smile Morgana shared, followed by a sigh. Hey, you're right, I should calm down a bit. Literally four seconds later, she screamed. I can't calm down. Sigh. Jean sighed in exasperation. Even if he has Roxanne, he's alone in hell. A hostile place. Eh, uh, my little Vic Dot. Are you a doting mother? He's not even your son. Jean commented inwardly, not expressing her thoughts. Aira, the fact that Victor is alone won't last for long. The two women and two girls looked at a pink light that suddenly appeared, revealed to be Aphrodite. Even if Victor were dropped on a strange planet alone, I am 100% sure that in a short time, he would soon be surrounded by allies. Remember, Victor's greatest weapon is not just his strength but his charisma. A charisma that made the goddess of love fall in love with him. I guarantee you, he won't be alone for long. Jean flashed a small smile as a thought crossed her mind, an idea she vocalized for all to hear. I predict that Diablo will experience a lot of heartache shortly. Phew 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 phew, indeed, and we should take advantage of it. What will we do? 
contact the opposite side of the war, the angels. Luckily, our husband managed to make good relations with the angels by saving one of the virtues. Those arrogant pigeons won't chase us away, and if I go with you, this attitude will decrease even more, after all, no one can resist my beauty. The blonde and the pink-haired woman flashed a smile that would make both Ruby and Victor proud and start laughing in unison. Morgana, Nero, and Ophis just watched with emotionless eyes. They really get along, hey, Nero spoke. Indeed, they are two black bellies just like Ruby. Black bellies? Ophis asked. Women who enjoy planning and are sadistic enough to want to see the targets of their planning suffer. M.M. Confused, murmured Ophis. When you grow up, you will understand. Okay. Morgana, will you help us with our training? Nero asked. Why don't you call me mother, too? I don't feel like that's possible. Nero spoke. Why? I mean, you don't seem like a mother. What is that supposed to mean? I have two daughters, you know. Morgana burst. Hey, I feel like you're more of a friend than a mother. You don't have that mother vibe, you know. Mother vibe. What the fuck is she talking about? Morgana couldn't understand anything. Seeing the veins bulging in Morgana's head and knowing her short temper, Nero quickly spoke. Don't worry. I also don't call Violet, Maria, and sometimes Natasha a mother either. Why did you only name irresponsible women? Nero turned her face and started to whistle. She used her right to remain silent. As Victor's daughter, she had enough political power to exercise that right. After all, this wasn't a democracy, and yes, a dictatorship with Victor at the top. Wait, I think it's monarchy. After all, he's more like a king than a dictator, hmm. Nero thought. Chapter 653, Who's Right? Who's Wrong? In the end, it doesn't matter. Two lone knights stood atop the high walls of Warfall, the city ruled by the clan Adrastella. At the moment, Warfall was experiencing an unprecedented invasion. Something that hadn't happened since the city's founding. Hundreds of thousands of monsters were swarming in waves. Adrastella clan's defense systems worked in overdrive while its warriors fought like never before. Wherever you looked outside the walls, all you would see were monsters of various sizes and species. Behemoths, Anis, Predators, Wyvern, Minions, and even two damn Alphas were present. A war was going on. And casualties were cropping up on both sides. Although it was obvious that the casualties were more severe for the monsters, what was the cause of these casualties? Eight women. Looking further ahead on the battlefield, a section devoid of the regular army soldiers could be seen. This was a forbidden area due to the sheer destruction caused by these eight women. Leona Elizabeth Lycos, an alpha of the renowned clan Lycos, a clan that had produced several generals to the werewolf king in Samar's history. Demonstrating why her clan was renowned for creating generals, she slashed and mutilated all monsters in her vicinity with sharp gauntlets made for close-range combatants. Her physical strength was unreal in her hybrid form, evident by how she tossed around a damn 20 meter tall behemoth without breaking a sweat. Leona looked at the other group of monsters, and white energy began to gather in her mouth, and with a voice like a roar, she screamed. Die, worms! A beam of energy erupted from her mouth and evaporated several behemoths in the process. Leona, don't waste energy on attacks like that. You know they don't die permanently. Tisk, I know. She snarled as her ears twitched, and that strange stench rose again. Behind you, Violet. Violet covered her body with fire, raised the bastard sword in her hand, and defended the attack. Seeing that it was one of those monsters that could turn invisible, she snarled in disdain, sneaky bastards. Her sword caught fire, and with one swing of her blade, the monster disappeared. Who was this woman who looked like Leona? She was Violet Snow, heiress to the Snow Clan, a clan of seasoned politicians and diplomats, 
wielding a bloodline that struck natural fear in all vampires' nobles. Sasha. I'm on it. Rumble, rumble. Trails of lightning arced across the battlefield, and seconds later, slashes appeared on every monster the arc passed through. This golden-haired woman was Sasha Fulger, heiress of Clan Fulger, a clan that mainly dealt with internal affairs and food production that every Nightingale citizen consumed, a clan that was extremely wealthy due to the nature of its business, a clan that had the dreaded Fulger lineage that raised the individual's speed to absurd levels, not counting the power of lightning itself. Sisters. A redhead spun her spear several times and slammed the butt of it into the ground. Soon the entire battlefield froze. Destroy everything, no monster shall come back alive. Yes. The redhead was Ruby Scarlet, the blood child of the strongest female vampire, Scathatch Scarlet. She was someone who had the most potential to be one of the strongest women of the vampire noble race alongside her mother. And the women who were behind her were Sienna Scarlet, the adopted eldest daughter of Scat Hatch. She was a woman renowned for her ability to lead, who boasted incredible power, which was expected of a daughter of Scat Hatch. Laika Scarlet, another adopted daughter of Scat Hatch, who, despite her short stature, was considered extremely deadly due to her mist power, which made her a fearsome assassin. Pepper Scarlet, the youngest adopted daughter of Scat Hatch. She was a woman with the innocent face of an angel. But make no mistake. If you found yourself on the end of her fist, you'd be in for a world of hurt. None of the daughters of Scat Hatch were considered normal, the proof which being the spectacle that the four of them were causing now. And last but not least, Eleanor Adrastella, the fourth Countess of Vampires, the leader of Clan Adrastella, and ruler of Warfall. Big targets must not approach the city, this includes centipedes, ogres, and behemoths over 20 meters tall. Eleanor shouted orders. Eleanor, in front of you. Leona warned away. I know. Eleanor turned away, her face instantly changing to its monster features. She reached up and grabbed the monster by the neck. Disgusting creatures, you will pay for what you did to him. Green flames burst from her hand, burning the monster's entire body. A deafening scream screeched out of the monster's mouth, proving the point that her attack dealt significant damage. It seemed even an immortal monster could scream like a bitch. When the monster turned to green ash, she ordered. Everyone jump in the air now. Wasting no time, all seven women jumped into the air and began to float. Eleanor clapped her hands together. A thousand hands of creation. Quake, quake, quake. The whole earth around began to shake as if an earthquake were occurring, and the next moment, thousands of hands made of stone, earth and all matter contained in the ground, began to rise toward the sky. The hands caught the monsters breaking out of formation and threw them back. They smashed several monsters and pushed them further away from her territory. Alone, Eleanor managed to fend off hundreds of thousands of monsters. This was why Clan Adrastella was the ruler of Warfall and Nightingale's first defense. Only they could handle such a job. That power is ridiculous. Leona can't help but comment. Yes, but it's very exhausting. Violet spoke as she looked at Eleanor who was evidently more breathless than before. What are you waiting for? Kill those bastards. She ordered with audible hatred seething in her tone. A hatred that was shared by all the women present. The eyes of all the women present glowed blood red, and soon they jumped towards the monsters. These eight women were causing literal chaos on the battlefield. That fact wasn't all that surprising given the origins of the women. They each had more potent bloodlines than today's run-of-the-mill vampires could offer. But. What was this hate? What was with their angry expressions? What was this massacre? What the fuck was wrong with these women? Just what pissed those girls off? A knight asked. Don't ask me, they didn't say anything to me. Aren't you responsible for the walls? I am still a subordinate. The Valkyries and Sir Walter the steward of Clan Adrastella, lead the army. 
bastards. Don't run away from me. Let me see your faces in pain. The two knights looked at Violet Snow and her firepower, causing a literal hurricane of fire. Ha 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 ha. Anger, madness, and hatred were seen in her eyes. She was clearly taking out her frustrations on the poor monsters. Is it wrong for me to feel sorry for monsters? The leader of the walls remained silent at his friend's question because he was also feeling the same. Just what in the name of all the dick up the ass gods out there could have made them so pissed off? Even the Valkyries are not in a normal mood. He grumbled as he looked at the Valkyries ordering the surrounding troops. Even Rose, who was observing the battlefield not too far away from him, was in a very bad mood, and she was a woman who was usually very calm. That was an answer the wall leader wanted to know as well. Commander Rose, monsters were coming from the west too. Dorothy, who was taking the role of scout, reported. Before Rose could say anything, she heard. I'll take care of it, focus the Valkyries elsewhere. Soon someone ran past her, jumped towards the west wall, and began floating in the air. Order. The two knights looked up towards the voice that shouted and saw a woman of oriental origins. She was wearing full leather armor with an otaki on her back. The woman was floating in the air, with eight talismans glowing in different colors in front of her. Suzanu, it's time. Today is the day. The day of the promised war has arrived. Take my faith, and in return, aid me to kill an army of corruption. Rumble, rumble, rumble. Storm clouds started to be created, and torrential rain fell from the skies. Everything was very unnatural because only that area was raining. Several bolts of lightning thundered in the clouds, and they started to fall toward the enemies, electrocuting all the monsters present. Then the tiny drops of water falling from the sky began to grow exponentially. And soon, those water droplets grew to a sphere of water two meters in diameter, and all that water was flooding the entire battlefield at an alarming rate. Wrath of the Heavens By the time the woman finished the incantation, the water that had scattered across the entire battlefield began to gather and formed eight twenty-meter-tall giants with samurai armor from ancient times, and each of the giants carried different weapons. One of them was even carrying a rifle, a damn rifle. The woman drew her otaki from its sheath behind her and pointed the blade forward. Assemble. Ro a a a a r. With deceptively fast speed, a giant wielding two katanas jumped into the middle of the monsters and started slashing them all. Then the giant carrying the rifle aimed at a twenty-meter-tall behemoth and pulled the trigger, sending out a concentrated beam of water that flew towards the behemoth, obliterating it from existence. Another giant with a bladed spear jumped behind the group of monsters and started fighting a giant centipede. Holy Jesus Christ, what the fuck? That human is insane. The monsters aren't coming back. The leader of the wall spoke. Hey. His companion looked at the dead monsters and realized that it was true. H. How? If monsters just die with a certain type of property, it's pretty easy to apply those properties to spells. The two men felt a chill run down their spines and quickly jumped back while grabbing the sword in their sheaths. They looked back and saw a strangely transparent old man. Ignoring the state of the two men, he pointed to the woman's blade in the air, look at the Otaki's blade. Rose, who was nearby, looked where the old man was pointing and saw that the blade was covered in several talismans. This is a blade that Lady Eleanor lent to Mizuki. She's using the Otaki as a catalyst to charge her spells. Think of the Otaki as a wizard's wand, not a weapon, and voila, you've got the desired result. I see. As she's using the Otaki as a catalyst, her power naturally flows through the blade and carries the blade's characteristic to all of her spells. Correct. Abe Nosime laughed with the fan open before him, he couldn't help but look at Mizuki. Even at my peak, I could only maintain this magic for a minute, meanwhile, my disciple can maintain it for more than half an hour. That incident with Victor's blood helped her immensely. She can reach new heights as a human and that couldn't make me prouder, he thought. Is that the power of an on-my-o-mage? Holy fuck, 
no wonder Alucard likes her so much. Dorothy spoke. Well, Victor doesn't like her because he knows about these powers. He likes her for who she is. Abe no see may thought, but he didn't refute Dorothy, but he still said something. Mizuki is special even among Onmyo mages, that kind of power is not normal for us. I knew of only one man who could do something similar, a Shiidman. Across the battlefield, the two alphas looked down at this chaos on top of a wyvern. Do you understand now, Ken? That's the power of invaders. They are killing all our weapons like it's no big deal. Especially those women. They are very dangerous. Ken spoke in disbelief. The intelligence of our gods identified them as scions of the most important clans of the race of invaders. And the one who summoned those humanoid monsters, she is a human, a weak race native to their original planet. For a weak race, she has a lot of power. She is an anomaly, K.A.L. replied. It's not uncommon for weaker races to ask stronger races for support. Beings like our gods exist on their planet too. Impossible, our dot. Do not be blinded by prejudice and fanaticism. Ken closed his mouth at his older brother's harsh reprimand. I understand you clearly, Ken. I had the same thoughts in the past, and I will repeat what our father said to me. Our gods are powerful, but they are not omnipotent. Faced with an enemy with the same kind of support that our gods give us, it is understandable that the invaders have so much power. This is a lesson for you to keep an open mind for strange events and know how to deal with them appropriately. Only then can we drive these aliens out and reclaim our planet. It is for this reason that our gods commanded the village leaders to learn their language, culture, and history. The more we know about our enemies, the less our family members will have to die in this war because we will be prepared for them. Know yourself and your enemy. That way, the chance of losing a battle will drop significantly. Information is important, never forget that when you inherit my position one day. Ken bit his lip when he heard that. He knew that the day he inherited his brother's position was the day his brother would die. You understand? Yes, brother, Ken replied with a shaky but determined look. Chapter 654, Submission or Death Capital of the 44th Demon Rank Pillar, Shax A 10-meter tall demon with a face of a horse, the eyes of an owl, two hind legs of a horse, the wings of an owl, and the torso of a muscular man with four arms was staring at the edge of his territory in utter terror. There, a man with long black hair and violet eyes stood, wearing full black armor, carrying a katana with a blade too large to be called a katana in his left hand. With every step he took towards the city, Shax's terror increased. It was like a goddamn horror movie. The man wasn't doing anything. He was just walking towards the city with a casual smile as if he were on vacation. My lord, H he is here. A lesser demon spoke. You think I'm fucking blind? I know he's here. The demon roared. What did the demon king say? He must already know about the invader. His messenger relayed that he asked the sin of pride to come to our aid, but he would take a long time because he is currently in the hell of the Egyptian pantheon taking care of some matters. Fuck, we don't have time. Where are the other elites? The horsemen? Or the other deadly sins? I can't say. Tisk, I bet Sloth isn't doing anything like usual. She didn't even contribute to the war. She might as well help. Her power would be useful in stopping this monster. The lesser demon chose to remain silent, he didn't want to receive Shax's wrath. Suddenly a tremendous pressure fell upon the entire capital. And that pressure made all the demon's fur and hair stand on end and caused them all to turn to face the man instantly. And everyone could see that he was already in front of the gate. He's already here. Dot. Demons. I only have two things to say. Only two things to say. Victor held up his two fingers and made the number two sign with his hand, his voice echoing throughout the territory. The demons looked at his gauntlet fingers that mimicked sharp claws. Victor's sadistic smile grew. Kneel in submission, or die. 
You have five seconds. Five. Four. When the countdown started, the entire territory panicked. Demons started running around, and yelling at each other, trying to come to a decision. Those were the most hot-blooded demons who couldn't decide for themselves. Those wiser demons quickly knelt on the ground in submission. 3. When the count reached 3, Shax awoke from his stupor and commanded. Prepare for battle. He tried to order, but Victor's oppressive voice sounded again. 2. At this number, more than 60% of Shax's territory was on its knees. Even the subordinate Shax was previously talking to. Demons were cunning, they needed that to survive, and as they say, people talk. It was the same for demons, especially regarding an incident with a neighboring territory. The news that all the legions of Vine had died echoed across the demon world. This spread of information was because of Victor's effect and because of the pillar demons themselves, who commented on it. Those comments passed to their trusted servants, and from the trusted servants passed to another servant, and so on. Soon everyone knew that there was an invader in the demon world. Demons were gossiping creatures and not very trustworthy. 1. Bastard. Shax could only scream in frustration. 0. Victor pulled Junketsu from its sheath and disappeared, leaving behind a trail of lightning. From the perspective of those kneeling demons, they merely saw streaks of lightning flashing across Shax's territory. Three seconds later, Victor was back in his prior position with Junketsu sheathed again. And the next moment, blood spatter exploded all over the territory. That sight made all the demons nearly piss themselves in sheer terror. What did he do? Was the question on everyone's mind. Shax's servant just looked at his former master, who had turned to minced meat on the ground, and his heart was consumed with fear. Is it that easy? Is it that easy to kill a demon pillar like that? Those same pillars that are considered the strongest by all demons. He felt his worldview shatter seeing his former master's death. But that death also lit a flame of ambition in him. I need to get stronger. All demons, male or female, who saw this sight shared the same burning desire. Arise. Victor's order spread throughout the territory again, an order that no one dared to refuse. Follow me. Victor turned and started walking again. The demons awoke from their stupor and quickly ran toward Victor. Some flew, some jumped but without exception, everyone was walking behind Victor. From now on, you are my legion of demons, and you obey only me. Yes. And that was how Victor gained 60,000 demons under his command, a number that promised to grow as he traversed through this world. And it was also this incident that placed Victor among one of the fastest beings in the world. He'd managed to kill over 40,000 demons and a demonic duke in three seconds, exhibiting a speed the likes of which were only ever displayed by messenger gods like Hermes. And mortals like Anast Hashia Fulger, the leader of Clan Fulger. Dubbed the fastest woman alive. On that day, the masses bestowed a new title upon Victor. The fastest man alive, a direct competitor to Anast Hashia Fulger. Some expected that at some point in the future, there would be a duel between the two to decide who was the fastest being alive. They believed it would be an interesting fight. Little did they know that Anast Hashia Fulger and Victor Alucard were having a different kind of fight in bed every night, one that he always won. Therefore, such a future where the two fought seriously against each other was highly unlikely because, unlike Scat Hatch, Natasha just wanted to love and be loved by Victor. She didn't feel the need to compete to decide who was stronger or, in this case, faster. That recording was from 15 days ago in the demon world. Diablo looked at Bale with a neutral gaze, but it was clear to Bale that his king was irritated if his glittering eyes were any indication of his mood. Bale could understand Diablo's irritation. Dealing with matters in the demon world while in the mortal world was problematic because time passed differently. Consequently, there were problems in communication. The same could be said for contacting Diablo's elites the deadly sins, who were currently spread across other hells and pantheons. How much have his legions grown? 
I don't know about his legions, he doesn't seem to care. He's just moving from territory to territory of demonic pillars and repeating what he's been doing. Of the ranks 40 to 44 of the demonic pillars, only number 42, Vipar, sided with Alucard. The rest were all killed, and a percentage of their remaining demonic forces taken. The latest number of demons under Alucard's command is around 500,000, with the margin of error being substantial due to the difference in time. Therefore, this number could be much higher than expected. Literal veins began appearing on Diablo's head, bulging out exaggeratedly. We cannot forget Vine, the former 45th rank pillar. She is currently engaging ranks 46 to 60. Although we don't have information about her yet, she doesn't seem to have made any progress on Alucard's order. How can you not know anything about her? She's just an insignificant pillar. It shouldn't be a problem for you. True, but... I can't find her. Elaborate. No matter how of hell I scour, I can't place her. It's like she's been hidden from my senses, this has been occurring ever since her evolution. Of the rank one's authorities, knowing the location of all the pillars was a privilege of the king of the pillars. Because of this ability, Baal learned of Citri's invasion of his domain in the past. An ability only Diablo and Baal know the existence of. A hush fell over the place. The demon king was obviously thinking about his next course of action. It was for a situation like this that I closed off hell. I couldn't risk my influence diminished by foreign beings. Diablo was aware of the plan of Nikos, James, and Fanir concerning Alucard. But he didn't say anything about it because even he had underestimated Victor's ability. He didn't expect a mortal being capable of surviving the miasma of hell. All my elites from rank 1 to 20 are currently in the mortal world, the deadly sins are scattered around doing their quests, and the horsemen are. Diablo's eyes gleamed. Baal. Yes, my king. How long will it take pride to return to hell and sort this out? Two days in the mortal world, thirty to sixty days in the demon world, depending on Alucard's current location. That's too long, I'm sending war and death. My king, is that wise? The war with the angels could break out at any moment, and we will need them for when the time comes. Not to mention that Alucard isn't exactly weak. He's gotten a lot stronger since the time he'd come to rescue the heirs of the factions. A feat that Baal was shocked at. How could a person become so strong all of a sudden? How was that fair? How many people took years to get stronger, and yet Alucard achieved such growth in a short amount of time? And it wasn't an ordinary power boost. Before, he couldn't fight with Igars, but with his previous display of speed and the fight with Vine. Bale was sure that the man would no longer flee from Agars as before. Because of that, I am sending death and war. Both brothers can handle this snag. My king, out of all due respect, I beg you to send all four horsemen. Oh! Alucard, as you yourself described him, is a hero. He grows stronger with each adversity he encounters. Sending war and death alone will be difficult for Alucard to fight but I'm 90% sure he will be able to defeat them or even run away if things go awry. The speed he can currently achieve is extremely troublesome to deal with. A combination of famine and death will be essential to sealing his speed. While war and pestilence will be the vanguard that keeps him busy. War is an extremely lethal warrior, Alucard will not be able to ignore him and look out for others, and as we know, the brothers work very well together. With this formation, it is guaranteed that Alucard will die or, at the very least, be extremely harmed. But there is a problem with this option. If a possible battle between the Angles occurs, my king will be without his best warriors, and our allies are busy with their respective mythologies. The only one around to help is King Yama, but as he himself said, he is on vacation. Therefore, you will likely need to sacrifice something for him to help you. That was a possibility that Diablo thought as well when he'd heard what Baal said. With the four brothers, what do you predict the outcome to be? I would say it's a 30% chance of losing. For the brothers. Wrong, 
my king. For Alucard. Diablo opened his demonic eyes a little. Do you hold him in such high regard? My king, name one being that has managed to jump from the level of a newborn vampire to being able to fight against elder vampires and even completely decimate demon dukes like it was the easiest thing in the world in a time frame of just five years. We all underestimate Alucard's potential. I've never seen a vampire with such a wide array of powers and such dedication to getting stronger. His thought process is abnormal. He never seems to be satisfied with his current strength. What those with a common mindset would be satisfied with, Alucard never is. He continuously strives to get even stronger. It's like he has a goal to get stronger constantly, and he's pushing his limits every chance he gets. That was Bale's psychological assessment of Victor. The rank 1 demon couldn't understand why Alucard was so focused on getting stronger. It was not like he was at war or had lost someone important and was out for revenge. The motivation behind Victor's obsession with getting stronger was a very foreign concept to Bale now. I repeat your words from before. Alucard is a hero. He will get stronger the more difficulties he goes through, and hell is a place full of difficulties. We need to deal with him now, or this thorn will cease being a small problem and will eventually transition into a much bigger one. Diablo was silent for a few seconds, until he spoke. Very well. Send the four brothers and contact rank 61, Zagan. I want him to help too. He is currently in hell, correct? Bale's face distorted for a few seconds when he heard Zagan's name but soon returned to normal. The reason for this was that even Bale didn't like to interact with that troublesome demon. He was a joker in all situations. Yes, he's there. Good. I want this quest complete and Alucard dead. In the meantime, I'll take care of the glorified pigeons. Has our spy infiltrated them yet? He didn't make it. The Inquisition has gotten pretty strict, but... One of my informants found out what Gabriel's next mission was. And that is. An opportunity. One I intend to exploit. Go do your job. Yes, my king. When Bale left, Diablo felt a gaze on his body. He turned his face and saw Lilith staring at him with lifeless eyes, but he could clearly feel the hatred contained in that dull gaze. Troublesome woman. You should just give up and become my puppet. Diablo thought in disdain. The will of the mother of demons was strong. She was resisting what had been done to her whenever she could. Tisk, if she were a complete puppet, I could have sent Lilith to deal with Alucard. No matter Alucard's strength, he still can't handle someone of God King level like Lilith. Asmodeus, are the preparations ready? A darkened spirit appeared in front of Diablo and spoke in a distorted voice containing several voices within. Yes, my king. I'm currently in the lab. The research results involving our guest's gift are available for you to claim at your leisure. I will go now. Chapter 655, Masters of the Past The Queen of the Amazons, Mayaniku It was a peaceful day today, the weather was clear and her people were laughing and happy. Sitting on her golden throne, the woman, 190 centimeters tall, wearing a white dress with gold accents, looked at this sight with her emerald green eyes with pride. Her long black hair, styled in braids, fluttered in the wind showing off. Women looked at the sight of the queen with passionate eyes and in awe. So beautiful was the queen of the Amazons. Maya nodded in satisfaction. Her people were happy, her mother would be proud to know that she was performing her role as queen so well. Until suddenly, bangs began to be heard throughout the city. In the face of such a rumble, it was as if a small-scale earthquake was happening. Everything began to shake and fall. Dishes broke, as well as glasses. What is this dot? Before Maya could ask something, she heard. My queen. She turned her face and saw the disheveled and exhausted appearance of her servant. Demons. Demons are invading. What? Boom. An explosion was heard in the distance, 
causing everyone to focus on the noise. And soon, they saw it, a ten-meter-tall demon with red skin, four arms, and a body tainted by the putrid miasma of the deepest hell. Faced with such a sight, the queen of the Amazons, Maya, responded simply. Amazons. Prepare for battle. Following that statement, what happened was a spectacle of carnage. Her people died, some sacrificed themselves against the high-level demons, some died fighting, and some even died pointlessly. And even though many proud Amazons fought to defend their home, their sacrifice was futile. The reason? The demons kept coming, and that ten-meter-tall demon with four arms was still standing there looking at all the Amazons' futile efforts in obvious disdain. It was apparent that the demon's goal was not the annihilation of the Amazons because if it were, they would have already done that. Only she, the queen of the Amazons, could fight against the high-level demon, and that was only because she was blessed by all the goddesses that made this hidden place. Blessings that made her much stronger than an ordinary mortal. Despite the blessings of Aphrodite no longer residing in her body, thus stripping her of her flawless beauty and the ability to sense emotions in others derived from the blessing of love. She still had the blessings of the other goddesses, and with that power, along with the artifacts made by Hephaestus, it would be enough to kill the demon she was facing. Convinced that this was what was happening and fearing that more of her people would die in this war of attrition, she set out on her own using all the artifacts Hephaestus had created that only the queen's bloodline could use, and the result? She was wrong. Very wrong. So foolish, Queen of the Amazons. Just as our Lord foresaw, the current generation is not used to war, you have grown soft. Have you not, daughter of a rape? The demon displayed a shit-eating grin as he looked at Maya, who was lying on the ground, bleeding, and defeated. Everything was a trap, a trap for her. Do not call me like that. I'm the Queen Mayaniku Dot. The woman who was born from rape. A weak human was captured by the Queen when it came time to conceive an offspring, and he was used until a girl was born, and was then discarded along with all the male children of the woman who raped him once he had served his purpose. Maya gritted her teeth in pain and glared at the demon. Oya? It seems like you already knew you were the daughter of some trash dot. The demon was really enjoying this. I think that knowledge comes with the family, tell me, when will the time come? When will it be time for you, Maya, a woman from a family of rapists, to do the same as your mother did in the past? Shut up! Ironic. Women, who were once saved from being victims of men, ended up becoming the aggressors and doing the same. The proud queen of the Amazons is nothing more than the fruit of a rather dignified relationship indeed. The irony of this situation is delicious, ha 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 dot. Shut up. Maya roared in rage, and with great willpower, she grabbed her sword and leapt toward the demon. But just as expected, she was brutally defeated. Don't get me wrong. Cough. She spat blood onto the ground as she glared at the demon with her emerald eyes. I don't particularly care what your people do or that you are hypocrites. For me. Teasing you is just secondary, part of the entertainment. A lesser demon approached Maya and put his hand on her armor. Fool, touching my armor will make you vanish. Maya opened her eyes wide when she saw the demon tearing her armor and leaving her in only her underwear. Impossible. So foolish, Maya. The artifacts you are so proud of are just toys for Hephaestus. He purposely made something for mortals to use and unlike a divine artifact, this armor lacks durability. Exposed to a miasma as dense as mine, you unknowingly weakened the properties of your proud artifacts. The lesser demon approached the four-armed demon, giving him Maya's armor, her sword, and her shield. But there is a secret in this artifact that only the first queen of the Amazons knew, a secret that she wanted not to be passed on to the next generation. Then, taking the small object in his massive hands, the demon's four red eyes flashed, and a beam of red energy shot out of them toward the armor. Tisk, he made a bloodline rune. Clever, but easy to change, I just have to add my soul essence, and the rune will recognize me, not this useless woman. 
This armor, despite being weak, is unique. Hephaestus is the god of forges. His pride would not allow him to do something half-assed or bad. And that's what he did in this armor. He created something unique. An armor capable of absorbing and transforming energy according to the user's will. A red glow so blinding that it seemed to blind everyone around temporarily was seen, and seconds later, everyone saw the same armor wholly repaired and completely black with red runes and miasma oozing from the edges. Maya opened her eyes wide. An armor specially made for the first queen, a woman the goddess directly blessed. By receiving so many blessings, she became something similar to a demi-goddess. A mortal artifact with the characteristics of a divine artifact, something only the forge god could make. The armor started to grow in size, the miasma began to grow to a level that if Maya didn't have the blessings of the sacred fire of Hestia, she would have already died. Perfect dot. The demon smiled in satisfaction when he saw the armor and the giant sword floating in the air. Why you? From the beginning, you wanted it. Yeah, I wanted your armor, sword and shield. Or rather, I wanted Callisto's armor set, a masterpiece created by a god for a mortal, an armor capable of changing with the energy used. It will be useful to me. Even the name. How much do you know about our race? I know enough. I have no interest in your little race of rapists. Even the term human is better than you guys, I'm glad you don't see yourself as human because that's not what you are. Don't get me wrong, what you do is splendid. We have an entirely separate hell for men and women who commit these acts. Normally, these demons are insignificant and weak, but you and your entire bloodline would be good commanders of that specific hell, something my king would be very pleased with. Disdain was practically a familiar voice for the demon now. Obviously, he was disgusted with the woman and all her people. My lord, my lord. Hmm. The greater demon looked at his servant. Can I taste it? The greater demon looked at Maya, who shuddered at his gaze and unconsciously covered her body, even though her whole body was full of wounds, her beauty was still there. A horde of hungry demons will rape the daughter born of a rapist. How ironic. Why not? Go ahead, my work here is done. The greater demon's response filled Maya's heart with despair. He 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 dot. The lesser demons looked at her with obvious lust. And no, please don't do this to me. The greater demon raised his hand enough for the lesser demons to stop. The greater demon looked at the woman with disbelieving eyes. Whoa aa, eh, eh, shouldn't you be a proud queen? Why are you crying? I've only been the queen for a short time. And I don't deserve to be deflowered like this. I am a demon. We are creatures of sin. Yet even I am not that hypocritical. He rolled his eyes in disdain and exasperation. Please don't do this to me. Just kill me. This is an ironic response. Isn't this the same thing your people have been doing culturally for hundreds of years? Why do you fear the same act? Is this act not sacred to you? This is not something sacred, this is just something to propagate our kind, she thought in shame but didn't speak out loud because she knew she would suffer retaliation from the demon. As a young queen, she attempted to change the hunting days of the Amazons, the days when women would go out into the mortal world in search of men, most often fishermen, to use to propagate their race. For her, this was a very barbaric attitude, but the culture was so ingrained that she could do nothing, not to mention that the older Amazons were very much in favor of this act itself. Also, despite not liking this act and seeing it as barbaric, she was still indifferent to it. She didn't care about beings other than her people, a mentality that her mother, the previous queen, instilled in her. The current queen's loyalty to her people was undying, just as the people's loyalty to the queen was. Oh, I understand. You are the ones, right? The beings who like to do all kinds of evil to other beings but never thought that something like this could happen to you. Seriously, all your people would make good demons of hypocrisy. It is not true. Scat hatch scarlet. The moment he spoke, three women appeared with a flash of lightning. 
Ironic, a demon talking about doing evil to others. Hey, we live in a brutal society. We know that what we do to other beings, one day, can be done to us too. Most demons are hypocritical, selfish, lustful, and thirsty for power, but... Aren't all races like that? Look at the humans and gods, particularly the Olympians and the Norse. They are the perfect example. He pointed at Maya on the ground, look at her race, she is a perfect example. A demon with a conscience, that's new. A white-haired woman spoke. Agnes Snow, most high-level demons like me have conscience and principles, you know. His smile grew. As does Lilith's former general, who is in that little girl band. Or wait, should I say progenitor's harem? The three women narrowed their eyes for only one reason. He didn't mention Lilith's race, or even stating something that sounded like Vlad's servant or even Vlad's wife. He mentioned a group, and even quoted progenitor's harem as if he knew something else, something that should have been secret. Fu fu fu, you guys should cover your tracks more, Scat Hatch Scarlet herself, a woman not interested in many things, visiting the leader of the Yukai, new faction. Anast Hashia Fulger herself, the fastest living mortal currently roaming England, a place we know has a the land of the fairies there. Not to mention the Fulgers are said to be descended from a great spirit of lightning. Interesting, you seem to know a lot about everyone and everything, Natasha spoke. I like to read. Books tell the history of the world. They are a source of wisdom, even if I'm not as old as you are, I like to brag that I know many things. Scat Hatch opened her eyes wide when she heard the demon's sentence, and soon her gaze changed, she wasn't looking at someone unknown anymore. Impossible. It's impossible for you to be him, he wouldn't fall to become a demon. A demon who likes to read. Okay, that's the biggest oddity I've ever seen in my life. Agnes rolled her eyes. Hey, don't discriminate against demons so much. Some demons just want to sleep. Look at the sin of sloth, she is a perfect example. It's impossible to do that when most of you are like that. Agnes pointed to the lesser demon, who was looking at them lustfully. Fair enough. Well, I'm not an extremist race advocate, so fuck it. He snorted. The grip on Skatika's spear grew even stronger when she heard the frivolous conversation, now, that particular thought couldn't get out of her head anymore. That earlier sentence about books. That irritating frivolity. Don't tell me. Is that you, Merlin? Aya. Uh... The demon smiled widely, a satisfied smile, and he looked at Scathatch as if he had seen an old friend. I thought you wouldn't recognize me, Scathatch Scarlet. After all, I've changed quite a bit. Chapter 656, Masters of the Past. 2. Hestia. This is. Nike stared in horror at the sight in front of her, corpses of demons and women on the ground. A genocide, Hestia replied. Just how many Amazons died? I don't know. The last time I contacted the Amazons, their number was around 50,000, and that was years ago. Hestia replied. Even with the gods' support, they could not rule over 200,000. It would simply take too much logistics and food, something that this small community would be unable to nurture. Nike rationalized. Hestia nodded when she heard Nike's analytical voice. This place, the refuge of the Amazons, was created by the goddesses. In total, this place was the size of an average city with the capacity to support between 60 and 80,000 inhabitants, a knowledge that the queen herself had. Hence, she prevented the population from growing beyond its bearing capacity. The Amazons were a special group, they had superhuman physical conditioning and could live up to 200 years. When they reached their full maturity, they would age slowly to maintain peak physical condition. They were a warrior race, and that race lost this way. A high-level demon was behind this. It doesn't make sense if it were anything else, if it were an ordinary demon or even hordes of ordinary demons, the Amazons wouldn't suffer so many casualties. Hestia, it's not that. 
Look. Nike pointed to the corpses of demons. They are low-level demons. Hey? Are you sure? Yes, I am. Then why did they lose so many members like that? A large-scale war is not decided by who is stronger, and many factors interfere with the winner of a war. A group of villagers can beat a group of armed soldiers if they know what to do and have a competent leader. As the goddess of victory, Nike was quite knowledgeable about the causes of victory, because of that, she understood how the Amazons could lose so many members. You mean? Hestia opened her eyes wide. Yes, the leader of the demons is quite competent. Hestia was silent, and a worried expression was visible on the beautiful face of the goddess. Anyway, let's not waste time here. Scathatch and the other two women can handle whoever the demon is, let's help as many as possible. Nike said. Yes. Not far away, hidden by a veil of night, was a group of goddesses. Nyx, Hera, Artemis, and Athena. Nyx, why aren't you letting us out? Why are we standing here? I have to kill these motherfuckers. Look what they did. Artemis screamed. The goddesses had arrived here by the time Mayaniku, the queen of the current Amazons, had been defeated, and they immediately went to help, but Nyx stopped them. Nyx looked neutrally at Artemis and spoke in a voice that sent shivers down Artemis's spine. Do not speak to me in that tone, Artemis. Or I guarantee I will teach you the meaning of the word respect that your rotten brain seems to have forgotten. Artemis just gulped and fell silent. No matter what you do with Artemis. Oi oi. Artemis yelled. Athena ignored her and continued, but she's right about one thing, why are we standing here? What made you make that decision? Seeing that Hera also shared Artemis's thoughts, Nyx sighed. Haha, I forgot that you don't see the world the way I do. Close your eyes. Why? Just obey me. The three goddesses looked at each other and nodded they were already here. What else could happen to them? They thought and took a leap of faith. The moment the three goddesses closed their eyes, Nyx pointed her palm at the goddesses, and energy dark as night flew towards them, soon they heard Nyx's voice. You can open your eyes now. The moment the goddesses opened their eyes, their eyes changed to the same shade as Nyx's. That's... Athena opened her eyes wide. How I see the world. Before the goddesses, instead of a destroyed city with several bodies on the ground, there was a city covered with white beings with holes for eyes wandering around. These beings closely resembled the dead Amazons on the ground. Another thing they saw was other completely dark beings flying towards a deep space of darkness and entering that space in the sky. The dark beings are the demons that died and are returning to hell. The white beings are the souls of the dead Amazons who still wander without life. The oppressive and dark atmosphere is the negative feelings of everyone present here. Do you see this all the time? Hira asked in disbelief. Yes, this is my authority. After all, nothing can be hidden from me, if I want to know something, I will know. I am the mother of concealment for a reason. But unfortunately, I cannot interact with this part of the world. Only specific beings can. Beings like my son Thanatos, the rulers of hell, and a mortal species called the progenitor of vampires. But that is not why I stopped you from advancing, that is. Nyx pointed to a location. The goddesses followed the Nyx's gaze and saw something that made their eyes widen. W what is that? Athena stammered in disbelief. It's pretty obvious. That's hundreds of thousands of magic circles and each of those magic circles has other smaller magic circles with structures that support the larger magic circle. Nyx explained. This is a variation of strategic magic used by the Queen of Witches, Evie Moriarty. I'm not talking about that. I obviously know what that is. Athena lost her composure. I'm talking about this evil, this miasma. Why were these magic circles leaking this cursed energy? The concentration of energy held in those thousands of magic circles made Athena feel like she was in hell at the lowest levels possible, it was insane. Don't ask me something I don't know. 
I was trying to figure out what it was, but all my divinity tells me is that it is a variation of magic. Magic shouldn't be this evil. Magic is a more neutral and passive energy, not raging and destructive like miasma. Hira explained with obvious shock in her voice. That's right, which is why I think it was created by the demon that invaded this place. I am possible. A demon shouldn't be able to use magic. Artemis spoke. That is what the gods said when they realized that a group of humans were using a special energy in the past and doing similar feats to the gods. Artemis fell silent. Times change and talented people are born, capable of changing how we see the world. You've seen it many times. So something that was impossible in the past can be done in the future if someone talented enough comes along. Nix's eyes gleamed like the starry night, and she looked out over a scene. The scene of three female vampires looking at a giant demon. Oh? Merlin, this is unexpected. I thought he had died in his mortal life. With just a glance, the mother of concealment had immediately identified the individual. Her gaze shifted to the vampires, specifically the blonde and white-haired ones. It seems their interaction with the progenitor made their souls more refined, hey. That's interesting, is this caused by the world tree? Looks like I have to keep an eye on him even more. It's a shame that whore Aphrodite withdrew my blessing. If he had my blessing, I could watch him from anywhere, anytime, regardless of the dimensions. Nix clicked her tongue in internal annoyance, and with a snap of her finger, she withdrew the vision she gave the goddesses. Do you understand now? That demon hit a strategic class spell all over this dimension. So if you directly interfere with him, I'm afraid he won't mind using that spell and putting this place on lockdown. The goddesses nodded their heads. But we can't just sit here. That, I agree with you, therefore. Nyx gestured with her hand, and soon the goddesses found themselves flying towards the ground. Be bastard, Artemis screamed as she flew towards the ground. Help the people who have received your blessings. She spoke with a gentle wave of farewell, completely ignoring Artemis's cries. Now, let's see what's happening with the demon and the vampires. She flashed a small smile and disappeared from where she was. Nyx appeared in front of the group, still hidden in her veil. Oya. Oh yeah. The demon smiled widely, a satisfied smile, and he looked at Scathatch as if he had seen an old friend. I thought you wouldn't recognize me, Scathatch Scarlet. After all, I've changed quite a bit. The grip on Scathaka's spear grew even tighter, and her wary gaze rose by several levels. Now, I understand why you were teaching this girl a lesson. Even after turning this way, you still deeply hate the act that her people commit as a culture, hey. Those who enjoy this heinous act, whether they be men or women, must be burned in hell forever. He spoke in disdain. And yet, you allowed that lesser demon to exploit her, Scathatch spoke with sharp eyes. That's the fun, Scathatch. The sinner must experience the sin committed on the victim. The demon's smile grew. Spoken like a true demon. Scathatch flashed a smirk. You see, Scathatch, when I became this, I made a point of assuming the position of commander of hell responsible for sinners who commit these kinds of acts. Normally, I would just sweep this filth off the land. He spoke with disgust as he looked at Maya as if her very existence was one big pile of garbage. Chapter 657 Masters of the Past 3. Normally, I would just sweep this filth off the land. He spoke with disgust as he looked at Maya as if her very existence was one big pile of garbage. But I needed to stick to the plan, and now that you are here along with the other goddesses, it will be impossible to kill her. Ha! Huh. He sighed. Yama must be pleased with your efforts. Indeed, the former Yama would be but the current one is just a sadistic brat. Well, he's still useful. Skathika's eyes only grew sharper. Why is he giving out so much deliberate information? With every word Merlin spoke to Skathatch, the woman perceived one or two hidden meanings. Ugh, it's always like this. He hasn't changed at all, in fact, 
he's gotten even worse. She grunted in inner annoyance. She didn't like dealing with Merlin. She never did because nothing with him was simple, it was all too complicated. She didn't doubt at all that his becoming a demon was something he planned himself. Such a thing wouldn't be impossible, he was a rare specimen, the only male human in history who could use magic. The same magic that the Witch Queen used today, a magic that was supposed to be exclusive to women, a fact that all witches have hidden over time. I would have completely forgotten about it if I didn't hear his annoying voice. Hmm? Well, it looks like other goddesses came along, ugh. I can feel my body shaking with agony from feeling their divine power, this weakness is annoying. Though, thanks to this armor, I won't have to worry about that in the future. Again, throwing deliberate information, what's the scheme this time, old bastard? Wait dot. Don't, Scathatch warned Agnes. Are you letting him go? Agnes asked in disbelief. Don't be silly. I'm keeping you from walking into a trap. If he is who I think he is, nothing with that bastard is simple. Look how confident he is. He's standing in front of Natasha, someone with a speed he can't react to, as if it's nothing, just a minor annoyance. He knows of the existence of the goddesses, and one goddess in particular who has his weakness, and he's still composed. If he's the old man I know, I can tell you he only acts like that when everything is going according to his plan. It was irritating when he always did that when it came to Arthur. Scathatch thought. Ha, it's an honor to be spoken of with such caution by the strongest female vampire. Tisk, I didn't want to remember how annoying it is to deal with you. Mah, mah, don't be like that, it may not look like it, but I respect Arthur's sword teacher a lot you know? Only you made that man grow a pair and fulfill his destiny. Something I could never have done. Ha! Huh. This is exhausting. Scathatch mentally sighed but didn't let it show on her face. Merlin would never admit his faults in public. He only did this once to me, and that act was to demonstrate that he was the real thing, ugh. Just what happened for him to become a demon and a demon from a completely different mythology? Oh. Scat Hatch, do an old acquaintance a favor. What? Kill that filth. Just looking at her and the history of these people, I feel bad memories coming back. A solemn look appeared on Skathika's face. Even after he became a demon, he still remembers her, hey. The thought that Merlin, of all people, falling to become a demon was something planned by the man himself was reinforced again. That's impossible. She's still useful. Well, I knew you would say that. Not to mention that if I know someone capable of changing a culture's ingrained thinking through force, that someone is you. You have always been very convincing. Just go away, Merlin. And remove these damn magic traps. Scathatch slammed her spear on the ground. Her spear was glowing with strange runes, and the moment the butt hit the ground, a magic circle appeared and was destroyed. How can you use magic as a demon? Demon magic is very useful, you know. The demon laughed as several red magic circles appeared on the ground. Each of them looked very different from normal human magic. Demon magic. Scathatch glared at him, confused. I coined the term. Even though I can't use my old energy, I can do something similar with the miasma of hell and the demonic energy in my body. Don't tell me. You did it again, you old bastard. Scathatch looked at him in disbelief. He he he, that's not such a difficult thing to do. Energy is energy, whether it's good or bad, it all depends on the user's will. However, every energy has an implicit rule. Without knowing these rules, you can't progress. Merlin looked at the magic circle he had created, the unspoken rule of this demonic energy lacks the subtlety I was used to, but... Beggars can't be choosers. Natasha and Agnes just looked at the demon as if it had grown a second, or even third, head. Demon magic. Hey? What the fuck is he talking about? The two thought. Ugh, it's good to know your genius wasn't killed by turning into a demon. 
If before she had doubts that this demon was Merlin, now she was absolutely sure that it was that old man. Only that accursed old man would be a genius capable of creating a new branch of magic. But that doesn't explain the knowledge he has of our group. How is that possible? Ruby and I are pretty sure we're hiding things. Though he might deduce something from my weird attitude, the way he said it was like he was absolutely sure of what he was saying. The gears in Skathika's head were working full throttle now, she wanted to understand what was going on. She, just like Victor, was very overprotective of her people, and she wouldn't let this matter go so lightly. Genius? Nat, I'm a hard-working genius, Scat Hatch. He laughed, and soon a dark portal appeared behind him. Hard-working genius, my delicious ass. Even someone very hard-working couldn't do what you did. After all, he wasn't just a genius but an absolute monster in his field of expertise. I'll see you in the future. Oh, a little warning, if I see any of these free Amazons out there, I'll be sure to kill them as brutally as possible. See. Merlin. The demon stopped talking and looked at Scat Hatch. Tell me, how did you find out about us? She didn't know what to think, so she decided to ask the demon, hoping their past friendship might be worth something. The four-eyed, four-armed demon just had a neutral smile. The thought of not telling crossed his mind, but he withdrew that thought. Scat Hatch knowing or not knowing did not interfere with his future plans, so he replied. On behalf of our ancient friendship, I will tell you. He held his hand up, showing four fingers. There are four beings and groups that, no matter what you try to do, you can never fully hide things from. First, Nyx, the primordial goddess of the night of the Greek pantheon and the mother of concealment. Nothing can be hidden from her, only if a being of the same rank or greater than her protects her group from her interest. Tisk, this little piece of shit. Don't give spoilers. Why are you putting my name in the game? I should just show up afterward. Nick screamed angrily, and even though she was screaming right in front of the group, no one could hear her if she didn't want them to. Merlin continued to speak, utterly unaware that he had managed to anger the primordial goddess of the night. Second, the primordial entities that maintain balance, but they are not interested in the matters of ordinary beings unless necessary. Their only concern is keeping everything running, so you can relax with those. Third, mortal beings and divinities who can see the threads of the future. The third group, in particular, doesn't know anything detailed about you. They only know about events that may or may not happen, since the future is not determined yet, and your present choices that shape the future. But unlike the first and second, the third group just has information about what might happen, so you don't have to worry about them. After all, those who can see the future multiple times are only gods related to fate. Weaker mortals cannot see the future often, or it will cause them too much harm. After all, it is something that should not be observed because it hasn't been built yet. Now the problem starts, the fourth group is the most active and dangerous. They are a group formed with many common goals. They call themselves New Dawn, and they have various races to their name, be they werewolves, noble vampires, vampire-human hybrids, hybrids of werewolves and vampires, demons and hellish creatures. Their scope of influence reaches everywhere and everyone. They may not know too much detail about you, but definitely, they are aware of your movements. Fighting in a dueling arena with the current leader of the Yukai faction is not something that can be kept hidden from other supernatural beings with more than one specific group like that. Well, that wasn't a very well thought out move, Agnes spoke. Indeed. About that group, recently. A new race has been added to this increasingly dangerous alliance. The Elder Gods. Strange beings who are not well understood by us but have techniques that can spy on people and deal with most situations. They completely complement each other, don't they? Merlin snorted. Scat Hatch, Natasha, and Agnes grimaced in discomfort when they heard what the demon said. They remembered the tiny monsters the Alphas used to spy on them. That's impossible. 
Victor would know if that insect was spying on us. Are they using something else? Scat Hatch couldn't figure it out, but one thing she was sure of. I will further strengthen the defenses against spies. Not to mention that your progenitor is not well known for acting in the shadows. Despite being a being of the night, he looks like a sun that catches everyone's attention. Well, he's not wrong. Victor isn't very subtle about these things. Natasha thought. Scat Hatch Scarlet, what did you teach Arthur in his first combat lesson? With Merlin's question, Skathika's dormant memory was reactivated, and she spoke. He who knows himself and his enemy can fight many battles and will never lose. A lesson to never underestimate your opponent. Scat Hatch opened her eyes wide. The trap set for Victor, the messengers of the Elder Gods being more active, the races that are allies in this new organization, the enemies that Victor didn't kill in the past because they lived in hiding. The pieces started to fit in Skathika's head. Ruby was right. Something was moving in the dark. The grudge of three thousand years will one day have to end, and on that day, believe me when I say that your enemies will be more prepared than you. Unlike you, who fight each other, they are united. Merlin turned around and continued speaking, Scat Hatch, the line of good and evil, black and white, right and wrong, the thing we call duality will be tested once again. What the kings of hell plan is not a simple war, but a complete change of how things are. I'll see you around, Scat Hatch Scarlet, the woman I respect most and will continue to respect. Chapter 658, No King Rules Forever But there are always exceptions. Pillar City of the 39th Rank, Malphas, a city composed of over 500,000 demons. A lesser demon stormed through the majestic door of Malphas's palace and knelt on the ground. My lord. He's arrived. Alucard is here, bringing with him a horde of over a hundred legions of demons. I know. I can feel him even though he's so far away, he's not trying to hide. What should we do? The lesser demon asked the pillar demon, who was seven meters tall and had long demonic wings, a tail, and horns. What a silly question. The pillar opened their eyes, and arrogance and wisdom were seen in their expression. We will fight. Maybe, he was not so wise. Generals. Yes, my lord, we are ready. How are the preparations going? Perfect, even though Alucard has so many demons, we've fought worse battles in the past. Dot. Demons. An overwhelming pressure fell throughout the city, and everyone felt Alucard's presence. Unconsciously, everyone turned toward his direction and saw Alucard standing on top of a mountain of ice. Next to him was a female demon with blue skin, prominent horns, and a long sharp tail. She was 180 centimeters tall, with a slim body that was not too big or too small and perfectly proportioned. Her eyes glowed an icy blue, giving off an ominous feeling because of her black sclera. The rumor is true. Vipar has allied with the invader. One of the two generals commented in shock. You have five seconds. Those who wish to surrender, leave the city and join my army. The moment his voice carried across the territory, in the next second, thousands of demons were seen flying into the sky toward Alucard. 5. The countdown began, spurring the demons to use all their strength to escape the territory. Some were jumping over the houses, while others ran in the streets. Some were kidnapping female demons and running around with them on their backs. In less than three seconds, all that was left were just Malpha's legions of demons. Malpha's and his generals looked at the spectacle with eyes wide in shock. Zero. Victor's eyes began to flash with lightning. Rumble, rumble. The noise of lightning was heard throughout the territory. Vipar, hold Junketsu. Don't touch the hilt, or bad things will happen to you. Why yes, my lord. Vipar stuttered a bit as she took Junketsu from Victor. Victor looked up at the sky, and with an impulse, he vanished and appeared above the city. A literal storm of golden lightning began to form in the sky. H hold on. Hold the fuck on. I need to get out of here too. 
The two generals spoke at the same time. I don't want to die with that fool. The generals used all their strength and flew toward the sky to get out of the territory as soon as possible. Malfas just stared at this sight in shock. Were these his most trusted generals? Victor's appearance slowly began to change. Lightning covered his armor, his ears became sharper, his eyes glowed a more prominent red, and two gigantic bat wings erupted from his back in the sky, looking like an angel had come to hell for judgment. Malfas finally awoke from his stupor. Wait. Alucard, wait. That power was dangerous. Even he wouldn't make it out alive in the face of that power. It is too late. Victor's voice echoed throughout the city. I am a man of my word, I only speak once. If I told you to leave, you were to leave the moment I ordered it. You made your choice. Live with the consequences of your choice. His sadistic smile was visible for all to see, he was evidently enjoying this. Victor pointed his finger at Malfas and said, Kieran. In the next moment, some of the clouds charged with golden lightning began to glow, and soon a bestial roar reverberated across the land. Ruhuor. A demonic-looking beast burst from the clouds and headed toward the ground. The beast didn't look like any known animal but rather an amalgamation of several of them, and the image was simply demonic. Fuck this. My asthma began to gather in Malfa's body, and the pillar demon began to grow in size. Soon a 20-meter-tall demon formed of pure miasma appeared, and this demon punched the face of the beast that Victor summoned, making the beast vanish into streaks of electricity. Do not underestimate me, Alucard. Even before you were born, I was already fighting. You are nothing. He roared with rage. Good, very good. Victor clapped his hands, now. Victor's smile became even more demonic. What are you going to do about these? He remarked while looking at the clouds. Hey! Ruhuhuor! Roars of various beasts sounded out, creating a symphony of madness that struck fear in all demons, even those following Victor. Malfas looked up to the clouds and saw several giant red eyes. Fuck, is this really allowed? Why is someone of your caliber attacking a lowly demon like me? Victor didn't answer, saying, become dog food, Malfas. And when he finished talking, several beasts similar to the previous one emerged from the clouds, racing toward the city at a startling speed. Damn you, Alucard. Boohoohoom. The 42nd rank pillar, Vipar. That was what she was called for most of her existence. The reason for this? It was very difficult to rise in the demon ranks, and this event only happened once every few hundred years. Vipar, as the 42nd rank demon, understood very well that breaking into the top 20 pillars was such a distant and impossible dream. After all, the top 20 demons had been around much longer than her, they were the true ancient demons. But. All that is in the past now, a story she would remember in the future. Vipar glanced at the man with long black hair and violet eyes. He was wearing full armor, and a weapon resembling a katana with a very long blade was in his hands. Victor Alucard. The second progenitor of vampires, a famous rising star in the supernatural world, a monster that shattered all common sense, an absolute genius who rose very quickly through the hierarchy of the supernatural world. Unlike her peers of the same rank who only cared about demons and hell's affairs, she kept her eyes peeled on the outside world. Even if the news was several days or weeks late, she still kept alert. After all, she'd only managed to survive this long thanks to that caution. The first time she'd heard about this man, she didn't pay it much attention. After all, the world was full of geniuses, but... She learned more about his accomplishments with each bit of news regarding him. She realized how abnormal he was. Because of this, the moment she learned that he was in hell and that he wanted to conquer hell, she quickly surrendered. And she did this for two reasons. The first reason was that she'd seen his one-sided battle with 45th rank demon pillar, Vine, and how this man wiped out her demon hordes so easily. Even if she were stronger than Vine and had more demons under her command, 
the difference between the 45th and 42nd rank was almost irrelevant for someone like him. The second reason. Fuck, he's so hot. Vipar shook her head and put those thoughts out of her mind. The second reason was demonstrated in the previous fight. He was strong, stupidly strong, and as someone who has had opportunities to see the top ten demonic pillars in action, she could deduce that only the top five could fight Alucard. And beyond the pillar ranks, maybe just the seven deadly sins and the horsemen of the apocalypse. Each of these beings was a force to be reckoned with in hell. But. I don't see him losing. Vipar thought. No matter the situation or circumstance, she couldn't see Victor losing. Vipar decided to bet, and she bet on Victor, a risky bet because he was going against all of hell. If she won the bet, it would change her life forever and leave her as someone high profile in a new society. If she got it wrong, well, she would disappear. Again, the image of the previous fight popped into her head and of the huge crater that was a city. Yes, I made the correct decision. She nodded in satisfaction. She had never seen someone capable of using so much energy and moving forward as if nothing had happened. Not to mention there was another secret reason why she was following Victor. Her lust for her power. She'd seen how Vine had changed and how the woman had gotten stronger. I want that. I want to become stronger. She would do everything to become someone trusted by Victor. After all, you couldn't command hundreds of thousands of demons with just one general. As he walked before his demons, Victor flashed a slight smile that no one saw. Looks like everything is going according to your plan, darling. Oh? Roxanne, did you digest all the food? Omu. I did. This place is much more alive now thanks to the nutrients, and consequently, the souls in your collection already number in the millions. Meh, it's not like I can do much now other than see their memories. Don't judge souls so much, they will be instrumental in the future, and even now, these souls are nurturing your existence. They are definitely not useless, A and D. Walking through hell as if it were your backyard because of the memories obtained from these demons is useful, isn't it? Alter spoke. Well. I'm not complaining, just a little frustrated that the technique didn't work. Give it time, you will soon be able to complete the technique. Soon? What you are talking about is hundreds of years, isn't it? Indeed. Victor rolled his eyes. Phew phew phew, that time might be closer than before, after all, we're in hell, aren't we? Alter Victor smiled. A smile Victor shared. That's why we're going to the deepest levels of hell. The further we go down Alter spoke. The more significant the time difference. Victor completed. That was one of the reasons Victor was on a walk. He was enjoying the moment and letting time pass. The longer he stayed here, the older he got, and the more his racial boundaries were loosened. During this whole walk through hell, he occupied his time with fighting, talking to the demons, and feeling the feelings of the demons towards him. All this was in an effort to not think about his wives, after all, from the perspective of Victor, more than one month had passed. If only Kagaya and the girls were here. Roxanne spent most of her time working on Victor's body and herself due to the exorbitant amount of nutrients, and she rarely spoke now since her work was very delicate and needed all her attention. Alter was a boring guy to talk to, and there were times when he didn't want to talk to men, even if that man was himself. Yes, he was missing the girls. Do not falter. Alter spoke in a serious tone. Do not look back. Keep walking. You chose our path. You must not regret it. This is not our way. We need to get stronger, and the opportunity has presented itself, seize this opportunity. Grab it with both hands and keep walking. We have no time for regrets, as the path to becoming stronger is full of difficulties and sacrifices. And your sacrifice is the least of all other beings. You know it's not a simple sacrifice. I know. For someone with your personality, being far from your love and obsession is like taking part of your heart away. 
but it is at these times that your resolve is tested. Do you want to get stronger or not? What a silly question. Of course, I do. His hold on Junkitsu's grip tightened, and Victor's eyes became more focused. Good. You got your eyes back. Now, look, another target has appeared. Victor smiled widely when he saw the city in the distance. Vipar. Why yes. The woman was taken aback by Victor's sudden voice. I have a task for you. Victor glanced at Vipar. The woman swallowed hard when she saw Victor's face and expression. Conquer that city. I don't care about the means. I don't care if the pillar demon dies. Take as many volunteers as you like, and complete the task. If you are successful, you will become mine and be reborn just like Vine. If you fail. His smile grew, well, failure isn't an option, is it? Vipar opened her eyes wide. An opportunity has presented itself. She didn't mind that you will be mine part at all in fact, that part was the most attractive to her. But. That was not the point. The point was that she would get power. As you wish, my lord. She touched her hand to her chest and bowed slightly, unable to hide her excited smile. You have three days. Victor walked toward a hill, and a throne of ice began to be created there. The moment he touched the throne, he turned and looked at the thousands of demons. You heard me, my legions of demons. His voice echoed throughout the gathering. I will not force you to fight for me but I will not have incompetent and useless people in my army. Each one will have a role. If you are confident in your strength, you will be a soldier. If you don't have the strength, you will go to logistics. Some demons sighed in relief when they heard that. Most of them were lesser demons who didn't have much strength, although even some of the demons who were already a little strong were happy about it. They didn't wish to enter as soldiers because they didn't have that much strength. A prominent trait of demons was that they developed over time, gaining their attributes as they aged, something like a succubus with the power of dreams, a basic ability of the succubus race. In an army, these two pillars are essential, and neither can function without the other. I don't value lineage. I don't care if you are the son of some demon pillar. I value merit and strength. Now, choose. Who will invade this city along with Vipar? Silence fell over the surroundings for a few seconds until several clearly high-level demons stepped forward. Soon, over 20,000 demons raised their hands. Looks like you have your army, Vipar. Victor displayed a small smile and then sat down on the ice throne. Vipar looked in shock at this sight, the reason for this? It was pretty simple. I thought it would be much less. After all, this is an army of several demons from different cities, but... She looked at Victor. He has great charisma, a natural leader. Vipar was more confident now of her great future. The man in front of her was exceptional. Chapter 659, No King Rules Forever. But there are always exceptions. 2. Gremory Territory a tall woman holding a battle axe made of ice looked down at the city from a hill. Is this the state that Gremory let his city fall to? Vine spoke in disdain when she saw this sight. The old city, which used to be the most beautiful despite not being the richest, had been reduced to the ruins of a slum. There is no glory to my master in conquering the weak. Vine swung the battle axe, which slammed into the ground her vision stretching across the entire territory and falling onto a nearly crumbling palace. For a moment, Vine saw a flash of red light and felt a mighty demonic power. Oh? What is this? Her interest was piqued by something inside the palace. Lady Vine, shall we invade? Vine stopped watching the city and looked back, and soon she saw whole hordes of demons. Just like her master, she'd progressed a lot in her conquest. At first, she thought it would be difficult, but she'd underestimated how much stronger she had gotten. With the strength of a 45th rank pillar demon and the strength boost Victor granted her, she could easily handle most of the higher ranks. 
Her armies were nothing compared to her power to control storms, and she still had this weapon. The ice axe was made from her master's own energy, a deadly item that, no matter how much she swung around, the ice itself would never take a scratch. Vine didn't know how many days had passed, she just knew that her conquest was almost over. All pillar demons from ranks 46 to 55 were all dead, and their strength was taken from them. At least those that hadn't survived her invasion. Previously, during her first invasion, she'd used cowardly means of gaining victory. But, after learning about her strength, she attacked head-on in her successive conquests just like her master had against her, something she preferred as she was never much for subtleties on the battlefield. She currently had over 200,000 demons under her command, most of whom were weak. After all, unlike her master, she didn't have tremendous charisma nor overwhelming force to lean on. Therefore, she had to go the old-fashioned way, defeat everyone and everything, and those who lost would pledge allegiance to her master. Now, after several months, she was in front of Gremory's territory. We will not attack. Wait for me here, I will talk to Gremory. With the current state of affairs, he should offer no resistance. Yes, Lady Vine. Vine tensed her legs, and with a burst, she jumped towards the city. Too easy. Vine thought as she entered the demon pillar's chambers with no effort. I had heard rumors and news about it, but to think that Gremory had fallen that much, Citri's blow must have affected him a lot. Who are you? Vine stopped walking, looked back, and saw a female demon. She had long reddish-black hair, two horns, two wings, and a tail. She had pale skin, crimson-red eyes, and black eyeliner, if any mortal saw her, they would find the woman very beautiful. I didn't notice her. A succubus. Vine raised an eyebrow when he saw the demon's otherworldly beauty. Those dead eyes. She's seen a lot of shit, hey. Vine knew those eyes very well. My name is Vine. The 45th rank pillar? What are you doing here? The girl asked with a confused voice but with the same dead expression. I came here to have Gremory swear allegiance to my lord. We already serve under the same king, don't we? She asked, confused. Diablo is not my lord, Vine spoke with a disdain that took the girl by surprise, not that the surprise showed on her face. My lord is far more incredible than him. He was the one who did this to me, and he even gave me a present. Look. Vine spoke with a dreamy look as she pointed to the axe. The girl looked at the axe and found herself surprised again. So much demonic energy. And this fanaticism. Who is your lord? You do not know. Nu. No. Don't you keep up with the news? I thought all of hell knew that already. Look around. Do you think I have time to listen to rumors? Makes sense. Vine said as she looked at the decrepit palace. And if you're looking for Lord Gremory, he's not here. Oh? Did he leave his territory in this state? You do not understand. Hey. When I say he's not here, that means he's not in hell or anywhere. He. Died? Yes, he died. Well, shit. The possibility that the girl was lying to her was very high but Vine didn't detect any lies or traces of deceit that she would typically pick up on. This entire time the girl was honest. Did she hide things? Yes, she did, that was obvious. But she never lied. May I ask how he died? I don't know. I recently learned of it from an emissary of the Demon King. If the Demon King sent an emissary, then it's true that he has died permanently. Did Diablo kill him? Did Citri kill him? Did some random demon whore kill him? Who knows? I don't know. Even with her apathetic tone, the tone of disdain was evident in the woman's voice. Who are you, girl? Vine narrowed her eyes and realized she wasn't talking to an ordinary servant. After all, an ordinary servant wouldn't speak to an emissary of the Demon King. Helena Gremory, heir to this shithole you call a town. Vine opened her eyes a little. 
Gremory had a daughter. With a succubus? I thought he would never get over his ex-wife's death. Now that you know, what are you going to do? Kill me? Use me as a breeding machine because I have the Gremory bloodline. This girl says some morbid things with a neutral expression. Vine thought. Vine looked at Helena for a long time, thinking about several things. It's obvious that she has been through trauma, her dead eyes prove it. She doesn't seem like a naive girl either, and she revealed her heritage with complete certainty that I meant no harm to her. She's smart. And usually, people who have gone through hardship, when they gain something for themselves, cling to it with undying loyalty. A loyalty my lord will love. Plans began to form in Vine's head until she grew a big demonic smile. Have you heard of Victor Alucard? Vine, marching towards the territory of the 60th rank, looked to the side and saw Helena in full armor, a new addition to the army. After explaining who she was and who she served, Helena readily accepted joining Vine. Even the demons from her territory joined Helena, allowing Vine to conquer another city easily. She's a diamond in the rough. That was Vine's only thought regarding Helena. The woman was a strategic genius and an expert in the magic of succubus dreams, not to mention that the Gremory bloodline was strong in the girl. The ability to increase and decrease mass at will. At first, it might seem pointless, but the previous Gremory proved how wrong they were. Do you want gold? Okay, just give me a piece of gold, and by increasing the mass of the coin, you now have a few hundred pounds of permanent gold. The Gremory were quite wealthy because of it. Was it useless for combat? Of course, now. Take any stone and throw it at someone while applying significantly more mass, and that stone becomes a damn meteor. The Gremory were deadly in combat because of it, and anything in their hands could become a weapon. Vine didn't know the rules for applying this power, there was a limitation on its use something the ancient Gremory made quite apparent to all pillar demons, but one thing was certain. The power of dreams and bulking up combined perfectly. If Helena could reach the state that Lilith's former general, the Reaper, and Lilith herself had achieved. The power of turning a dream into reality for a few minutes, that ability would be deadly in Helena's hands. Master will be pleased with me Vine had the excitement of a child waiting for rewards from their father. Lady Vine the 60th rank city is ahead. Vina woke from anticipating future events that would happen to her she was absolutely sure that her hopeful future would come to pass and looked at Helena. I already said, don't call me Lady Vine. With your talent, you will probably be my equal in the future. Until that day happens, I will continue to call you Lady Vine. She spoke in the same neutral, emotionless tone. Ugh. That's her problem. She's very proper. She doesn't look like a demon who revels in chaos, but a damn angel. That was Helena's only flaw in Vine's opinion. What should we do? Helena asked. The same strategy we used previously with 59th rank. I shall announce our terms, if they refuse, I throw several stones at them, got it, Helena replied. Hmm, glad you understand. Let's get back to work. And you nerds. Don't be inattentive, prepare for any enemy attack. Yes. The demons behind her screamed. Helena looked at this vision with neutral eyes. Alucard's legions of demons, hey. I was supposed to have researched more about that name when I heard it in the past. Although even if I wanted to, I wouldn't have time for that given the events my father brought upon us, she thought in disdain. Demons. She heard Vine's booming voice and looked straight ahead. I wonder what kind of person Alucard is. He must be someone powerful and interesting to make a pillar demon of the same generation as my father so loyal to him. You know who we are. You know who I am. Now, choose. Vine's smile grew, and the weather around them started to look like a storm would break out at any moment. Submit or die. Ha, not bad. Not bad at all. It looks like Vipar has an innate ability to command. Victor was extremely pleased. The entire process took longer than he'd expected, 
but that was normal, these demons weren't him. Victor was looking at the image of Vipar on top of a pillar demon's corpse. The whole conquest process was quite ingenious. Vipar first made her statement, and with that, several demons left the city and joined Victor's forces. After that, the process was smoother, and she just had to order the demons to hit key points in the city and disperse the Pili demons' elites. Then she ordered some demons to attack head-on, and amid the chaos she created. She left a copy of herself where she was and single-handedly attacked the pillar demon and managed to kill it. A distraction tactic and perfect murder. Clones, hi. Victor looked at Vipar, who was ordering the demons around, and the other, original, Vipar. Not perfect like that general. Victor once fought a human who could make clones, but with his eyes, he could distinguish them even though they looked similar to the original. Vipar's clones lacked substantiality, but from what Victor understood, that wasn't her specialty. The reason for that was that these clones were made from pure water. She's a water user just like me. Interesting. Your lord is dead. Vipar's voice carried across the entire city, and she raised the demon's head. The moment the pillar demon was declared slain, all the remaining demons lost their will to resist and knelt down. Very good indeed. Looks like I found my second general. Only one to go. While Victor enjoyed the view, he wasn't idle and was thinking about the future. And how his army's power structure would form. In total, he wanted three generals and twelve commanders split between those generals, making a total of four commanders for each general. This combat structure was more efficient for commanding so many demons precisely. Even though Victor was a genius, he couldn't give orders to thousands of demons without a very rigid command structure. The three generals will be the elites. I want them to be at least the level that can fight me and Scathatch in our basic forms without breaking a sweat or being outmatched, and the commanders, I want them to at least take a few punches from me. He had a basic idea of how the forces of the world were, but since he hadn't fought much with these beings yet, he could only use him and Scathatch as an example. After all, he knew more about himself and Scathatch than the rest. Victor would not accept mediocrity. He wanted strong demons beneath his command, and the three generals must be absolutely loyal to him. Because of that, Victor would take the three generals for himself. Unaware that his expectations were ridiculous, after all, he and Scathatch were constantly evolving at an insane pace. Victor looked at Vipar, who was kneeling before him. My lord, the head of their leader, Vipar spoke humbly as she looked up at the hill where Victor's throne once stood with expectant eyes. Vipar, you have proven to me your efficiency and the execution of plans and dexterity worthy of an assassin. I am satisfied. Vipar's eyes gleamed. Victor looked at the other demons behind Vipar. You all were excellent as well. You followed Vipar's orders perfectly and didn't act with arrogance for the sake of glory. You are true soldiers. The demons behind Vipar nodded and kept their heads down, but their small smiles were quite visible on their demonic features. Tell me, Vipar. Is assassination your specialty? No, my lord. Although my powers aren't as strong as Citri's, I'm an expert in terrain control. I use the water I produce to my soldiers' advantage. Assassination is just a side job I'd learned over my long life. I see. How many minor trades did you learn? I've lost count. Victor's smile grew. Good at everything, but master of nothing. In a way, Victor and Vipar were similar, with the only difference being that Victor's talent was much more extraordinary than Vipar's. Looks like we'll have to change that in the future. Victor spoke. Those words left Vipar completely confused, but she didn't have time to think of anything when Victor raised his hand to speak. Cocoon. Pure ice began to be created beneath the kneeling demons. And that caused a little commotion since they thought they had let Victor down on something. Don't worry, I'm not punishing you. I'm rewarding you. We just don't want prying eyes watching, right? With just those words, he managed to put all the demons at ease, 
proving once again how ridiculous his charisma was. Soon, all the demons in front of Victor were encased in a cocoon of ice along with Victor. Roxanne. Leave it to me. I'll focus on the lesser demons. We're just giving them a small portion of energy, right? Indeed, I will focus on Vipar. Inside the cocoon, threads of red energy began to enter the demons' bodies. That pure, negative energy was changing the demons, making them, better. Soon, like a butterfly emerging from its cocoons, the demons were reborn. Fush. <laughs> Several pillars of negative energy rose to the heavens, painting the entire red sky with an even deeper crimson glow. Chapter 660, No King Rules Forever But there are always exceptions. 3. On the way to 39th Rank City, Malphas. Victor glanced at Vipar, who didn't look much different from before. Her height changed to 186 centimeters tall, and her body acquired more pronounced curves, but what stood out the most about her was her ice-tipped tail and the horns. The environment around the woman became much colder as well. It was clear that she had become some kind of ice demon. Victor looked at the lesser demons and saw that the change in their appearance was not as intense since he'd given them less energy than Vipar. But one thing was sure, these demons, who'd received less energy, became elites, demons that only an elder vampire experienced in fighting could handle. A ridiculous leap of power. It wasn't wrong to say they were now as strong as demon pillar ranks from rank 60 and above. But even though they'd gotten so strong, they didn't develop unique characteristics that differentiate a pillar demon from an ordinary demon. For example, Vipar's power before was to create and control water, but now, she could do it with ice in a way very similar to Clan Scarlet's power. Actually, she might be even better than Clan Scarlet because she's become an existence made entirely from ice. She's closer to an ice spirit now than a demon. Is it because of Roxanne's energy? Victor deduced. Demon of Frost is an appropriate name for her because she genuinely has become what the title refers to. Fu fu fu, I wonder how the girls will react when they discover you've acquired three more women for your harem. Roxanne surprised Victor a little by starting to speak, thus pulling him out of his deep thoughts. Three women. Vipar, Vine, and a future female general. Victor rolled his eyes. I'm not taking them into my harem or anything, Roxanne. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right. You're just giving power to demons who are power crazed, you're just demonstrating your superiority to female demons which is a trait that makes all female demons wet their panties in lust. You're just giving female demons more attention than male demons, something no other demon in hell would do. You're just making them stronger and more loyal to you, practically sealing their fate to live forever being obsessed with you for your attention and touch. Victor was silent. When you put it that way, I sound like some kind of villain manipulating women to join his harem. Era. Darling just realized this now. Victor could clearly sense that Roxanne was a little irritated. But, don't worry, darling. Even if you become the most feared villain in the world, I will still be by your side. And probably the three female generals will also be by your side. After all, there is no other villain who is as beautiful as you. Hey, if I'm going to have generals who can keep up with me in anything, I'd rather have strong women than bearded muscular men. At least you're honest in your desire to have a good view while going to war. Roxanne spoke in a sarcastic tone. Hat, but I always have a good view to look at when I'm alone, right? After all, you are always here with me. A transparent image of Roxanne appeared in front of Victor, looking at him with a neutral gaze. Nobody around Victor noticed the woman suddenly appearing, after all it was just an image for Victor to see. See what I said? A good view. Victor smiled gently. Humph, if you think that's enough to make me happy, you're sorely mistaken. Roxanne snorted as she turned her face away and wrapped her arms around her, emphasizing her developed assets. Despite her hostile words, the shade of red and her happy smile gave away her true feelings. Phew phew phew, don't be like that. 
Roxanne, I still promise to spoil you a lot, right? After all, if it weren't for you, I'd have been dead the moment I set foot in this place. Victor spoke in a gentle and loving tone. Roxanne's body visibly shivered when she heard Victor's tone. She glanced at him and saw eyes that seemed to contain a black hole within them. That look put an even bigger smile on Roxanne's face. I'll be waiting for my reward. I'll try not to disappoint you. Victor smiled. Roxanne swallowed when she heard what he said. Perhaps, I shouldn't have provoked him so much. She felt she bit off a lot more than she could chew. Even without motivation, Victor was very good at what he did. But now, with the right motivation, the image of Skathika's defeat in bed came to mind. Although this is also good. Hmm. Roxanne stopped her thoughts when she felt something changing. What happened? Alter is losing some of his appearance. That is natural. The more demons Victor kills and that you absorb, the more his body is refined and the stronger it gets, thus, the more of my power he can access. Eventually, I will revert to my black ghost form and begin to return to where I belong. Alter replied. Am I accelerating Victor's evolution? Yes, it seems Victor's maturation time will be shorter than all noble vampires in Vlad's bloodline history. Well, he's a progenitor. He's the beginning of his race, and isn't following another race's rules pretty pointless. Roxanne always thought that was contradictory to the name progenitor. You don't understand. Although we are a progenitor, the trigger that made us what we are today was our wives' bloodlines, which, technically, was also Vlad's bloodline. It's not wrong to say that Victor has Vlad's bloodline in his body. Even though that same bloodline was destroyed thanks to our authority as progenitor, it's still there, it was merely the trigger for the change. Oh. Roxanne understood now. Without your interference, Roxanne, when he completed the first cycle of 500 years, he would become an adult, and the path specially made for him and his bloodline would open up. This was what was supposed to happen, but again, we broke this rule. Through refining hundreds of demon souls, demon blood, and with the help of a world tree constantly driving our existence forward, we are experiencing an overdrive state. This is an abnormal situation. No being, whether they be a god or mortal, should experience this state, and because of this phenomenon, our existence is forcefully adapting to remain balanced. Of course, if it weren't for Roxanne's support in holding our body together, we would have exploded from having so much energy. I thought my body was holding it. Victor spoke. At first, yes. But darling, overeating is never good in any scenario. And that's what you've been doing since you arrived in hell. Roxanne spoke. You're acting like a filter, hey. Or more specifically, a faucet that holds all that energy so my body doesn't explode. Victor deduced. That's right, and even though I hold onto your energy with all my might, you can still create multiple spheres of power equivalent to a more powerful atomic bomb. Looks like finding you used up all the available luck in my life, hey. You are too precious. Humph, did you only realize it just now? There is a reason why Vlad wanted me so much. With my existence, bringing you to the level of God-King and surpassing that level is something that only takes time and effort. There is no limit you cannot cross with me by your side. So pamper me. Give me affection. I want love. Roxanne started to throw a tantrum. Something that left a happy smile on Victor's face. It was cute to see her acting like that, he knew she was just doing it for fun. In Victor's inner world, Alter looked at his hand, which was losing shape, and becoming the dark phantom hand it once was. Good. Soon, I will be united again. For Alter, it was a blessing to return to where he belonged. You look happy, Alter. Alter looked at Roxanne. Of course I am. My other self is getting stronger, your existence is getting stronger, and soon enough, I'll be back where I'm supposed to be where I should never have left in the first place. Roxanne just nodded. 
She had nothing to add to that statement, after all, she knew this was something Alter had wanted for a long time. How is his progress? Alter changed the subject as he looked at a gigantic red lake in the distance. Roxanne flashed a smile, the smile of a mother looking at her growing child, a very motherly smile. He is growing smoothly, and soon, my guardian will be the strongest. How long will it take for him to wake? In around three years? This time may decrease if Victor kills more high-level demons. Something he will definitely do. So best case, if all goes well, three months, worst case, three years. I see. Time is of the essence, hey. Because of that, he's walking deeper into hell. Yes, time displacement is all messed up in hell. I don't know how much time has passed since this place has no day or night. I agree with you. We should, oh. Alter looked up at the sky. Looks like Vine did a good job. He smiled. Roxanne turned her face in the direction Alter was looking, and through Victor's eyes, she saw a horde of demons with two women walking at the head. A succubus. She felt her face tighten a little. Looks like Master gained the three generals he wanted. Do you think that succubus? Yes, as Scat Hatch likes to say, she is a diamond in the rough. I can tell clearly just by the amount of negative energy surrounding her. My lord, I have returned. Vine knelt before Victor, followed by all the other demons, including Helena herself. She was faster than I thought. Victor was very surprised. A delightful surprise indeed. Your task. Vine raised her face. She glanced at Vipar, noticing she had acquired new features. Tisk, her too, hey. All demon ranks from 46th to the 60th have been completely eliminated. Victor flashed a satisfied smile, good job, Vine. Vine's face lit up. Then, when she was about to ask about the reward, Victor spoke. We'll talk about the reward later. But, first, tell me, were there any pillars that joined me? Unfortunately not. Ancient demons are very proud, master. Few of them have the ability to see reality. Most become lost in the greatness of their past achievements and all they had built. Thus, they would rather die than lose everything. Vine could say that very well. After all, she was like that too. The only reason she hadn't died at Victor's hand was that she was the first demonic pillar he'd encountered when he'd arrived in Hell, and he needed allies. She was absolutely sure that was it. Victor nodded his head softly, his expression neutral. His gaze soon shifted from Vine to the gathered demons. When his gaze fell on a demon, they, without exception, shuddered. This monster is the Lord of Vine. Someone who subdued a pillar demon. Thoughts like that were common enough for the demons who felt Victor's gaze. Only one demon showed no discomfort at Victor's gaze, the succubus beside Vine. A succubus, on this side of hell. Victor spoke. With the memories of the demons he'd absorbed, he had a basic understanding of every place where the famous races of demons lived. The succubi, without exception, were commanded by Lilith, and Lilith did not live in the area of the pillar ranks. Instead, she had her own government on the other side of the dimension. I am a half-breed, sir. Helena spoke as she turned her face up and looked at Victor, unfortunately, due to my heritage, I couldn't join Lady Lilith. Although, there are days when I'm grateful for not joining. I know that the situation she's in right now isn't very favorable. Those who lose to a stronger demon have their fate placed in the victor's hands. Lilith, who lost to Diablo, was a perfect example, as were all the succubi that Lilith commanded. Looking at it that way, Helena felt she was fortunate. She was sure that being under the thumb of the incarnation of evil was not a very good thing. Oh. Victor raised his eyebrow at Helena's lifeless gaze. Victor took a step forward towards Helena. And that movement took everyone by surprise for a few seconds but soon everyone was silent and watched. What's your name, succubus? Before Vine could open her mouth to speak, 
Helena spoke in the same lifeless tone as before. Gremory. Helena Gremory, the only living heir to the Pillar Demon, Gremory. Helena. You have the eyes of someone I knew in the past. Excuse me. The eyes of someone who has completely lost the will to live. I met a little girl like that in the past, a little girl I now treat like my own daughter. Victor spoke, thinking of Eve and how happy she was today compared to when he first saw her. Helena didn't know how to react. She didn't expect melancholic looks and gentle eyes from someone in Victor's position. The people of power she knew were always the perfect definition of arrogance, pride, and power. Despite having power, and pride, Victor lacked visible arrogance. Something she found very pleasing. At least he wouldn't issue unreasonable commands. Tell me, Helena. What do you know how to do? As a gremory, dash. I said. What you know how to do, Helena. I care little for the name gremory. Helena's eyes widened in surprise. Everyone she'd interacted with had never asked her that question, they didn't look at her as Helena but simply as the spawn of Gremory. Even the people of her territory and vine regarded her as a Gremory and not Helena. Slowly her eyes began to close, leaving only a tiny, almost imperceptible smile. I see. Now, I understand why he was able to unite so many demons. Her eyes opened and her lifeless eyes had gained an imperceptible shine that made them not look as dead as before. It was a slight glow, but it was definitely there. I know how to do many things, from administering a territory to enacting war. She was an heiress, after all. But if I may say so, I excel at formulating strategies that will always guarantee victory. That was her personal pride. Being the heir to a weak army like the Gremory had its advantages. Thanks to that, Helena had to improvise, so she had to learn a more human and cruel way of war, a method that left even the demons in shock at times. After all, as the saying goes, at times, humans were much crueler than demons. Oh? In that case, let's put your talent to the test. Hey! I will give you command of 50,000 lesser demons and an elite that is vine. I want you to conquer the rank 39 THS territory without any casualties. He's kidding, right? That was the expression on Helena's face, but Victor's neutral, amused expression was anything but a joking look. It was worth noting that from the 39th rank and onwards, their demon armies could number in the millions, and from the top 20 onwards, they could number in the hundreds of millions. Only an excellent strategy could be able to conquer an entire city, and without casualties at that. This will be a challenging test. Are you capable of that? Helena kept looking into Victor's violet eyes, and only now did she realize how handsome the man in front of her was, but that matter was irrelevant now, she had a job to do. I am. She replied with a determined face, give me two weeks, and I will bring you victory. Very well. Victor turned around with his long black hair fluttering in the wind, and a throne of ice was created before him. Then, as he sat down and rested his head on his fist, he announced. You have two weeks, Helena. Helena nodded. She was a little nervous, but her determination to prove herself was much stronger. Vipar, in these two weeks, I want you to organize the army and get everyone's opinion. I want to know who wants to be a soldier and who wants to be part of the logistics of the future territory I will build. Then, he closed his eyes as if saying he had no more things to order. He completely ignored Vine, Helena, and Vipar's surprised faces when he spoke of a future territory. If I may ask, my lord. You're planning to build a territory? Where will that territory be? With the same posture, he casually replied. Of course, it will be in the deepest reach of hell. All the demons opened their eyes wide. M my lord, the deepest reach of hell belongs to the incarnation of evil, the current demon king, Diablo. Vipar stammered. Victor opened his eyes and asked, is that a problem? Vipar was speechless but quickly replied. Oh of course not. Good. Now, back to work. 
yes. Chapter 661, Standoff Between Goddesses and Countesses Scat Hatch, Agnes and Natasha, at this point, were very irritated. The reason? The three goddesses in front of them. Athena, the dumbest bitch on Olympus. According to Agnes. Hera, the woman who could be up for the biggest green hat award in the entire universe, proclaimed by all to be the most despicable cuckold in all of existence. According to Natasha. Artemis, the most annoying woman to ever exist. She shouldn't even be called a woman but rather some parasite, she didn't qualify as a woman. According to Scat Hatch. Ever since the goddesses met the countesses, the women were acting, well, like goddesses, and this attitude was really pissing off Scat Hatch, Natasha, and Agnes. They just didn't do anything at Hestia's request. As the patron goddess who blessed their family, the three women held an eternal debt to Hestia, but, even the Buddha had his limits of patience. And you can be sure the limit had been crossed for the three countesses. Enough. Scat Hatch slammed the butt of her spear into the ground, causing a loud crash around, drawing the attention of all. The goddesses and the Amazons watching looked at the group of countesses, specifically the strongest female vampire. Runes began to glow on Skatika's spear, and a killing intent forged through millennia of fighting wars exploded with her in the center. Athena, Hera, and Artemis shuddered at the sight. Skatika's killing intent was as great as Ares himself. Despite not liking the rival god of war, Athena was the one who knew most about his ability. And to think that a mortal could do the same things as the god of war. Athena swallowed hard, and she looked at the spear in the hand of Scat Hatch, which was giving off an ominous feeling. I've lost patience for dialogue. Skatika's red hair began to float as if defying gravity, and her killing intent increased several notches. I will only say this once, so listen well. First, the Amazons come with us, and no, they don't have the right to an opinion. They will come, and that's it. The Amazons really wanted to protest, but they were too scared to do so. Mayaniku, the queen of the Amazons, didn't say anything. As queen of the Amazons, her obligation would be to listen to the goddesses who had helped her people in the past, but... Unfortunately, those same goddesses were divided. One side wants to use us in a war of gods, an act that would see my people exterminated. When gods fought, mortals should hide and pray they don't get caught in the crossfire. That was common sense. While the other side wants to preserve my species and ask for our help in times of emergency. From a logical point of view and for the good of her kind, going with Scat Hatch was the best decision for her people. Second, if you three bitches don't get out of here in less than five seconds. I guarantee you, nothing will remain of you to remember the proud goddesses you are. The runes on Skathika's spear began to move across the entire weapon as if they were alive. The three goddesses shuddered. It was noteworthy that master and student were very similar in terms of patience. After all, Victor was doing the same thing in hell. Third. Scat Hatch looked at Hestia, before you complain, understand, despite being our patron goddess, there are limits to our patience that we can endure, and the attitudes of these three bitches do not help much. Hestia just sighed. I know. I'm sorry for asking something unreasonable. I just didn't want them to die right now. Like it or not, they are still important to the civil war of Olympus. Even if Zeus brought them back, he would hardly waste the energy to bring Hera back, and Hera is my sister. What could the goddess of marriage do in war? Marry enemies and allies for peace? That would hardly work on the Titans. She was effectively useless in battle. If they died now, Zeus would just use his energy to bring back Athena and Artemis. Hera would remain dead until she came back naturally after a few millennia. Hestia knew her younger brother's personality very well. He would not hesitate to sacrifice everything and everyone to maintain his power and authority. Skathika's annoyance lightened, and she looked at Hestia with soft eyes. She couldn't get angry or hate somebody who was very loyal to the family. You were born into the wrong family, Hestia. 
Hestia smiled sadly, I get told that a lot. This sight made the irritation of the three countesses lessen a lot. In the middle of all this confusion, a certain goddess of the night was sitting on a black sofa with gold details eating popcorn, with an excited glow on her face. It was obvious that she loved this whole mess. With Skathika's temperament, I thought they would fight as soon as they met. It seems that countesses evolved as people as well. The old Skathatch wouldn't have cared about anything and just attacked everyone. She's become more patient. It must be because she has the equivalent of a literal sex god in mortal form catering to her bestial needs. Nyx commented with slight hints of envy as she thought of the man who was Aphrodite's male counterpart. Lucky woman, that Aphrodite. She didn't just get her old love, Adonis. But gained a new love that would do anything for her. That bitch doesn't deserve him. She snorted in irritation and continued watching. Just get the hell out of here, goddesses. Don't you have a lot of work to do on Mount Olympus? Return to your broken home. Your executioner is waiting for you. Agnes spoke dismissively, shooing the women away like stray dogs. Indeed, just get the hell out of here while we still have our patience, Natasha spoke in the same tone of disdain as Agnes. Veins began bulging on the heads of the three goddesses. These mortal whores. Hera began. Rumble, rumble. Wait, Natasha. No, don't, please. Hestia screamed in horror. Hera couldn't continue as she felt something sharp pressed against the back of her neck. F fast. Say that again, and I promise I will shred you into so many pieces that my dog won't need food for several years. Natasha's cold voice and expression sent chills through everyone present except for Skathatch and Agnes. I said, say. That. Again. In the end, her tone became much more monstrous. Let her go. Dot. Artemis was going to say something, but Agnes interrupted. People underestimate how broken speed can be. There's a reason Clan Fulger has been a clan of vampire counts for a long time. Agnes spoke as she walked forward, Fafner's blade beginning to catch fire and her eyes glowing as if the very flames were embodied in her being. In the time it takes for you to speak a single word, in her current position, Natasha could kill Hira a hundred times over and return to where she was before. Against Natasha, only my husband, speed aspects gods like Hermes, or Skat Hatch, using her strongest technique, could have a chance of defeating her in a fight. A goddess of marriage is just a powerless civilian before her. Pointing her sword wreathed in flames at Artemis, who had her divine bow pointed at Natasha, she asked. So? What will you do? Because the moment you lose that arrow, I will incinerate your existence with the flames of Fafner. Artemis shuddered when she heard the dragon's name, and with squinted eyes, she glanced at the blade in Agnes' hand. Utilizing her divine senses, she opened her eyes wide when she saw a massive dragon watching, waiting, begging for her to make the wrong choice. The blade is still alive. A Athena dot. I can't. Athena quickly spoke, already knowing what her fellow goddess wanted. Hey. Artemis looked at Athena and was shocked when she saw the goddess state. Only her head was in sight, the rest of her body resembling an ice sculpture. Ugh, I can't move. I can't even break this ice. What is this stuff made of? It's so tough. Athena snarled inwardly. When? The moment you showed intentions to attack, Skathatch replied coldly. Artemis looked at Skathatch with the same shock on her face. How can mortals be so strong? I couldn't even react, what's wrong with these mortals? Oya? Oh yeah? They became much stronger than before especially Natasha and Agnes. Nyx scanned the two countesses with her divine senses. Using her authority as the mother of concealment, no secrets could be kept from her, as long as she wanted to know, she would. I see. The progenitor's blood is strong in their veins. It seems they performed the clan initiation ritual. This explains the sudden increase in strength. 
even Fafner isn't teasing its current host anymore and has fully accepted Agnes as its master. I don't know if you lot are arrogant or stupid. Maybe both. Suddenly Nike, who had been so far silent, began to speak. The three goddesses looked at Nike. They have me here, the goddess of victory. Your chance of winning anything in my presence is slim to none. It wasn't arrogance if it was a fact. What will it take for you to understand that you have no chance to do anything here? She spoke in disdain. Forget about taking the Amazons. I will not condemn an entire race for Zeus's mistake. He and his inner circle can all die for all I care. A saddened look fell on Hestia's face. Even though she knew it was inevitable, she still felt depressed hearing it. Ha, ha at least my mother and my sister, Demeter, are safe. She tried to comfort herself with that fact. There were times when Hestia just wanted to kidnap her wayward brothers, put them in a basement, and keep them for herself, but she lacked the strength to achieve such a feat. Now get out of here before we ignore Hestia's kindness, and do something that'll make the gentlest goddess sad. A stalemate fell into place, but that stalemate ended when Hera spoke. F fine, we will leave. Even though she didn't want to show it, Artemis sighed in relief. As a goddess who helped the Amazons, she didn't want to condemn them to a war that wasn't theirs to fight. Not to mention that even if they did interfere, nothing would change. What could mortals with divine artifacts do against Titans? Titans, who are basically second-generation primordial entities. Yes, they couldn't do anything. What Hira was ordering was unreasonable. Skathatch looked at Natasha and nodded. Understanding the redhead's message, she clicked her tongue, disappeared in a trail of lightning, and returned to the countess's side. Natasha crossed her arms and snorted in irritation. In her opinion, it was better to kill these goddesses. Even if they returned a few days later due to the interference of Zeus, who wouldn't want to lose his war potential, it would at least bring Natasha a sweet sense of satisfaction. Skathatch hit the ground with the butt of her spear, causing the ice that encapsulated Athena's body to disappear slowly. The three goddesses came together again, and it was at that moment that the reality of the situation came back to Hera. W wait, I don't want to go back to Mount Olympus. I'm basically useless. Can I go with you, Hestia? The whole place fell into absolute silence. Even the Amazons and Nyx looked at Hera with dead eyes. She's too shameless. Everyone thought unanimously. You can't. I won't allow it, Nike replied before Hestia's kindness was exploited again. I asked my elder sister. And not you, Nike. She's just your elder sister when you need something from her. Nike said dismissively. I will not let you exploit Hestia like this. She might be too dumb and kind for her own good towards her family, but she's still our Hestia. I will ward off bad influences like you. Hestia felt an arrow pierce through her heart. Just leave, bitches. Just seeing your faces is making me want to vomit with disgust. Agnes spoke with a disgusted face. Wow, she is cruel. The Amazons thought. Shoo. Shu, leave now. Why are you still here? Get the fuck out of here. Veins bulged on the heads of the three goddesses. Agnes had a natural talent for pissing people off, something Violet inherited splendidly. Percent, percent, get us out of here. Athena shouted. Question marks appeared on the heads of the countesses, Hestia, Nike, and Amazons. What did she say? They all thought, Confused. Bitch. She almost outed me. Good thing I hid my name. Nyx screamed in anger and relief. Soon she spoke words that only the three goddesses could hear, just use your divine energy and think about returning to Mount Olympus. The entrance is not closed to you. White energy covered the bodies of the three goddesses, and soon they disappeared. Arriving on Mount Olympus, Hera shouted. Those whores. This is the attitude they show to the Queen of Olympus. Artemis and Athena rolled their eyes. That title isn't worth shit to that group. 
Athena thought. I thought you didn't want to return to Mount Olympus? Why didn't you hide in the mortal world? Artemis asked. A goddamn Genesis war is happening on Earth. Going to that place without protection is just asking for other supernatural beings to kidnap me. Oh, I had forgotten about that shit, Artemis commented, frowning in frustration. So much shit was happening in so short a time that she could barely keep up with everything. Anyway, where is Nyx? Athena asked. Just forget about that woman and her machinations. Hira huffed and returned to her personal area. Despite having heard Hira say this, Athena did not stop thinking about the woman. When a primordial goddess like Nyx moved, it was because she wanted something, and Athena wanted to know what. Finally, they are gone. Hey, Amazons! Throw salt around! Don't forget about the holy water too. Cast out the evil energies of those thoughts. The Amazons stood in silence, not knowing what to do. What are you waiting for? Do what I said. Agnes screamed angrily. Why yes. What an unreasonable woman. All the Amazons thought. I presume you have no objections about what was planned, right? Natasha asked Maya. Of course not. This is better for us. Now that the barrier that protects our kingdom has fallen, and our kingdom is in this state. Maya looked at the state of her city, gazing mournfully at all the destruction. It is better for us that we follow you. Natasha nodded and announced. Just know that your culture will not be tolerated in our domain. I don't particularly care. I already wanted to change that, I thought it a barbaric practice, but the older women who are the elders did not allow me to change tradition. Maya replied. For those people, we have the best remedy. Please, no deaths, scat hatch. Enough people have already died today. Hestia begged. Who said I would kill them? You won't. Hestia asked in shock. Of course not. What do you think of me as? A bloodthirsty, homicidal maniac. Hestia thought but didn't dare speak aloud, just standing there silently. For those people, a good beating until all the bones in their bodies are broken is the best solution. A shiver rushed down Hestia's and Maya's spines at Skathika's smile, which displayed a mouth full of sharp teeth. Fortunately, we have a goddess of healing in our domain, Natasha spoke with a smile much like Skathika's. She thought this was an excellent idea. Right. Skathatch replied, thus, we can repeat this method as long as necessary. Or at least, as long as we want. As the saying goes, what time can't mend. Natasha started to speak. A well-delivered spanking can. Natasha and Skathatch spoke in unison. Yay. The two gave each other a high five. They really were getting along now that Victor had come into their lives. Nike, Hestia and Maya looked at these countesses with a look that asked. What is the problem with these women? Aren't they very bloodthirsty? Well, as long as you don't kill them, then I guess that's fine, Hestia spoke without knowing what kind of fate those words brought to the aforementioned individuals. Hugh, please don't lose that kindness and naivety, Hestia. Nike thought as she prayed to a god. Herself, of course. She was the goddess of victory, there was no greater god than her. Yes, she was narcissistic too. Chapter 662, A Destined Showdown And this is the last. Or a Leona punched a behemoth in the head and sent it flying into the sky. She kicked the behemoth in the air and caught the monster by the legs, then, with ridiculous force, she spun in the air and threw the behemoth towards a pile of monster corpses. She disappeared again, reappearing above the behemoth, and punched the monster, opening a hole in its head. Boom! The monster fell to the ground with a crash that caused a tremor all around them. The ten-meter-tall gigantic monster was treated like a fancy toy by the werewolf girl. Ah! Leona! What are you doing? Don't destroy the monster's body. We need it to create more armor. Shut up, Eleanor! 
I'm still angry, okay. And you werewolves say our race is temperamental. Eleanor grumbled. Look at that, and say you're wrong. Leona pointed to a particular location. Eleanor looked where Leona pointed and saw Sasha and Violet cooking a hunter. Hey, hey. Don't you think it's ridiculous? My husband has been kidnapped. He's alone, hungry, and in a dark place, and I can't do anything about it. It's annoying, you know. The hunter screamed in agony as Violet literally cooked its insides. Don't scream. Talk to me. I need explanations. My emotions are shaken. And I need to talk. Here, Violet. Try this method. Sasha pulled out a dagger imbued with lightning and handed it to Violet, who took it and began slowly cutting the flesh of the still living monster. It's unfair. My husband can't take care of himself, he needs us with him to spoil him and for him to spoil us too. Ah, I miss him so much. I need to smell him on me again. This is all your fault. All your fault. You fucking monsters. Violet's tone was utterly distorted into various negative emotions, anger, hate, despair, and disappointment. See? Even you don't know how to react. Leona spoke. Isn't she getting worse every day? Eleanor asked. Yes, she is, but she's coping with many items that Victor used. She practically sleeps in his clothes now, to smell him throughout her sleep. Fuck. She needs help, Eleanor murmured. Wrong, she needs Victor. A voice was heard all around. Leona and Eleanor looked to the side and saw Ruby accompanied by her sisters. If Victor had left normally, she wouldn't be like this. She's going back to her old self, and that's bad, Ruby said. Is it safe to say that Agnes will be the same? Not just Agnes. Eve, Leona, Nero, Roberta, Kagaya, possibly Sasha, Afis, and Bruna too. Ruby spoke. Don't forget to add yourself to the list too, Ruby, Laika spoke in a neutral tone. Ruby was silent. My little sister can hide it really well, but she misses him the most, Pepper added. Right, me too. Ruby sighed. I will not deny what you said about me. Because you are correct. But girls, you are forgetting something important. Leona added. What? Who will tell Victor's parents about what happened? Leona asked. Fuck. Ruby and Sienna spoke at the same time. Can we just ignore that? Pepper spoke uncertainly. Not ideal. If Anna finds out her son has gone to literal hell, and we didn't tell her, she'll be very upset in the future and worried too. Leona spoke. Not to mention, we have to think about the possibility that Victor probably won't be back anytime soon, Eleanor said. The girls looked at Eleanor. What? It's just a possibility, you're blatantly ignoring it, and someone needs to tell you the reality of the situation. Ruby sighed, although I don't want to admit it, Eleanor is correct. The best way to deal with this is to take it one step at a time. Victor is completely fine, and his bond with Aphrodite and Roberta runs very deep, something even a hell of a lot of distance can't erase. Sienna spoke and continued. We must figure out what to do now and calm these girls down. Especially Sasha. I've never seen her act like this before. Ha, huh, you're right too, sis, Ruby spoke. Are we back to work then? Eleanor spoke. Yes back to work. Ruby nodded. A week had passed, and there was only one week left. Helena still hadn't moved, she was spending time getting to know each of her subordinates in order to put together a definitive strategy. Vine, Vipar, and Helena looked at each other in a circle away from Victor. So, do you already have a plan in mind? Vine asked. Yes, I do. But even my best one is impossible to do without casualties, Helena replied while biting her lip, she couldn't find a plan she could execute without risking casualties. Do you think the test is actually carrying out the plan without casualties? Vipar asked. 
The two demon women looked at Vipar with raised eyebrows. What do you mean? Vine asked. I mean, no matter how you look at it, it's impossible to avoid casualties in war, especially when you attack a pillar rank that has over a million demons at its command. Even if my master is a kind man, I don't think he would care so much about the death of random demons. After all, these deaths are not true death is. He caused. Vipar spoke. Vine hesitated briefly and said. Probably not, but dot. But I will do it anyway. Helena interrupted Vine. Vine and Vipar look at Helena. He is the first to recognize me as Helena, not a Gremory. He is a lord worth serving, unlike my father. I want to prove his trust in me is correct. The two already had nothing more to add if she was so determined. Demons were simple beings. The reason for this was their society, where the strong had more voice. Hell was a place where only the strong were right. If you were defeated, there were no laws that could help you. Here, the law of the jungle reigned supreme. And usually, in this kind of environment, female demons hardly had a chance to become powerhouses. Look at the history of demons, just how many women were featured. Lilith, and her general, the Reaper. Just two women. The rest were all male demons. Even the most famous demon was a male. Lucifer, the first of the fallen. For someone like Victor, who was giving the women a chance to prove themselves and giving them strength if they lived up to his expectations, he was a gentleman worthy to serve. All he was looking for was competence, in return, he would give you power. Power that would make everyone recognize her for who she was and not for the name she carried. I will do this. I will conquer the city, Helena thought with determination as she looked at Victor sitting on his ice throne. Suddenly, Victor opened his eyes, and that scared Helena a little. Was I watching too much? Helena thought. Victor remained in the same position but his broad smile was now evident to everyone. Something was happening, something they couldn't see, that fact was painfully obvious. Lord Vic. When Vine was about to ask what was wrong, she heard the sound of a horse neighing, and she quickly turned towards where Victor was looking, and soon she saw four horsemen. A being with utterly black armor mounted on a black horse with green flames coming out of its eyes, hooves, and tail. On his back were two scythes connected into a giant scythe, the horseman of the apocalypse, Death. Beside Death was his brother, riding a red horse that, like his brothers, was also wreathed in flames, the flames of hell. He was wearing deep black armor with shades of red, and behind him was a massive great sword, the horseman of the apocalypse, War. Next to War was a knight wearing only a cloak, very different from his previous brothers, who were in full armor. In addition, the knight had a slashing spear that looked very plain, like an ordinary spear found anywhere. He was riding a horse that looked like it hadn't been fed in years. But even though it seemed so frail, the horse still had a fierce glow on its face, a glow that was swallowed up by the blue flames produced by its eyes. He was the horseman of the apocalypse, famine. Beside him was a corrupted knight, as if he had come out of the depths of a foreboding part of hell. The representation of disease was there with his pale horse full of worms, covered in white flames. The horsemen of the apocalypse, pestilence. The four horsemen of the apocalypse were here. Diablo's executioners, beings, who would, according to the Bible, usher in the apocalypse. The elite demons that everyone, even pillar rank demons, feared. Everyone's tension was visible. Even if there were only four foes before them, the demons were even tenser than when they fought Victor. Surprisingly, Helena was the first to leave their collective stupor as she assumed a severe expression, All of you, get out of the way now. Use your wings and fly as far away from the horsemen as possible. Helena's scream was heard across the entire battlefield, which woke all the demons from their stupor. Including Vine and Vipar. Soon the two pillar rank demons started giving orders to drive away the demons. Making a mental note to reward Helena for her quick thinking and understanding of the situation, 
Victor continued to look at the riders on their respective horses heading toward him. Soon, all the demons had gotten as far away from Victor as possible, and the four horsemen as they looked on from afar with curious, apprehensive faces. In this case, those with apprehensive faces were more from Vipar, Vine, and Helena. What should we do? What should we do? Helena muttered several times while biting her nail with her teeth. She was using her brain to the fullest but couldn't find solutions for this situation other than using force. We can't do anything. This is not something we can interfere with. Vine spoke. There was a reason these four horsemen were Diablo's executioners. They were, without a doubt, the strongest. And my lord will not back down from a challenge. He will never do that, that is his pride. Vipar added. We can't even run away either, and if we do run away, where will we go? We don't have a base of operations. Helena spoke. Everything depends on our lord now, Vine said while nodding. The three women looked worriedly at the scene before them. The four horsemen stopped their approach in front of Victor and lifted their heads. Victor was sitting on a hill on the same ice throne with an amused expression, the smile of interest on his face was unmistakable. Arrogant. Death snarled in thought but didn't speak aloud. Looks like we've met again, Alucard, War spoke in a deep, heavy voice, his eyes behind the helmet glowing with hellfire itself. Oh. Victor's smile widened. You weren't as blind as I expected, hey. I'm war, that's natural. I could feel your desire to fight even though I wasn't looking at you. I didn't expect the opportunity to appear so suddenly. I'm really quite fortunate. You feel lucky. The horseman, hidden by the cloak, spoke with disbelief visible in his tone of voice, this is not the reaction I expected. Hat? What reaction did you expect? Horsemen of the Apocalypse, Famine. I expected to see you shaking with fear and hiding. Silence fell around until a chuckle began to be heard. Ha 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 ha. Victor put his hand on his face and started laughing even harder, ha 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 ha. Until his laughter disappeared utterly, and a neutral face was seen. Me? Hide and tremble with fear. His voice started to get even heavier, from who? You. That's the funniest joke I've ever heard in my entire life. Tell me. An invisible pressure began to cover everyone, Victor's long hair began to defy gravity, and the moment Victor placed his hand back on his chin, he asked the question. Why should I hide? Fush. <laughs> A pillar of red power soared into the heavens, and as if the world itself had fallen on top of everyone, gravity seemed to multiply several times over. Everyone opened their eyes in disbelief. Why should I tremble with fear? With just Victor's presence, the entire atmosphere became hundreds of times more suffocating, and with every question he asked, it felt like hell itself was bending to his will. I am possible. Death spoke in disbelief. Long ago, the four riders had fallen from their respective horses and were trying not to kneel on the ground. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Victor stood from his throne, grabbed Junketsu and spread both arms in an open pose, and the pressure he was exuding seemed to multiply even more. Not even Victor's appearance was visible now, only his silhouette and blood-red eyes were visible. S so much power. Famine thought while having trouble breathing. He's gotten insanely stronger since the last time. In fact, was he this strong before? War thought as, with sheer willpower he stood up while looking at the being before him. Wrong, the monster. And that look in his eyes sparked a memory of before he came to hell. War now understood Bale's warning. Before coming to this mission, Bale warned everyone not to underestimate Victor, or they would lose. Something that even War himself, who was very cautious, snorted in disdain at. They were the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know? Only the first rank demon pillar and wrath of the deadly sins could deal with them together, of course, not counting their king. I incredible. That's my lord's power. Vine commented in disbelief, with fanaticism shining on her face. 
Helena didn't even say anything as she just stared at this vision as if she were burning the image into her brain. The image of Victor standing on top of a hill with literal power pouring out of his body as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the most feared demons in hell, were helpless in his mere presence. I was correct. V. Parr thought, my instincts weren't wrong, he's exceptional. Wrong, he's beyond exceptional. Exceptional was an insult to him. War gritted his teeth, grabbed the great sword behind him, and hellfire covered the great sword's blade. With a battle roar, he forced his power out of his body and fought that heavy feeling. Driven by their older brother's actions. Death, pestilence, and famine did the same. Death took out his two scythes. Pestilence picked up a whip that seemed to cut through flesh easily. Famine grabbed the glaive behind him. Victor's smile grew again, and the pillar of pure power stopped coming out of his body. He pointed his right hand forward toward the four horsemen and with a calling gesture, he said. Come on, horsemen. Let's dance. Chapter 663, A Destined Confrontation 2. War, with a thunderous cry, leaped from the ground toward Victor with startling speed. The sound of metal colliding burst out, followed by an explosion of power. Soon after, everyone saw that Victor had met war halfway the blade of Victor's Otaki and War's great sword being crossed midair. With just that collision, the two warriors could vaguely gauge the strength of their opponent. And the result of that assessment put a smile on their faces. He is strong. Significant strength was something everyone knew the two of them had, but the ability to wield that strength perfectly? It was something that both of them didn't know if their opponent had. But with that simple exchange, all doubts had been erased. Victor smiled widely but suddenly turned his face to the side while leaning back. Soon a scythe covered in dark miasma passed through the previous location his neck had been, barely missing its target. Demonstrating exceptional flexibility, Victor kicked Death, who attacked him stealthily, thus throwing the horseman away, and with that maneuver, he achieved more leverage to push war away. Victor landed back on the ground on his feet, Ray sheathed his otaki and took on the stance of Iijitsu. Four against one? Not bad, but... Rumble, rumble, rumble. Lightning began to cover Victor's body. It's not enough. Victor disappeared from where he was and, a second later, returned to where he was while once again having his blade back in its sheath. In the next second, as if the world was taking its time to understand what had happened, the consequences of Victor's attack became apparent. All four horsemen had several deep cuts on their bodies, Pestilence had even lost an arm. I must say, you have excellent armor. He looked at War and Death, who he had attacked substantially, but it was evident that their armor had stopped most of the damage. Armor made by the best blacksmiths in hell aren't so easily breached, Alucard. War raised his great sword and jumped forward generating a sonic boom in his wake, and, in the blink of an eye, was in front of Victor. I wonder about that, Victor spoke while using his blade to stop War's attack, and a second later, Junketsu began to be covered by a red liquid, more specifically, blood. Blows were exchanged between the two warriors, the noise of two blades echoing like thunder as if the heavens were crying as they began ascending, taking their fight back into the air. Pestilence stop playing around, and get serious. Death roared. He joined his two scythes together, forming a giant scythe, and flew toward Victor. Victor smiled widely as a second combatant entered the fray. Thus he began to use more strength. The moment War went to attack him again with his great sword covered in the flames of hell, Victor, using his superior senses, changed the direction of his blade and attacked upwards effectively parrying War's attack, creating an opening in the horseman's defense. Victor pointed his palm, which had been hidden behind his back, forward, launching a sphere of compressed blood toward War's chest. The attack managed to penetrate War's armor and send him flying but failed to reach the horseman's flesh. Adjusting his center of gravity, War stabilized himself before touching the hole in his armor. As I said, Alucard. This is not armor that can be broken so easily. 
War's body burst into flames, and the damage in his armor began to be repaired. Victor narrowed his eyes at this. With his superior sight, he realized that the miasma of hell was being used as energy for the armor to rebuild itself. Victor turned and faced death, who was already swinging his scythe in Victor's direction. At that moment, time around Victor started to slow. Then, with his left hand covered with the power of blood, he dodged Death's attack and performed a flawless punch, connecting it with Death's face, sending him careening toward the ground. A cobweb-shaped crater formed beneath Death's body from the impact. Victor touched his cheek and felt a small cut. He looked at Death, and he swore he saw a smug smile on the demon's face that was hidden by his hood. Even if the hood merely displayed absolute darkness, he was sure he saw it. I see. The miasma covering his scythe can be extended and shortened. He has incredible control over that energy. Victor understood clearly what had happened. Don't get smug. Victor disappeared into thin air and appeared behind Death, who had risen to his feet, already cutting horizontally. Death quickly retreated away from the Odaki's trajectory but opened his eyes wide when he saw the blade extend. I can do that too. A gigantic gash was made on Death's body. And at that very moment when the attack occurred, Famine came at a thunderous speed, attacking with his glaive. Clang! The sound of metal colliding rang out again, followed by a teeth-chattering screeching, and soon another confrontation began. A spear user, Het. Although Famine's spear style differed from his master's, the basic movements were practically similar, he knew that. After all, he'd trained with a master in spearmanship. Hey, Alucard. You feeling hungry? Victor raised an eyebrow at this unexpected question, but it wasn't until the next attack connected with his blade that he felt it. An overwhelming bloodlust, an insatiable hunger. It was as if he'd gone several thousand years without feeding. And that sudden feeling fueled by the horsemen in front of him led to a lapse in concentration that allowed famine to attack further. Hunger is one of the most horrible ways to die. So tell me, you ever get hungry, Alucard? Famine spun his glaive, and a type of power with a dark blue hue started to cover it. Victor narrowed his eyes and gritted his teeth. This feeling was very irritating. Despite having trained in enduring hunger with Scat Hatch, this feeling far surpassed the training he went through. He was like a man who had never eaten before in his life and was on the verge of starvation. But even though he was feeling it, he knew something. Despite feeling as though his strength was leaving him, his body was still strong. Roxanne's presence, fueling his existence, could still be felt. He wasn't actually hungry. This was some kind of psychological attack. An attack that took advantage of the most basic nature of any being. Hunger. Victor turned his face quickly when he sensed a presence and raised his Odaki in defense, receiving War's great sword crashing into him again. In the exact second that War collided with him, Famine attacked as well, followed by death. The brothers worked very well together, and Victor was under pressure. But even if he was in that situation, the excited feeling never left his heart. He was having fun. Ha 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 ha. Crazy. Laughing in the middle of this situation. Famine thought. The only one who could understand Victor was war. They were the same species, after all. Tisk, I wasn't messing around. Pestilence took hold of his severed arm and put it back in place. It took a few seconds to recover, longer than it should have, but soon his regeneration took effect. That weapon has anti-soul properties. When Pestilence realized this fact, he grew entirely serious. He took hold of his whip and started to spin. The wind produced by the whip began to acquire a dark orange hue, followed by him soon proclaiming. Disease field. With these words, the ground started to change. The area started to change, worms began to come out of the soil, and the air became more toxic. An area that could only be described as an area of disease spread across the entire battlefield. No being, whether mortal or god, can escape disease. 
Pestilence performed a swift maneuver with his whip and slashed through the air. And at that very moment, a whip mark appeared on Victor's armor. Victor raised his eyebrow and realized he had to back off a little, at least away from this technique. Fighting in the middle of the enemy's technique that he didn't know the function of could only be described as foolish. Rumble, rumble. The moment he tried to use the power of lightning to get out of range of the technique, his lightning abruptly disappeared. Victor opened his eyes wide. My power has not been sealed, I can still feel it, but I can't use it. Few beings can escape us brothers. Famine attacked Victor, but the man just turned his body and dodged the attack. And you certainly won't have that honor, Alucard. Famine spun his glaive and slammed it into the ground. Tell me, can you not feel hunger? The horseman's words seemed to reverberate throughout Victor's existence. Ugh. Victor unconsciously put his hand on his belly. He felt as if a bottomless pit were inside his stomach now. The feeling was overwhelming. Pestilence took advantage of this moment and launched his whip, wrapping it around Victor's legs. Then, with a mighty yank, he caused Victor to fall to his knees. War appeared beside Alucard and swung his great sword toward Victor. The same happened with Death, who appeared on the other side and attacked with his giant scythe. I got him. The two brothers thought at the same time. The brothers expected to hear the delicious sound of meat being eviscerated, but instead, they heard the rumbling noise of their weapons striking something extremely solid. They were then treated to the sight of Victor holding onto the blade of war's great sword with a hand covered in pure ice while doing the same with death's scythe. What? Death and war were in disbelief. He just caught their blades? Just like that? And they were even more shocked when famine attacked Victor's face, and the man just opened his mouth, catching the glaive's blade between his teeth. Disbelief was seen on the faces of the four horsemen including the demons who were watching in the distance. The most fearsome weapons in hell can be restrained so easily. Vine asked in disbelief. Of course not. Not even the demon king would dare to touch the horseman's weapons without their permission. Each weapon embodies a small part of the soul of the horseman who wields it. The weapons are semi-sentient. Vipar responded and continued. And because they have a part of their respective horseman's soul, they also embody their most prominent power in the blade. The hellfire of war, the dark miasma of death, the hunger of famine, and the disease of pestilence. It is extremely hazardous to touch them without the horseman's permission. Victor lifted his face, and the four brothers gulped when they saw that his face had disappeared entirely, leaving only a bottomless darkness, displaying a smile full of sharp teeth and blood-red eyes. I've learned. Hey. The fighting techniques of you four brothers. I've learned them. Hey. Gripping the horseman's weapons tightly, Victor pulled death and war close to him and slammed their heads together. Following that, he punched war in the stomach, the horseman spitting blood from the impact, proving that attacks with gauntlets worked better than his blade. The force of Victor's punch sent war soaring backward. In one fluid movement, Victor switched targets kicking death in the face and sending the horseman flying, much like his brother. All the while, he was still tightly gripping Famine's glaive between his teeth. Gripping onto Pestilence's whip, he mimicked Pestilence's previous move, tugging it with great strength and sending the demon flying toward him. The ice gauntlets that Victor created started to catch fire, and he punched Pestilence in the face, causing the demon to suffer the same fate as his brother's. He then looked at Famine and smiled. The horseman winced a little, but before he could do anything, Victor grabbed Junketsu and pierced Famine's heart. As the only one not wearing armor, Victor's blade penetrated Famine easily. Victor spat the glaive's blade out of his mouth and said. So what if you prevented me from using my speed? The power of lightning is just one aspect of my strength, I don't completely rely on it. One lesson Scathatch made sure to drill into his head was to diversify your areas of expertise because if one day the enemy succeeds in sealing off an aspect of your strength, there would still be other aspects to explore and fight with. Victor was extremely proficient in the power of lightning, it was the power he used the most. 
but that didn't mean it was his main source of power. He was still a progenitor. His blood was his primary power. He was still a martial artist specializing in the otaki and unarmed combat, not counting the other martial arts in the use of several other weapons which Skathatch had taught. He still had other bloodlines within him that he could use, he still had the blessings of the goddesses within him. He still had Roxanne, his greatest asset. And so what if his lightning could not be used? He was fast enough without it. To fight me, sealing my power is not the answer. Victor grabbed Famine by the head and lifted him into the air. After all, you would then have to seal thousands of other powers within me as well. Famine opened his eyes wide. Victor grinned widely, and his entire body started turning completely dark with crimson tones, I'm hungry, and it's your fault. So no hard feelings, right? Half of Victor's body then suddenly transformed into the head of a demonic beast, devouring Famine's existence whole. Brother! The three remaining horsemen screamed. Victor belched, utterly satisfied. Finally, the sensation of hunger had disappeared, for a horseman of hunger, he tasted really good. He looked at the remaining horsemen of the apocalypse, who were looking at him with a gleam of hatred in their eyes. What? You came to kill me but weren't ready to be killed yourselves. Victor raised his hand, and Junketsu answered his call. He then pointed the tip of Junketsu at the glaive of famine on the ground. Following her master's example, branches erupted from Junketsu, turning into a mouth filled with sharp teeth, before beginning to consume the glaive. In less than two seconds, the entire glaive was gone, followed by Junketsu morphing from an otaki into a glaive itself. Good girl. Victor's smile widened as he sensed that Junketsu had become more excited. Victor spun Junketsu and held the otaki turned glaive behind him. He positioned himself in a stance much like Skathakas and pointed his arm, palm side up, at the now three horsemen of the apocalypse. Shall we continue our dance? Bastard! The three erupted in anger at Victor's casual attitude and launched themselves toward him with hatred in their eyes. They wanted revenge. Chapter 664, A Destined Confrontation 3. Am I dreaming? Helena asked in disbelief. Maybe, she woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. Perhaps, the fact that her father died, and she doesn't know how, is why she thinks some progenitor a ridiculously handsome one who looks like a male version of Aphrodite entered her life and recognized her as Helena, not a Gremory. But it is actually a lie. Helena was really doubting reality now. She knew that man was strong. After all, he killed and conquered several pillar demon territories, and something like that cannot be done by someone weak. But... She didn't know he was that strong. No, you aren't. Vine replied with uncertainty in her voice. In her defense, she was also feeling disbelief. He's treating the horsemen of the apocalypse as if they were children. One horseman has even already died permanently. V. Par spoke in disbelief as she watched Victor wielding a glaive and attacking the three knights. Is he proficient with a glaive as well? Wrong, the correct question would be, how many martial arts is he proficient at? V. Par thought. Since the Knight of Famine died, his weapon had been absorbed by Victor's weapon. The remaining three knights attacked Victor with a maddened fervor. They matched perfectly, demonstrating teamwork that could be lethal to any being. Yes, the correct word here is, could. The reason for this is that since the knights started attacking him, no attack has come close to scratching Victor's armor again. The knights attacked with the fury and hatred of someone who had lost a loved one, no force was being constrained, and even so, no attack reached Victor. Demonstrating unrealistic proficiency in martial arts, he dodged everything, defended everything, and at the same time, counterattacked whenever the opportunity presented itself. Tink! Death's scythe and Victor's glaive clashed, and soon Death was knocked back by Victor's superior strength. Death stabilized his center of gravity and shouted. This is impossible. This way of using the glaive is clearly our brother's. What have you done, Alucard? 
Victor spun the glaive around and held it behind him with the blade down, horseman. What am I? Rather than wait for death to respond, Victor continued. I am a fucking progenitor. The being who decides the worth of souls is in front of you. Death, war, and pestilence opened their eyes wide. Don't tell me. Have you completely absorbed the existence of famine? His existence wasn't that worthy Victor didn't want to do the same thing he did with Adonis, I just put an average value on his soul, and that was enough to learn all of his martial art and this. Victor's smile grew, tell me, horseman, have you ever been hungry? The three knights opened their eyes wide and tried to counter famine's authority with their own, but it was too late. Death was the first to go down with his hand on his stomach, followed by war and pestilence. Victor couldn't let such an opportunity pass, and with a thrust of his arms, he threw Junketsu at. Death. Death. The knight raised his head, but it was too late. His heart was already pierced by the glaive, and in the next second, he was already in Victor's hands. In a high-level fight like this, any second can change the situation. And Victor knew it. Even though he was having fun with the fight, his priority was still finishing the fight, so he would take out the most annoying knight as quickly as possible. Tell me, death. Can you be afraid of your own death? Victor grinned widely as his entire face distorted into a sadistic grin. Death's body shook visibly, and slowly, he began to feel the end of his own existence at this man's hands. Bastard. War gave a war cry, his existence was covered by the power of hellfire and he jumped toward Victor. Pestilence followed close behind war, but once they got close enough, a gigantic ice structure was created in front of them. What? This won't stop me. War swung his greatsword, and with a crash that reverberated across the entire battlefield, he managed to break the ice structure and pass through it, but it was too late. All they saw upon arriving at the scene was Victor standing there with a big smile on his face looking at an empty space, death was nowhere to be seen, and Victor's glaive was feeding on death's scythes on the ground. You took too long. Victor turned to war and pestilence. His healthy skin became much paler, as if he was dead, and his long black hair was releasing some kind of dark miasma. Just like before. Junketsu changed to two small scythes that could connect into a larger scythe. Victor raised the two scythes with an obvious familiarity and started to spin around. In the middle of this show, the two scythes were connected with each other forming a large black scythe with red details and the power of miasma covering the blade. Death too. Pestilence shivered. Victor spoke sympathetically, don't cry. Soon you will join him. His tone was like he had nothing to do with what was going on. Alucard. Son of a bitch. I will make you pay for this. Pestilence roared. Meanwhile, Victor ignored the two knights and looked to the side in confusion, hmm. Oh? Did I win you too? Let's see. Death didn't give you a name, did he? Since I now have the authority of death, it is only natural to call you by the same name that beings feel when they are about to die. Despair. A horse's neigh was heard, and a shadow grew on the ground. Soon the same horse that death was riding emerged from the ground with an entirely new appearance. The horse was bigger, more muscular, and healthier. The horse's color was still black as darkness itself, and its eyes, tail, and hoof were still ablaze, flames with a green tint. Even the horse. Vine tried not to feel disbelieving, but it was impossible. Was this the same horse she had seen before? Didn't he grow up and become exceptionally muscular? He looks like a horse made for war now. My lord won. Vipar spoke in acceptance and a growing fanaticism. He won against the four horsemen of the apocalypse, single-handedly. Isn't it too early to count victory? Helena spoke. Vine and Vipar looked at Helena with dry looks. Don't get me wrong, I'm not rooting for the knights. It's just that the fight isn't over, and letting your guard down and counting on victory is a flaw that all powerful demons have. The two former pillar rank demons could only remain silent at Helena's words because they knew the woman was correct. 
despair, you can play around. I will call when needed. Victor spoke casually. The horse neighed again and started walking towards Vine, Helena, and Vipar. Victor picked up the scythe, and with a quick swing, he struck War's blade. Rushed, aren't you? Silence, I will kill you. Victor casually dodged the attack as he pulled the handle of the scythe, and soon the great scythe split in two, and with the proficiency of someone who had always used a scythe to fight, he began to dance with war. Sounds of clashing blades were heard, and the fight grew even more intense as the ground was being destroyed with each clash of blades, and war seemed to be getting stronger with each passing second. His armor began to change, and it became more demonic. The true form, Hui. As someone who had the memories of the demonic powers of two horsemen of the apocalypse, Victor knew what that was. Every demon has its true form, Diablo is a perfect example. The demon king walked around in his true form for all to see. As the highest level demons, the horsemen of the apocalypse also had their true form. But they didn't use them, the reason for that isn't because the true form was stronger or anything like that. It was because the human and more compact form allowed the most extensive use of their powers. It could be said that the compact form of the knights was their strongest. But to every rule, there is an exception, and war was that exception. His humanoid form was just to contain his fury. Victor took a step back, pulled away, and looked straight ahead. With steam coming out of the mouth, long flaming horns, tails, and sharp claws that were holding the great sword, which also changed to become even more demonic. War glared at Victor. The pressure in the area was incredible, and everyone except Victor felt suffocated, the heat didn't lose to the pressure either. Everyone felt like they were in the flaming hell, the place where war was born. The strongest horseman of the apocalypse, war. The demon born in the flaming hell that tortures the souls of sinners. Victor snapped his neck and joined the two scythes into a larger scythe. He placed the scythe on his shoulder and smiled. A worthy challenger, is he? Fush. A pillar of blue energy soared into the heavens. The surrounding atmosphere began to grow colder, as if freezing hell had descended on the battlefield, and Victor appeared with a changed appearance. The vampire count form of Clan Scarlet. The scythe that was in Victor's hand changed back to the glaive, and the blade was covered by ice and blood. On stages where the strong fight, the weak have no right to interfere. Victor's cold, emotionless voice was heard all around, then he vanished and appeared in front of Pestilence. What before Pestilence could say anything, he felt something piercing his heart. Absolute zero. In the next instant, he turned into an ice sculpture and soon this ice sculpture started to be covered by blood. Victor opened his mouth, and all that blood rushed into him. Just like before, Junketsu followed in Victor's footsteps and ate Pestilence's whip. Pestilence's authority. I see. That's why they were so confident, but they underestimated me. My speed is not my main power. Pestilence's power was simple, through disease he could harm someone by using something he knew. This effect was also poisonous, slowly killing the victim's body. The second effect was being negated by the pure energy of Roxanne in Victor's body, because of that, he didn't feel anything. It was pretty obvious that pestilence and famines were support for death and war who were direct combatants. Together the brothers were unstoppable because of the aforementioned abilities that directly attacked the most basic form of a being. Hunger that drained them of all strength and incapacitation due to illness. He was the most dangerous one, hey. In a fight of attrition, pestilence would definitely win if it was with someone normal because the more time passes, the more the disease accumulates and multiplies causing various kinds of disabilities in the enemy's body. If Victor hadn't had Roxanne to keep his body in the best possible shape, things would have gotten dangerous. This whole thought process happened in less than a few seconds, and Victor turned his gaze to War, who looked even angrier if the flames indicated anything. Screaming in a very demonic way, War, driven by his new state, practically warped from where he was and appeared in front of Victor. Victor kicked War away, and in the next moment, 
the glaive changed into Junketsu's original form, which was a katana with a blade too large to be called a katana. War didn't lose momentum with this, as he quickly adjusted his center of gravity and jumped towards Victor brandishing the great sword. Blades clash. Fire and ice collide. The surrounding terrain began to be completely destroyed. But the two warriors weren't worried. Eventually, without realizing it, the fight was taken to the skies. Power rumbles were heard throughout the demon's territory, alerting the area demon, who was already watching everything from a distance. It was hard to ignore the bursts of power from higher demons. Victor sent war flying to the ground, and the knight got up even angrier. Ah! With an even louder scream of rage and hatred, the fires of hell grew exponentially. Anger and hatred were fueling the crazed knight. Hellfire came out of war's mouth and, like a dragon's breath, flew toward Victor. Seeing this, Victor's smile only grew. His ice wings grew exponentially, and in front of his wings, thousands of weapons of different types began to be created. Victor pointed his finger at the fire and said, Go! Sonic boom sounds were heard each time a weapon was sent toward the fire, proving that each throw easily broke the sound barrier. Faced with a swarm of thousands of ice weapons, the breath lost power, and the ice weapons pierced War's body. War roared more angrily, and the ice began to melt. Pure magma began to be created with just War's heat. Victor kicked off the air toward War. War did the same and kicked off the ground toward Victor. When the two warriors' blades collide in mid-air, a massive boom was created, and it evaporated the entire battleground. The entire topography of the terrain was being changed with each confrontation. Is this... Is this how the strongest beings fight? Helena opened her eyes in disbelief at such a disaster. She had already heard stories. Stories that when higher level beings fight, the surrounding topography changes with each encounter, but... Reading this in a book, or hearing it from other people, is different than seeing it in person. Not to mention that it's one thing for you to use your power to change the topography like Vine, Vipar, or herself can do. It was another thing to change the entire topography with just the clash of two blades. The level was completely different. Alyakurud. With an even more furious roar, a pillar of flame shot out from the strongest apocalypse knight, wings began to sprout behind him, and he became even more demonic. Ha 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 ha, that's what I'm talking about. Tink. Tink. Sounds of clashing blades, sounds of destruction, followed by the strongest knight's grunt and Victor's excited comments. We will fight, we will bleed, we will be cut. Let's dance more. Victor's ice wings began to dissolve and turn into wings of pure water. Victor used his wings as a shield. Fire met water, and the fire was negated for a few seconds. Enough seconds for Victor to seize the moment and slash war toward the ground. Boom! War fell into the magma and quickly got back up with even more fury. Victor pointed his hand at war and said the name of a technique, a technique that Satri never had the opportunity to use on Victor. Cositis. Chapter 665, A Worthy Opponent. In Victor's Inner World. Uh. I'll be sure to complain to Victor later. How can he place a value on these filthy souls just to gain the memories of their techniques and authority? Doesn't he know how much it's taxing his soul? Roxanne grumbled. Our soul is not being burdened, Roxanne. Shut up, Alter Dot. Roxanne stopped talking when she looked at Alter and saw that half of his body had become complete darkness. That's... She opened her eyes wide. Correct, it is the result of him acting as a progenitor. Though his words sounded like a mockery, the smug smile on Alter's face indicated otherwise. Consuming higher-order demons brought about that much change. Roxanne asked in disbelief. From the beginning, we were not normal, Roxanne. Despite both being progenitors, we are not the same as Vlad. A progenitor walks his own path, he does not follow a path that has been trodden before. And thanks to you, we can be the strongest progenitor ever. 
The proof is that he achieved a feat that even Vlad couldn't because of fear, exploring his inherent power over souls. After all, messing with souls is something dangerous. Victor was able to absorb the authority and complete battle experience from the horsemen and, of course, the memories related to that experience as well, all without attributing the existence of those beings with the highest value as happened with Adonis. Roxanne didn't know what to say as her mouth opened and closed like a goldfish at the end. Finally, she just decided to stay silent as theories formed in her head. This situation is different from Adonis, isn't it? She said. Indeed. Alter didn't deny it, he also won't risk having a second personality or anything like that. The horseman's powers are a minor authority. We might even call it the divinity remnants of a demigod. Alter revealed as he raised his hand and saw that the sparks of Victor's divinity grew to the size of a football. And even though the flame-like golden bridle had grown, it hadn't gained a form yet, proving that this authority he was given was just an aspect of the authority of the horsemen who would become a lesser deity but couldn't do to their death. These remnants of lesser divinities only boosted the existing divinity in Victor's body. After all, try as they might, demons weren't complete beings. They only had a part of a soul, the bad part, and only when the demon built the other half of themselves could they ascend and gain a divinity related to the negative side of the world. Balance was essential, this was an absolute truth. But even so, it's reckless to do this in a short time. If it weren't for me, his soul would be badly damaged right now. Consuming too much in a short time isn't ideal, and if they weren't something akin to demigods, he would be greatly impaired now. Roxanne grumbled, and she couldn't help but emphasize that point. I know, and that is why I said his soul is not burdened. After all, you are protecting our soul. Alter laughed. And if you didn't say anything while he absorbed the horseman, it was because you were sure he would be fine. Tisk. Roxanne clicked her tongue in annoyance. Sometimes I hate how well you know me. That's natural, I'm him. Well, his power. Yeah, yeah, I know. She snorted. Oh, but don't forget to scold him. What he did was very dangerous. If those demons weren't akin to demigods, and if demons weren't part of the negative aspect of the world, we'd be pretty fucked up. Make sure he doesn't do the same to true deities or even demigods with parents with positive aspects of the world. Oh, also, don't forget to tell him not to do that too much. Even for an abnormal progenitor like us, absorbing memories of hundreds and thousands of years of just fighting might cause some kind of change or trouble in our soul. Eating a lot is not healthy, you know. He laughed. Ugh. That power of progenitors is too dangerous. Roxanne grumbled. That's why Vlad didn't exploit that power. Unlike us, who have you protecting us from our own reckless acts, Vlad doesn't have that. So any mistake he made could have killed him. Ha, -ha don't remind me of that. I'll get even more irritated. Roxanne sighed. But despite being dangerous, this power is also the most useful. The ability to absorb an entity, and use that entity's memories for yourself, is something everyone would envy. If they didn't know about the side effects, of course. He laughed. Possible creation of a second personality, damage to the soul, or in the worst cases, the death of a soul, psychological problems due to a large number of memories that are not yours, and these are just some of the risks we have to take when using that power with other souls. After all, messing with the soul is messing with creation. Through the soul, the spark of life exists. Destroying or manipulating such a thing without knowledge. It's reckless, to say the least. Reckless? That's the understatement of the century. Roxanne rolled her eyes. Cositis. Victor's roar was heard followed by a greater concentration of Roxanne's power being absorbed. Looks like the fight is getting more interesting. Alter spoke while looking at the sky. Will you watch? Of course, I need to help you if necessary. Alter just nodded and continued watching the fight. Water. 
That was the sight that Vine, Vipar, Helena, and hundreds of thousands of demons saw. The moment Victor declared the technique's name, it was as if all of hell had changed according to his will. Furious jets of water erupted from the ground, the sky began to rain, and in less than a few seconds, enough water to flood an entire city was created. Due to Vine's specific order, they couldn't ignore their companions even if they didn't care about them. After all, they are demons. And to think that he can even use Satri's technique. Vipar commented in shock. As someone who also used the element of water, she knew how powerful Satri's technique was, and she had seen the effects for herself once in the past. This technique flooded and destroyed an entire capital, and several demons served as food for the pillar demon that day. The existences that made up the top ten pillar rankings were beings capable of mass destruction, much like her lord. Flying while using her succubus wings, Helena spoke. Where is he? The horseman of war. She pulled her wet hair back and looked around. Idiot, use your senses. They aren't even trying to hide. Vine spoke. Hearing Vine's words, Helena quickly used her senses and felt war and Victor fighting. Underwater. Hey? When did they get there? Does not matter, Vine responded and added. What matters now is that this fight is getting more and more dangerous for us. We need to get out of here. And where will we go? Helena asked. Anywhere but here, Vine replied. Lord's victory is only a matter of time. We must reorganize and prepare for any possible ambush. Vipar agreed with Vine. It was obvious that war hadn't reached his limit yet, but... I can't see him losing. Defying all odds, Victor single-handedly fought the four horsemen of the apocalypse and managed to defeat three, then absorbed their essence as a true demon would. The faith Vipar had in Victor bordered on fanaticism, which was expected after seeing this vision. Quake, quake! Suddenly, the earth began to shake as if an earthquake had occurred and soon a gigantic jet of water rose to the heavens, and war and Victor were seen again. The whole topography of the place was changing, and the once destructive fight became catastrophic. Victor was literally creating enough water that already exceeded the limits of a lake. He was spawning a damn sea. Sounds of clashing blades were heard again, and war and Victor backed away and fell to the ground. Victor was standing in the water, as well as war who had visible steam coming out of his body due to the evaporation. Even now, the flames of hell were never extinguished, war's rage was unfathomable. Ha! -ha. Victor let out a long, satisfied sigh as he looked at the rainy sky. He opened his hands to the sky and felt the water drops falling on his body, it was invigorating. It's been a while. It's been a while since I've had such a satisfying fight just two enemies fighting each other in search of surpassing their limits. Victor stopped looking at the sky and looked at war. Don't you think so, war? The warrior's response was just a grunt followed by silence. It was obvious that despite his contradictory appearance that everyone would think he had lost control, war was far from it, he was very sane. Anger and hatred were just part of who he was. Born from one of the hottest areas of hell, Anger and hatred had always been beside him, along with the flames. That was the essence of the horsemen of the apocalypse, war. Despite being saddened and angry that his brothers were dead, Victor's prolonged struggle against war made him understand and accept. He came to understand that it was natural for them to be killed. Victor was stronger, much stronger than they expected, Baal was correct. Instead of acting with arrogance, we were supposed to have attacked with everything from the beginning. That was their mistake, a mistake that got his three brothers killed. And he came to accept it all because. That's what hell was like. The strong always spoke louder and were always right. No matter what kind of injustice the strong were doing, in the end. They were right. The reason for this? It's because they were strong and had the power. Hell was not kind to the weak. Hell was not merciful to the weak. Only those who were strong had the luxury of enjoying such circumstances. War knew it, he always knew it. After all, 
he grew up in hell. But he had forgotten. The path of victory, the title of Horseman of the Apocalypse he came to be called as he walked his way, left him blind. War closed his eyes and listened to the sound of rain, an artificial rain created by his opponent's insane powers. It was ridiculous to think that the Midlands of Hell would have a new sea all because of a single powerful person. But... But that happened in the past, didn't it? War remembered the small lake that Satri created. A small lake that was once the city of a highest level demon. The situation was the same but different. After all, this man was much more powerful than Satri. Tell me, Alucard. Slowly, War opened his eyes and looked back at Victor, who had returned to his base form some time before he realized it. His long black hair fluttered in the wind, and everyone saw his blood red eyes. A long time ago, the armor he had on his body was destroyed, leaving only the bottom part of the armor. His muscular body was visible, and several ripped pieces of cloth were under the armor. What are you looking for on this path you walk? So many demons you've subdued. So many trails of destruction. I smell war in you. Where are you taking this war you started? What is the point of all this? What a silly question. Isn't that obvious, horseman? Victor pointed Junkitsu's blade at war. The path I follow is one of conquest. I will descend to the deepest floors of this place called Hell and make my throne there. I will sit on this throne, and all demons, whether of the present or the future, shall kneel before me. And those who deny me will only be erased from my path. The way of the tyrant, hey. It's quite appropriate for someone who wants to rule over demons. Demons were beings of sin. They were creatures born from the evil of a soul. They, by nature, were greedy, lustful, petty, and only thought of themselves. But, if there was one thing all demons respected, it was strength. That was how Lucifer became king, that's how Diablo became king. Because they were strong, they were respected. Of course, there was a stark difference. Whereas Lucifer was strong and respected, and everyone was afraid of him. The respect the demons had for this man was greater than their fear. On the other hand, Diablo didn't have that. All demons feared the incarnation of evil. For being the most evil of all, for being the most dangerous of all, for being the winner, he was declared king. It seems. This man will be someone respected like Lucifer and, at the same time, feared like Diablo. But unlike the incarnation of evil, he will have Lucifer-like charisma to back him up and transform that fear into admiration. Will you fight all the demons in hell for this, a number that easily surpasses billions? If they are in my way. So be it. Victor put his foot forward, lowered his center of gravity, and held Junkitsu's hilt with both hands, assuming a perfect martial arts stance. In that case, War held his great sword behind him, lowered his center of gravity a bit, and assumed an open-chested position. Despite looking at a disadvantage, this position was ideal for him to attack from any possible angle. Prove that your existence is worth following. The rain slowed to a stop, and all that was left was just a vast and deep lake. The two warriors looked at each other, this time, hatred and fury were not seen in War's eyes. Instead, taking a hit from a technique like Cositis seemed to lower his anger, and now only calm remained. And with a calm mind, a warrior's skills that he had mastered with thousands of battles could be brought out to the fullest. In the distance, several demons looked at these two beings with anticipation on their faces. Expressions that were shared by Vine, Helena, and Vipar. They didn't want to admit it, but they were very much looking forward to this confrontation. The desire for power was inherent to demons, and seeing the peak of power in front of them made them anxious and excited as a motivation to become in existence as these two men arose in them. And being female demons, as they admired that power, something started to grow inside them as they watched the figure of their lord. That something made their insides clench with desire, leaving them hot. All the female demons felt a similar situation, 
whether they were the lesser demons or even the pillar rank demons who were watching from a distance. Both warriors stood in their chosen position as they faced each other, entirely focused on each other. A high-profile fight was about to begin, where the slightest mistake could cost them everything. An innocent drop of water came slowly falling from the sky, and as this drop of water fell into the surrounding sea, the two warriors vanished and appeared in the middle of the lake as blades clashed. The previously calm water began to stir, and rumblings followed by several metal clashes began to be heard again. Alucard was superior in reaction time and strength due to his superior body, but war was not far behind. As an ancient demon, and the strongest of the horsemen, he was not far behind in strength, not to mention that in his true form, the power available in his body was much greater than in his human form. But, he still lost on reaction time. Cough. War coughed up blood when he saw the cut on his chest, and the skin on his chest started to freeze but was soon thawed by the heat emanating from his body. Victor was a speed monster, and with his reaction time, he could react to anything quickly. Besides, all of Victor's attacks could be lethal because they could injure the soul, a progenitor's attacks were not to be taken lightly. But, despite the visible disadvantage, war was not behind him. Like all beings, the opportunity to evolve was always present, and war, who had stagnated due to not having a worthy opponent, began to evolve. When fighting a superior opponent, he became stronger, faster, and more sensitive to the opponent's changes, and his martial art began to be unconsciously refined. War was a genius. A being didn't reach his current strength without that genius behind them, and you don't survive in hell if you don't have an unyielding determination. So he had his own pride. So what if he's stronger? So what if he's faster? So what if he's superior? It does not matter. B.A. Dump, B.A. Dump. A worthy opponent is in front of me. B.A. Dump, B.A. Dump. Apologies are not necessary. Just action. B.A. Dump, B.A. Dump. Move on. Cut more. Fight harder. The sound of a heartbeat was heard all around. Let the flames of hell burn. A thunderous war cry was heard, and the flames on war's body grew even more furious. War's body, with each confrontation that happened with Victor, with each cut he suffered from Victor's attack, something changed inside him. The flames that had always been by his side since he was born began to glow furiously like an erupting volcano. Those flames were nourishing his body, his soul, and his heart. War was pushing his limits before everyone's eyes and becoming something even his brothers couldn't. Driven by his pride and acceptance of weakness, he acquired his other half, and when all these conditions were met, the seed of divinity in his soul began to blossom. He was lighting up like a demon god of war. Victor smiled widely, seeing his opponent getting stronger. War's blows were getting heavier and more accurate, he even managed to cut Victor's chest. But despite being cut, Victor just smiled and grinned in amusement. How could he not? With such a worthy opponent, how could he not smile? His opponent was getting stronger, but he wasn't behind either, Victor could feel it. That heady, hot feeling he always felt as he progressed, he could feel his existence becoming even more defined and stronger. He could feel Roxanne's power that nourished his body, fueling this state even more. Looking at his opponent covered in hellish flames, he couldn't help but think. There is a saying that only when the soul is nearing its end does it show its true potential. That's what was happening to war. His full potential was being forced to awaken in the face of an opponent like Victor. And that state was pushing Victor's existence to even higher levels. In the face of such a match, in the face of such an opponent, it would be an insult for Victor not to give it his all. Victor hit War's great sword and kicked him away, then he shouted. War. War readjusted his center of gravity and looked at Victor. Do not avert your eyes. Rumble, rumble. Lightning covered Victor's entire body, and slowly, he began to assume the martial arts stance most had grown painfully familiar with. Do not blink. Fush. 
Ice covered Junk Etsu completely, then blood covered the ice making the blade even sharper, and two wings of blood came out of Victor's back. Focus all your attention on me. War's eyes narrowed as his danger instinct alerted him at such a display. He didn't take Victor's warning lightly, so he completely elevated his frame of mind and utilized this newfound strength to the fullest. His instincts were sharp, as was his attention. Victor's hair was completely covered in flames. Because if you don't. With a speed that no one could react or see what he did, he appeared next to war. You will die. Boom. Chapter 666, The Warrior I Respect This was a first for Victor. This was the first time he simultaneously used all the bloodlines he'd gained on that fateful day when he turned into a vampire. The speed and the destruction of lightning. The strength and the power capable of reducing everything to ashes from fire. The resilience and the ability to turn everything, even your enemies, into ice constructs. The flexibility and the power to manipulate liquids derived from water. The power and the ability to destroy blood and souls. All of the bloodlines he'd obtained on that fateful day were being used at 100% capacity. He no longer needed to split his powers, he no longer needed to use only one power at a time or even reduce power so that he could use two or three simultaneously. He felt ecstasy, he felt complete, and most of all, he felt unstoppable. His entire body felt light, and with the slightest of intentions, his body responded perfectly. This was how things were supposed to be from the beginning, but the sheer power he received was too great, and he couldn't enjoy that feeling initially. But. It was okay. If he had enjoyed that feeling, he would have acted like an idiot and wouldn't have focused on training, discipline, and dedication to reach greater heights, which made Victor who he was today. With one attack, one slash, the soul was damaged, the body was burned, and while lightning electrocuted his enemy, ice formed crystals within the body, then water propelled the ice and lightning, causing even more damage. All of his powers were working in harmony. He was like a monster created with the strongest bloodlines of all current vampires in existence. And in front of him was his opponent. The Horseman of War, he was called. The one who was the strongest among his brothers and had reached a state that none of them could reach. The demon god of war, the first of its kind. A worthy opponent. Someone who had earned his respect. Victor was ecstatic. He didn't care about anything right now but this fight. And he could tell the same could be said for his opponent. Alucard, his opponent, was overwhelming. He could barely defend himself since he entered that form. He was the most formidable challenge he'd had so far. A monster that broke common sense, he was called someone who far surpassed most ancient warriors in less than a few years. Monster, genius, youngest vampire count in history, second progenitor, fastest man alive, genocider, rising star. The masses bestowed many titles on him, and his infamy was recognized, as well as his fame. But none of that mattered to war. For him, for the new demon god of war. Alucard was just. His opponent. An opponent who deserved his respect. An opponent who deserved his best. With a thunderous war cry that made the whole atmosphere grow heavier, a war cry that made the hell fire inside him grow even more furious. War surpassed his limits. War's blow landed, and in return, he received hundreds of slashes on his body. His opponent was fast, incredibly fast. Clang. The sound of two blades clashing echoed across the battlefield. And with that exchange, the ice covering his opponent's blade tried to surge toward his body, the ice moved strangely and even looked like it was made of liquid. A strange ice that was capable of subduing even the hottest hellfire. But. It didn't matter. His soul shone like a star that was just born into the universe. It shone intensely. And with a thrust, the fire grew stronger, thus negating the strongest ice. His body was in pieces. There were holes all over his body caused by his opponent's attack in his new form. Slash marks also spread over his body, wings, and left eye. 
Blinded on one side, he could feel the weight of his recklessness bearing down on him. He was getting weaker, his physical body just couldn't take it. But even so, his soul shone brightly, and he never felt so alive as he did now. The damage Alucard caused to his soul was regenerated, a feat only possible because of his ascended state. His body was destroyed, but his spirit still hadn't fallen. His heart was on display for all to see, long ago, his blood was scattered around them, but his eyes did not die. The glow of determination was still evident as the flames of hell nourished his body, hell itself was nourishing his body. As a demon god, the hell he was born into was his home, and its existence was supporting him, supporting his recklessness, and supporting his spirit, the spirit of the new god. I'm war. And I won't fall that easily. A name he had chosen for himself, which reflected his determination. A name that made him who he was today. Even if his body fell to pieces before an overwhelming opponent, he would still fight. Because he felt that he hadn't done his best yet. And in the face of the slayer of his brothers he had come to respect as a great warrior, he proclaimed as he slammed into his opponent's blade one last time. You are the strongest, Alucard. The strongest challenge I've had in my long existence. He gripped the hilt of his great sword and lifted the worn blade that, like his body, was severely damaged. Even the most robust materials in hell couldn't last that long in a fight as brutal as this. Slowly, War lifted the great sword up and supported the weapon with both hands. The weight of my recklessness is punishing my body. I fear that soon, I will fall in defeat. But I refuse to fall now. He squeezed the handle of the great sword tighter. I still haven't done my best. War's remaining eye glowed brightly with the flames of hell as his entire existence burned, along with a pillar of fire that rose to the heavens. Victor pointed Junkitsu's blade at War and said with a big smile on his face. Splendid. Out of respect for that determination, I will respond in kind. Victor's flaming hair began to flutter as if defying gravity, his blood wings expanded even further, and just like War, a pillar of red and black power ascended to heaven. At that very moment, everyone in hell could feel the overwhelming power of the two beings. Even those demons thousands of kilometers away from the current battle could feel the rising power of the two warriors. Insane. Won't hell break open if they collide? Vine asked with fear and admiration evident in her eyes. She could barely stand on her feet with just the pressure of the two of them. Hell won't break that easily. Probably. Vipar answered uncertainly as she held back from being thrown away like the other lesser demons. Helena who was silent, just watched everything, recording this moment in her memories. The flames of hell collided with chaotic power. War faced Alucard. The progenitor of vampires faced the demon god of war. The two warriors began to understand each other with each clash of blades, and words were no longer necessary. Alucard understood war, his anger, his hatred for him, his determination, and most of all, his loneliness. The loneliness he felt was hidden by all those flames of hell, born from not being closer to his brothers. Brothers in battle, brothers who had been by his side for a long time. And from that solitude, Victor could feel his acceptance and his grief. The demon mentality that the strong were right and the weak were wrong was deeply imprinted in his psyche. Victor didn't feel sorry for war. Instead, he accepted things as they were and surrendered his respect for the horsemen. All those who take up a sword and point it at an enemy seeking their death must be prepared for the enemy to do the same too. It was common sense. War was a splendid warrior, and that could not be denied. He would not let himself be denied by anyone. The horseman's honor would remain eternal and unsullied. War understood Alucard, he understood his desire to conquer, the determination that drove him to become so strong, the desperation he was trying to hide and the fear in him. The desire for conquest and power drove Alucard, but it was not that simple. Alucard's real motivation was fear, despair, and the discipline that was tempered in his body by force. Desperation at the thought that he would be stuck here forever motivated him not to stay in one place. 
the fear that he might lose himself in his obsession drove him to seek out allies. The discipline that was forged in his body was the catalyst that kept him from giving in to these negative thoughts and the driving force that made him move in pursuit of his desires and goals. Alucard was simple yet complex at the same time. He was complicated and, at the same time, simple. War had never seen anyone so internally chaotic. And at the same time, he had never seen such an honorable warrior as him. And out of respect for that warrior, war would not allow anyone to tarnish that honor. Alucard's honor was eternal and unsullied. Even if he died in the next attack, he would ensure everyone knew that, even after his death. It was the least he could do for someone like him. The two warriors positioned themselves in their own martial arts stances as the two's blades were glowing brightly with their respective powers. The look of determination and prominent smiles they both had were gifts for all to see, a smile that War didn't even know he was showing. Before he even realized it, he was having fun in this fight. Suddenly, the two gigantic pillars of power disappeared, and all that was left were two beings empowered by their own abilities. A hush fell around them, a hush of solemnity, a hush that was the harbinger of a brewing storm. The atmosphere around the two beings was chaotic and dense, it was like War and Alucard were in their own world, only they were allowed to step in. No one could get close, or the very presence of the two beings would kill them. And just as everyone expected, the silence was broken. At that moment, no one dared to breathe, no one dared to look away, all of hell was watching the fight, and all of hell were watching as the two warriors leaped towards each other with speed never shown before. And when they collided, hell flashed with a white light, followed by an explosion that shook the entire dimension. Even beings, who lived in the most isolated places in hell, could feel the dimension shake. It was like a shockwave that the entire dimension could feel. Wah! What's going on? Vipar screamed. Do I look like I fucking know? Just hold on. Vine replied. What is the outcome of the battle? Helena screamed while holding Vine's legs. If I could see it, I would tell you. They both have such great powers that. Vine trailed off as she felt the pressure war was exuding drop considerably. Something that Vipar and Helena began to feel as well. The white light began to fade, and slowly everyone could see the result of the battle, and what they saw shocked them. What was revealed was a crater so deep that not even the eyes of higher rank demons could see the bottom. Furthermore, the entire location was isolated by red lightning, and a thick cloud of miasma was blanketing the area, miasma strong enough to make even high rank pillar demons feel queasy. It was as if the crater was a whole new kind of hell. Probably no one, not today nor even in the future, would be able to go to that place without running the risk of dying. Holy fuck! Vipar completely lost her composure. The destruction caused was just insane, she had never seen anything like this in her entire existence. By Lilith. Are we still seeing the same hell? Helena spoke in disbelief. Look. Vine pointed up at the clouds of miasma and red lightning. Helena and Vipar looked up and saw Alucard floating in the sky as if the very atmosphere of the location didn't bother him. He was back in his base form, his long black hair fluttered in the wind, and the progenitor's trusty blade was floating alongside him in a completely new form, a great sword. In Alucard's arms was war, defeated, his body bloody. Victor Alucard, the progenitor of vampires, was victorious. Alucard's strength was undeniable, and someone like him was moving. They couldn't stay still. While all hell broke loose as Victor and War fought. On the battlefield, only silence was heard. Victor didn't cheer or roar in victory, such a thing wasn't necessary for him. Instead, he just floated towards Vine, Helena, and Vipar. When Victor landed on the ground, the three women looked at War. Is he alive? Vine asked cautiously. Victor didn't answer, as he just looked to the side and whistled. The whistle echoed throughout the battlefield, and two horses could be seen in the distance a few seconds later. Despair, 
in all his rugged glory and black fur with green flames shooting out of his eyes, hoofs, and tail, stood beside a red, flaming hellfire horse. The Horse of War Despair and War's horse stopped slightly in the distance, and Victor walked towards them. He looked into War's horse's eyes for a few seconds. And as if it understood Victor's intention, the horse lowered its head slightly as the hellfire in its body seemed to grow much weaker. Victor placed War's body on the horse's rump, then approached its head and caressed it briefly. Finally, Victor brought his face to the horse's ear and spoke in a language that only the horsemen of the apocalypse and their steeds could understand, a language of brothers. A language that was born from a joke in the past and has remained as the symbol of the four horsemen. Dollar per cent number. The horse whinnied, and the flames of hell covered the horse's entire body, then it turned and started running in the direction he came from. Victor observed the horse in the distance with an air of solemnity, and when he was no longer seen, Victor turned, patted Despair's head, who snorted in satisfaction, then climbed onto his back. Victor took Junketsu, transformed the blade into a whip that was easier to carry, and said. Come, we have somewhere to be. The order was given, and they could only obey. Yes. Despite having a lot of doubts about Victor's recent actions, they weren't in a position to question it now. Alucard's decisions? They weren't crazy enough yet to question them, he was their lord, and when the lord made a decision, only obedience was required. In the distance, a horse imbued with hell fire galloped through the hostile lands of hell. Some lesser demons who had observed the fight approached the horse. He he he, with war's body, we can dot. But all that was left of him was ashes. Idiots, he's a horseman's horse. Of course, it's not simple. The elite demon spoke in disdain. What should we do? A lesser demon asked. We should just follow him and see where he's taking the body. He ordered. I don't know why Alucard didn't consume him, but it doesn't matter. Consuming a demon god's body will make us much stronger. The demon's eyes glittered with greed. The majestic horse would stop at nothing. So even though demons who saw the battle tried to approach it, they only got burned by the flames of hell. There was a reason war could touch him. It was because he was strong and because they came from the same hell. A hell of flames was his home. With an even more powerful whinny, the horse's entire body was covered in fire, and the next moment it disappeared in flames, shocking its pursuers. What? Can he do that too? And what do we do now? I don't fucking know. But, for now, try to track the body. We must not miss this opportunity. Chapter 667, There is no rest for the wicked. Diablo, at this very moment, was feeling disbelief. In his long existence, he had never seen so much bullshit. The four horsemen lost the fight pretty severely. Pestilence, death and famine dying and being absorbed by Victor, just like Victor's weird weapon absorbed their weapons. War became a demon god. And Victor defeated him in a clash of powers that left irreversible damage in hell, even now that crater, the clouds of miasma, and red lightning were still present in hell. A feat of strength that not even Diablo, Lilith, or Lucifer could boast of. Yes, they were powerful and could easily destroy several areas of hell, but they couldn't cause irreparable damage to hell. No matter the attack or how many demons fought, hell would never be harmed permanently. That was what all the demons believed. Until now. Even Diablo himself couldn't help but be shocked. Hell's was just that strong. After all, Hell's very existence was sustained by the negative counterpart of Earth's world tree, a primordial entity, the Judges of the Abyss. After a long silence, Diablo spoke. Baal. Yes, my king. How long has it been since a demon god was born? This has never happened since Lilith, my king. Right. Since the age of Genesis no demon god had been created. Not even Lucifer or Diablo had achieved this feat, which war achieved when fighting Alucard. Baal looked at his king neutrally, 
he didn't blame Diablo's lack of reaction because he reacted the same way when he heard what had happened. He felt incredulous. Even though he had predicted this would happen and told the four horsemen to be wary, he had never anticipated their fight would go like this. He had never expected Alucard to be so strong. While everyone thought they knew of Alucard's power, he surprised everyone once again. People seriously underestimate Victor's potential. With the recent fight, it was hard even to tell what level he was at. In fact, the very act of designating a level for an irregular being like him seemed wrong since he was constantly breaking common sense. Where is War's body? In the area of hell where sinners burn with hell fire itself eternally. The former home of War. Did you recover the body? It's impossible. Impossible. Diablo looked at Bale. The rank one demon didn't say that he couldn't or that he was in the process of doing so, instead that it was impossible, something that shouldn't happen in the hell they came to exist in. After all, they were the highest authority there. Yes, that particular part of hell is completely closed off. Nobody can get in, and I can't get in touch with the demons in that hell. A silence fell around, and a few seconds later, the silence was broken when Diablo's tail twitched, an unconscious gesture Diablo made when he understood something. Something Bale learned after watching his king for a long time. Hell is protecting his body. That was Diablo's conclusion. It wasn't like that hadn't happened in the past. For example, when Lilith was severely damaged in a fight with one of the Archangels, the first hell hid Lilith. Is hell sentient? That would not be the correct word. But yes, every hell and every heavenly plane has its will. Diablo turned his face and started walking. The same way a god king has complete control over the dimension he rules over. Hell has something like that. The ruler is the true king of hell, the one who judges sinners. Baal nodded. He knew that. However, it wasn't until a few seconds later that Baal understood the implications of those words. Is my king not the ruler of hell? Since Lucifer left, there has never been a ruler. The two of us were doing the work passively, and it was only possible thanks to the key to hell that was in our possession, an item that, like the helm of Hades, is a connection point for the ruler of our hell. Even when I defeated Lilith and united the keys into one, I didn't fully become the ruler. I didn't want to be limited to just hell, my goals were much bigger. And so that the judges of the abyss would not interfere, I temporarily transformed Lilith into the ruler so that the souls would not be lost. Although, she's not a ruler. She didn't go through the trial. She's just a cog in the system, so the judges ignore what I do. To be on the safe side, I also made a deal with the judges. I handed them billions of souls that would give me the equivalent of five years of time. Of course, I didn't forget to ask a favor, either. And because of that favor, the time from five years was shortened to one year. Were it not for this favor, I would have much more time before the judges of the abyss would interfere. What Diablo was doing, collecting innocent souls, and using them as fuel for his demons, was obviously against the balance these powerful people were so interested in keeping. But thanks to war's agreements and payment, he could postpone the interference of these beings for a long time because if not for this agreement, Limbo would be knocking on Diablo's door in search of the demon's soul. As long as Diablo didn't overdo it and let some souls go naturally, the judges of the abyss would uphold their agreement and prevent Limbo from acting. The judges had such authority, considering that the souls and hells were areas strictly supervised by the judges of the abyss. I see. That explains a lot Bale thought, and in the next second, distrust was born in his heart. Why is he telling me this? He knew his king, the demon did nothing useless, what was the game here? I take it we don't have much time. Bale continued with the same neutral face. Yes. My plans had to be readjusted. Hades foresaw no harm, but Persephone has assumed the title of ruler of Greek hell and is currently restoring the underworld. So, effectively speaking, I lost influence in the Greek pantheon. The same applies to the Norse pantheon, Hela. That fool, 
she destroyed the Bifrist. Bale's face twitched a little. But, to the demon's credit, he reacted very well, destroying a conceptual artifact was ridiculous, and he couldn't even think how that was possible. The Bifrist was destroyed. Yes. The gods don't know who was responsible, but I know that Hela did it using one of Odin's most feared dragons. Nya, GGR, the dragon that gnaws at the roots of Yggdrasil. Only an elder beast of the end could do something like that. Bael gulped. The Ragnarok prophecy was famous, and everyone knew the main players. Thor, Fenrir, Odin, J, Ramungandr, and the dragon who waits patiently gnawing at the deepest roots of the world tree, Nya, GGR. All of them are the main actors in Ragnarok. Nya, GGR is an ancient dragon, a beast of the apocalypse who makes Fenrir look like a child in comparison. How? How is this possible? As an ancient dragon, he is immeasurable. Odin and the Norse gods would know if it were him. For a beast like him. He doesn't need to be present to destroy something. Just his intent is enough. That is ridiculous. Just how was Hela able to do this? She is the daughter of Loki. She is headstrong, and even if she is hated in the Norse pantheon due to her very nature, she will still protect her pantheon even if it means isolating the entire pantheon for hundreds of years. Something Loki knows all too well, and despite not looking like it, this god is very loyal to his house. It's not hard to imagine Loki and Hela teaming up to do that. With the Bifrost closed, the only alternative to entering the Nordic pantheon is through the branches of the world tree, and that can't be done because it will alert the world tree itself, and its ego will kick everyone out. Only that damn rat there might be a way to infiltrate Asgard, but it won't help the demons. Diablo continued until he entered a room where Lilith was standing quite robotically. A giant panel floating in the air could be seen inside that room. Ratatosk, it's greedy. Maybe it can be negotiated with. Bale has spoken. Ratatosk was the only known being who could climb the nine realms of the Norse pantheon and the only being who could visit the other pantheons. He knew the hidden paths of the world tree that connected all pantheons. Unlikely, in the past, he stopped walking the paths that led to other pantheons. He learned his lesson when the Greeks and the Egyptians exploited him. That rat became very wary of outsiders. Ratatosk is a squirrel. Baal thought neutrally but didn't say it aloud. We don't have the Greek pantheon due to Hades' unpredictability. Due to Hela's reckless attitude, we don't have the Nordic pantheon. The Shinto pantheon is already dealing with the threats of its own hell. Amaterasu has once again proven why she is a god-king on par with R.A. regarding ranking as a sun goddess. The Hindu pantheon, needless to say, with Shiva present in that place, he would not let Indra's incompetence affect his pantheon too much, and the situation will be resolved eventually. Fortunately, in the meantime, Yama got hell on our side. Of our allies, only the ancient Chinese pantheon, which is with the empty rule, Inma, the Buddhist hell king, and Yama, the Hindu hell king, are on our side. Tisk. At this point, the Greeks, the Norsemen, and that bastard from Egypt should be our ally. Diablo's eyes glinted crimson red. But no. He had to pick up a childish fight with his brother and was subdued afterward. His entire meticulous plan was being destroyed due to stubborn beings. And to make matters worse, there is an annoying insect in my hell that, thanks to a failed plan, has entered my house and is causing chaos. Bale would like to say that no one predicted that Victor was a mortal who could survive in hell, an extremely toxic place for the living, but he was silent. Diablo was at an impasse. He couldn't go back to hell because if he did, the angels would notice, and they would attack with everything making his whole plan involving Miguel and Gabriel go up in the air. He couldn't ask for help because his allies were dealing with their own internal problems, only Yama was free but that idiot was somewhere in South Africa causing trouble. In recent reports, he saw that the progenitor of vampires, Vlad, was going there. Inma might be the only one who could help him, but he was now restructuring his hell, so he'd hardly respond. 
After a long silence, Diablo, who was thinking about his next move, spoke. Call all the deadly sins back. I want them to leave their current jobs and come back to support me. Yes, my king. What about Alucard? What do we do? He asked cautiously. Alucard defeated a demon god. Even if it was just recently born, war wasn't exactly weak. Only wrath, pride, agars, or you could fight war equally, and that number dropped to just you and agars when he became a demon god. Which means Alucard is as strong as I am or might be superior due to his qualities as a progenitor. Correct. Bale was not upset by this fact but was impressed. As a rank one demon, it was insane to think of someone so young who was as strong as him, even surpassing him. I wonder how he'll fare fighting my true form. Bale thought with an inward smile but quickly shook his head. As a demon, it was an inherent desire to seek conflict and struggle, for a moment, he almost lost control of it. Alucard has become an existence that only my elites or I personally can handle. I will not make the same mistake of underestimating him again. Diablo decided to make plans, always thinking about Alucard's future potential. Are we going to let him run wild in hell? Bale asked in the same neutral tone. How about sending the dragon? That would just be sending food to Alucard, Diablo spoke. So we ignore him. Yes. For now. The beings that are in hell right now are all weak. Even if they join the weak, he still has a weak army. I can deal with him later when I return after achieving my plans. The plane of earth is much more important. My king, have you forgotten what happened to Vine and Vipar? I haven't forgotten, I've taken into consideration the possibility of him strengthening the demons as well, but it still won't be enough to deal with me. All the strongest demons in hell are with me on earth, while only the remnants are in hell. For a moment, Diablo even considered attacking beings related to Victor, but the moment that thought popped into his head, he denied it. There were many demerits, especially now that Vlad was not on his leash and that various divine energies had been reported in Nightingale through the spies of his new group of allies. Not to mention Scat Hatch, the strongest female vampire everyone knew, had a master-student relationship with Alucard. He would only harm himself if he struck the wrong way now that his forces were scattered and the angels were patiently waiting for him to make a mistake. Diablo's eyes gleamed. That's it. The Elder Gods. They are the beings that have the most grudge against vampires. If I manage to bring an Elder God to the table, it will be possible to create a collar for Alucard. He didn't even consider talking to the Elder Gods to help him on Earth. The reason for this was simple these beings only cared about their invaders, namely the vampires. Contact our mutual friend, tell them I want to do business with them. My king. About this group, I think you'd better talk to them personally. Diablo opened his mouth to speak but quickly closed his mouth and considered Bale's advice, and he realized that the demon was right. Very well, I will contact them. Are we going to help Yama regarding Vlad? It is obvious that a fight will ensue when the two meet. Yama has his generals with him. Even Vlad couldn't handle that new general casually. Diablo spoke as he thought of the demon that was once Merlin. Dealing with mages of Merlin's and Evie's caliber was extremely troublesome. You'll never know if you fell into a trap or not. It wasn't ridiculous to think that the most experienced mages were invincible in their own territory. Yes, my king. Before you go, talk to Asmodeus. It's time for the ancient spirit to leave the laboratory. Will production of cursed bullets stop? The number we have is enough for the highest order angels. Yes, my king. I will pass on your orders. Diablo didn't say anything as he looked at the floating screen that soon began to show images of Alucard and his fight. Bale exited and left the demon king alone. Alucard's fight with war. He wanted to understand everything about this impediment. The Demon King didn't even consider paying attention to the silent doll watching the entire conversation with dead eyes. He didn't even notice the twinkle in Lilith's eyes that appeared for a few seconds when she watched Alucard and War fight. 
On a dark night, a tall vampire with blonde hair and blood-red eyes looked out over a city full of demons, wearing a white tuxedo. Yama is kidding too much. The man spoke in disdain. A portal appeared behind the man. Alek shows, good news. Yes, I located the group of vampires. Good. I will deal with Yama now. Vlad's body was covered in darkness with shades of red, and soon he disappeared. As long as you act as my messenger, I will return soon. Yes, my king. Chapter 668, We Take Care of Each Other We're back, Scathatch said as she passed through a portal. Mother, you're back. And with guests. Ruby spoke. Hmm. You know Mayaniku, the current queen of the Amazons. Scathatch nodded, gesturingly, as she introduced the queen of the Amazons who looked like a deer caught in headlights with so many beautiful women looking at her menacingly from her point of view. Violet, any news of Victor? Agnes asked Violet, annoyance evident in her expression. No news, Violet answered her mother with the same annoyance written on her face. Damn bastards, how dare they? Agnes cursed under her breath, but everyone heard her voice. Leona rolled her eyes when she saw Violet's mother reacting exactly like her daughter. I take it there were no problems recruiting the Amazons. Leona asked, getting straight to the point. There were problems, Natasha answered the werewolf. Oh. Leona raised her eyebrow, just what kind of problems could the strongest countesses face? With the lineup of you and the goddesses, there shouldn't have been any problems. The world is bigger than you think, Leona, Scathatch replied while looking at the group. Merlin was there and in all his demonic glory. An awkward silence fell around the group as the women looked at each other with an expression that said, Scathatch, are you going senile? Scathatch pursed her lips in annoyance. She could clearly see what the women were thinking of her. Not that I'm doubting you, mother. But wasn't Merlin dead? Sienna quickly spoke when she saw Skathika's annoyance rising. That's what I thought too, but apparently, the senile old man has turned into a demon from an entirely different pantheon. W wait, is this real? Merlin is alive? That Merlin? The old man who taught Arthur? Pepper asked in disbelief. Tisk, why is that old man so famous? He's just a little boy, and I trained Arthur. Scathatch replied with an expression of annoyance at another acquaintance. Scathatch was not pleased. W. Well, Merlin has appeared in a lot of anime. It's kind of unbelievable, you know. Pepper tried to defend herself. In defense of my mother, she's appeared in several anime too. Her name is quite famous. Lakas spoke. But it's Merlin, you know. The male mage. Pepper spoke. Humph, that's just a legend. There's no way Merlin can be a wizard, everyone knows only witches can Sienna spoke. Unfortunately, that is incorrect information. At. Eh. Merlin could use magic. He is the only known man who could. Aside from Victor, of course. But unlike Victor, who Albedo Moriarty blessed, Merlin could use magic even without outside help. The younger girls opened their eyes in shock at this historical fact. And daughter, why are you so shocked? Your mother was the one who trained Arthur and sometimes that bag of bones, you know. I mean, you're my mother. Pepper replied as if that was an answer that solved all the questions in the world. Right? It's hard to imagine. Lakas supported her sister. What is that supposed to mean? Scathatch asked narrowing her eyes even more. Lakas and Pepper shuddered and quickly hid behind Sienna. They're saying they're very close to you, and because of that, it's hard to imagine you being someone so legendary, Ruby spoke supportively of the sisters. Oh. Skathika's eyes grew kinder. To be honest, sometimes, I also forget that she is the strongest female vampire. If it weren't for the occasional ridiculous fights between her and Victor, I would have forgotten. Natasha spoke with a smile on her face. Right? 
Scat Hatch was so much more approachable after Victor came into her life. I think that wonderful member put out her inner fire. Agnes spoke. Umu, there's nothing sex can't fix. Aphrodite nodded, as the goddess of sex, I can attest to that. Skathika's eyes began to glow blood red, and veins appeared to bulge on her head. Aya, she's irritated. Natasha promptly pulled away from Scat Hatch and hugged her daughter. M mother, behave yourself, Sasha said. I am behaving myself. Natasha snorted. Skathika's face doesn't say that. Sasha snapped. She's very nervous, don't you see? She almost blew up the Amazons a few moments ago, so obviously, she needs to relax a little more. Natasha smiled like a sneaky cat. The women looked at Maya, who was silent. Maya's body shuddered again after feeling all the eyes in the room on her again. Why does she look like a scared cat? Isn't she supposed to be a queen? Violet asked. Well. Scat hatch happened, Natasha spoke. What did she do? Ruby asked, feeling a headache coming on. Hmm. Natasha looked at Hestia and Nagi, the goddesses can tell you. The girls looked at the goddesses. Hestia and Nagi gave the smirking Natasha a stinking glare, and shortly after, they looked at the women. Ha! she killed all the elder Amazon women in a public execution, and all who went against her words were beaten into oblivion, Hestia spoke. The city was painted in blood with the remains of those women. For some reason, everyone could picture the image in their heads very well, and that image made everyone shudder. Unconsciously, they all looked at Maya with pity. That's rude, throwing the blame on me. I said I wouldn't kill anyone, and that's what I did, but those elder women's crimes were so unforgivable that you ordered them to die yourself, Hestia. Aphrodite and Rhea turned to look at Hestia in shock. The two knew very well what a kind goddess she was. She wouldn't order anyone's death if things weren't too horrible. Was it that bad? The saddened expression on the gentlest goddess's face was enough of an answer. If Hestia isn't willing to say it, I will. Agnes positioned herself in front of the group. The elder Amazons were using the sons of the Amazons as slave labor. Since they were young, they were forced to work, and when they were biologically old enough, they would have their seeds forcibly taken by the Amazons. They would be used until exhaustion, and soon after, they would be discarded. The sons would share the same fate as their fathers, and the women would be proud Amazons, Agnes spoke in disdain. Everyone's eyes opened wide. Even though some in the room weren't very human-friendly, especially with men other than Victor, they wouldn't go to such lengths to harm them, especially children. It was a line no one in the room dared cross. The pitiful eyes the girls gave Maya changed to revulsion and disgust. I did not know that. Maya squealed shakily from the killing intent of the girls. Impossible. You are the queen. How would you not know? Pepper growled with an attitude that surprised many girls. I only recently became queen, and within our society, elder Amazons hold a lot of prestige. This tradition goes back to the first Amazon. But I didn't know this was happening. Maya spoke in a defeated tone. Even if she didn't do much to change her society, if she knew these things were happening, she would have fought tooth and nail to change everything or at least rescue her male people so they would have some dignity. The suffering these men and children went through went against everything she believed in, and the part that hurt Maya the most was that her people were treating those who could be considered their own like this. Even if they weren't women, they were born to an Amazon, therefore, they were her people. Didn't you ever wonder why there weren't any men? Ruby narrowed her eyes. When you learned about fertilization and children, you should have known that the probability of a male being born from a relationship is more than 50%. Didn't you ask what happened? Yes, I asked my mother that at the time, and she said that all who were born male were put back where they belonged. At the time, I thought the place they belonged was outside the realm of the Amazons and not in that hole. She yelled indignantly. It was obvious that even she didn't believe what her people did. 
Now, you understand why I killed all the elder Amazon women who knew about it. If her mother had been alive, I would have killed her too. It was obvious that woman knew what was going on. Scathatch spoke in disdain. Maya shuddered at Skathika's glare, but she didn't say anything because, honestly, she had the same thoughts when she saw that situation. I assume everyone responsible for this incident is dead, right? Mizuki spoke while looking at Scat Hatch. The woman's eyes were radiating pure killing intent. Of course, they all died in the most painful way possible. How? How did they die? Mizuki insisted. Dismemberment. I got four horses, tied one to each limb, and voila. Scat Hatch smiled. A smile that made all the girls shudder. As an ancient being, Scat Hatch knew of various execution methods used in the past. Some died at my hand or were introduced to my lightning. Natasha raised her hands as lightning crackled in her hand. I personally incinerated an elder Amazon to death. Slowly, that bitch was disgusting, Agnes spoke with visible disgust on her face. Now, I understand why she looks like a beaten cat. Leona spoke. Everything has been resolved, right? I don't need to worry about her people committing these acts again, right? Violet spoke. They've already been warned, and the Queen wants to change too. However, she assured me that those who don't want to change will have quality time with me. Scat Hatch grinned widely. As superhumans, the Amazons make great torture toys. I feel my rusty skills coming back in full force. The girls gulped at the morbid smile on Skathika's face. I will make sure they change. Even if it's through the gallows. Maya spoke with visible determination. That's good. Because if they are placed in my hands. Well, you already know the result. Scat Hatch smiled. Maya just nodded furiously. It's better for them to suffer at my hand than this monster's. Maya thought that this was also her duty as a queen. Where is Kagaya? Hestia asked in an attempt to change the subject. She had just noticed that the maid was absent and pointed it out. Fortunately, the girls understood her goal and silently agreed to change the subject. Kagaya is with the other maids in Japan, as we discussed earlier, Sasha answered. I know about that but why isn't she here? That visit shouldn't take so long, right? Now that you say it, that's true. Sasha looked at Ruby. Understanding Sasha's look, Ruby took her cell phone out of her pocket, called Kagaya and put the cell phone to her ear. Ruby. Kagaya, why are you taking so long? Well, there was a problem. The girls rolled their eyes, there was always a problem, wasn't there? They thought. What is it? Ruby continued. Some demons from Japanese hell have come out and are causing havoc in the human world. And apparently, a mythological war is going on between Amaterasu, and her mother, Izanami, who was apparently sealed away in hell. Amaterasu has somehow won the war recently, but in the meantime, the demons of hell have been loosed in the human world, and consequently, the Yukai have been involved in the mess as well. At Harana's behest, several squadrons of yukai were formed, and we began to clear Japan of demons. As Harana is. Kagaya was going to say the woman Victor likes but decided it would be silly to say it now, not that it wasn't obvious, but it would just unnecessarily tease the girls, our ally. I had to help. The girls were silent for a few seconds and blinked several times. Hey. Why am I only finding this out now? What is Susanna doing? Aphrodite thought. The fairest goddess's pretty face tightened into a visible frown. Deciding that she would question Susanna later, she continued to observe everything. Are you okay? Violet screamed. Before Kagaya could even reply, Violet's temper burst the seal she had barely kept in under as she continued. For God's sake, Kagaya. If something happens to you, or the maids, Victor will be devastated. Why didn't you fucking call for help? Ruby shot Violet a warning look, which the white-haired woman ignored as she waited for an answer from Kagaya, 
who was obviously taken aback by her outburst. I didn't call for help because the problem isn't something we can't handle. Remember, Lady Violet, we have Victor's blood in us. We are not weak. And it was also a good opportunity for the girls to loosen up and get stronger. Since Master disappeared, they've been devastated. A solemn gaze passed over the girls. Each of them was dealing with Victor's disappearance in their own way, he was the glue that held the group together. And even though he disappeared, his influence didn't diminish. Instead, it just motivated the girls to become even closer together and overprotective of each other. That's no excuse for not giving notice, Violet spoke in a more controlled tone. Sorry, I should have warned you. Yes, you should have. Violet looked at Mizuki. Mizuki. You don't have to say anything, I'll go. It's my homeland. I won't stand by while demons invade. I will too. Morgana spoke, then added, after seeing the girl's questioning eyes, I won't interfere. I'll just act as additional protection. I don't know if the people after Victor will attack us, but it's good to keep the mindset that they will. They wouldn't miss the opportunity now that Victor is away from here and will think we are an easy target, she spoke in disdain. Some of the women here were among the most dangerous women in the supernatural world, most notably Aphrodite, Scat Hatch, Jean, and herself. That's why we should stick together. The strongest members should always accompany by the less skilled members for extra protection every time they go out. We protect each other. That is the motto of Clan Alucard. The girls displayed a gentle smile when they heard Morgana's words. They were a family, and the family protected each other. Even if Victor was not here, his influence and way of thinking were still strong. In fact, it grew stronger every moment he remained away. Well said, Morgana. Violet flashed a big smile, and her sense of hurry eased considerably when she realized she wasn't alone. Did you hear, Kagaya? Yes, I'm sorry. Dot. No need to apologize, just don't go at it alone. It's as if you picked up Victor's bad habit. Violet groaned. Kagai just kept silent and then gently added, Yes, I won't do anything alone. Ruby, I will count on you to make plans involving the most skilled members. Mm, I will, Ruby spoke with a small smile and then quickly added with a serious expression. Each of you married using the ritual will go to my lab to visit Victor's blood station. Do you still have that? Sasha asked in shock. Since the day that Victor and I were separated from you for a year and six months, he and I have thought of various ways to store blood in case something like this suddenly happened. He willingly gave away several bags of blood that only we can use. Anyone who doesn't have a connection with Victor and drinks the blood or experiments with it will cause the blood to react in a very dangerous way. Seriously, it's like his blood has a conscience of its own. Ruby thought. Victor is fine, he has Roxanne, who has eliminated his bloodlust, but we don't have that. So even if it's reserve blood, we must drink it. Agnes spoke with a reluctant face. And you must only drink a little. After all, we don't know how long he will spend in hell. Ugh. Agnes, Violet, Sasha, and Natasha groaned reluctantly. There was a massive difference when drinking straight from the fountain than drinking from a plastic bag. The taste seemed even more distant. The girls who had Victor's regular blood realized for the first time that they would have to be content with drinking blood from a bag. Chapter 669, King Demon x King Vampire in a burning city, hordes of demons of different shapes and sizes stared at a single golden-haired man in front of them. The man, although handsome, was only wearing a rather ordinary suit, a very unbelievable sight considering this man was in front of several demons. Vlad Dracul Teeps, the first progenitor of vampires, the king of vampires, I didn't expect to see you here, the man sitting on a golden throne spoke with a bored, amused face. Yama. King of Hell, you've changed quite a bit since I last heard from you. Of course, I've changed, after all, I'm not the same Yama. It seems that the old Yama died. 
but why is he so similar to the old Yama? Vlad narrowed his eyes and looked at the demon's soul, the moment he looked at the demon's soul. He noticed the old Yama's familiar signature, indicating that the soul in front of him was related to the old Yama. From there, the conclusion was logical. Are you old Yama's son? Wrong, I'm his grandson. I see. It looks like the nature of demons is alive and well, Vlad's tone was neutral, but the slight hint of irony in his words was quite obvious. Had. But isn't that normal in our world? Parents kill children. And children kill parents. All in the name of power and authority, your children were planning to do the same thing to you, right? And they failed, if they can't even plan my downfall without my knowing, they're not worthy of my throne. Ha ha ha, that is the arrogance expected from the strongest vampire, Yama got up from his throne and started walking toward the ground. The three demons behind Yama opened their eyes wide and reached toward Yama as they called out. King Yama. Dot. Generals, did I tell you to leave your posts? Yama's voice was casual, but the three generals who were standing behind Yama felt shivers run down their spines. Understanding their king's message, they reluctantly remained in place, but their vigilance over Vlad grew much stronger than before. Oh? That's impressive, I would never have thought that I would see such loyalty in any army other than Lilith's. Unlike my grandfather, I understand the importance of good subordinates, slowly a dark miasma with violet hues began to form on Yama's head, and soon a crown appeared. Ruler's bond, and a strong one at that, looks like he's stolen the complete rulership of hell from him. Vlad thought. The progenitor wasn't worried. Even if in front of him was someone who could negate his soul-damaging attacks, it didn't matter to Vlad. He would still win. It wasn't arrogance. It was a fact. As a ruler, soul attacks have significantly reduced effects. Just like a progenitor, a ruler's existence is special, and it can be said that they are even more special than the progenitor of vampires. As beings that stir souls, they need to have a strong soul. The ruler will never be seriously harmed by soul damage because his status as a ruler will protect his soul from destruction. Of course, like everything in the world, there is a balance, and the status of the ruler is no different. Despite being special beings that even gods of death cannot damage their souls, the same does not apply to entities that mess with souls like the judges of the abyss and the universal tree. Coming straight into the confrontation, and alone. Is that arrogance or too much confidence? Vlad questioned himself as he looked at Yama, who was standing less than 10 meters away from him. Let's have fun. Vlad. After all, I wasted a lot of time trying to pull you out of your hole. Miasma began to cover Yama's body, and soon he was in the full ceremonial robes of a king, robes of red colors with shades of gold. His formerly human skin began to change to shades of red and dark blue, fangs protruded from his teeth, and the crown of miasma on his head began to catch fire. His expression changed to a serious one, with a big smile on his face. He looked very angry and, at the same time, like he was about to have a lot of fun. Yama's face. The least I expect is a little fun. The whole atmosphere started to get heavier, and the growing sensation of miasma began to be felt by everyone. Vlad narrowed his eyes, going straight to his demon form and using all his power. Good, he may be young, but he didn't underestimate me. He thought as he had his attention completely focused on his surroundings. He was in enemy territory, after all, so a trap was quite likely to happen. Since the incident of his son drugging him with poison before he died, he was very alert so that failure would not happen again. Vlad suddenly turned his head towards the generals and narrowed his eyes. They might hide it from him, but the scent was quite visible, the scent of his kind. Did you know I was going to come after the vampires? It was a hunch. Fortunately, I was correct. Yama looked back specifically at his generals. Bring them. The generals nodded their heads and raised their hands, and a very familiar magic circle appeared in the hand of the demons, soon, several beings started to appear. 
Vlad was internally amazed at the magic circles the demons were using, he had never seen anything like this before. What is that? He didn't have much time to think about it because when he saw which beings appeared, Vlad's eyes glowed blood red for a moment. They were vampires, albeit different. They had sharp fangs made of unrecognizable metal, slightly pointed ears, pink skin, and golden eyes. The faces of this group were more soft, and most of them were androgynous beings. The variety didn't end there. Some had slightly blue skin, blood-red eyes, and sharp faces. One group in particular had a more grey skin color, and they had cracks that could be easily noticed on their legs, and they didn't have humanoid legs. Rather, like a demonic beast, their legs were robust, and the claws were made of the same material as the teeth of vampires who had pink skin. Others had chocolate skin, blood-red eyes, and normal fangs, but the claws on their hands were similar to the same metal as the other groups. The claws on the hand of this group looked more like a naturally created sharp gauntlet, the proof of which is that some men and women in this group had half of their entire arm covered with this natural protection, which was quite robust. Some specific ones even had their entire arm completely altered into some kind of monster claws. This particular group had the most human features. When the eyes of a woman with chocolate skin, curly hair, and blood-red eyes met his, he narrowed his eyes and thought. From the dress that looked like a shaman, it was obvious that the priestess was one of the group's leaders. As well as the tall, muscular man, who wore clothes similar to, but more masculine than, the woman. The two were the leaders of these vampires. Although each member of the group looked different, it was obvious that they belonged to the same bloodline, the only difference being that they had developed differently over the years. The bloodline of the ancient progenitors still lives. Lord Vlad. The man spoke in a tired tone of voice. You have been captured, Bomani. I don't know how they managed to find our village's protection. It seems there was a spy in our ranks. It was something the taller man didn't want to think about, but it was obvious that there was a traitor. After all, the entrance to the village was only known by its inhabitants, only Vlad knew some entrances, but the inhabitants made sure to double the vigilance in those entrances that Vlad knew. The demon's attack, however, came from an entrance used only by the inhabitants, which only the inhabitants knew about. What's the point of this? Yama. Is it all to fight me? Vlad's voice grew heavier as his golden hair began to darken, then his entire body. Soon his entire existence was pure darkness with shades of red. He was no longer disguising himself, and this was the true face of the progenitor, Vlad Dracol Teeps. Vlad recognized his opponent. He was someone Vlad couldn't restrain his power against. You don't become a demon king by being weak that never happens, and Vlad's instincts said. This man, the new Yama, he was strong. Correct. Yama's body pressure started to increase even more. I want to know who is the man that even my grandfather respected. Yama's hands were covered in thick miasma and became sharp claws. Yama positioned himself in an open guard stance and spoke. The situation is simple. The three generals pointed their hands at Vlad and Yama, and magic circles with strange patterns began to appear. Soon a red dome of demonic power began to be created, thus losing Vlad and Yama. Vlad looked around and realized that this space was bigger than it should have been possible. They imitated the same technology which is used to make arenas. Impossible. It had been a while since Vlad was shocked by anything that wasn't Victor-related. The demon war started by Diablos was a surprise but not shocking. Defeat me, and you get the vampires. Simple, right? King of vampires. Indeed. Very simple. Too simple for my taste. Vlad was full of distrust. He didn't believe at all that Yama just wanted to fight him since he didn't give off the same feeling that Scathatch and Victor do. The feeling of a battle maniac. Instead. He felt more like someone shrewd and who likes to plan, someone like his dead son, but just more competent than he was. My king, I didn't find the vampires. I only see traces of destruction. Alexios can contact me, 
meaning I can leave here if necessary. They didn't use that strange magic that negated the powers of the Aelioth. Yes, very simple. A blood sword is created in his hand. A method of dueling that would greatly please the second progenitor and annoy him at the same time. After all, you are using a hostage to make me fight. I understand, I'll go back and observe. Smiling inwardly with satisfaction from his most loyal subordinate, Vlad continued. Fortunately, I am not the second progenitor. Vlad and Yama disappeared as Vlad's blood blade, and Yama's miasma claws clashed, causing a rumble all around them. That tactic won't work on me. The incident of your beloved non-daughter refutes these words. Yama dodged Vlad's attack and retaliated with his claws. Vlad dodged the attack and struck back in an attempt to cut off his head. You got a heart, Vlad. Something you didn't have before. Don't act like you know me, brat. The fight started to get faster, and sounds of metal clashing were heard, and the two opponents were vanishing and reappearing at an insane speed. The surrounding terrain was destroyed just by the casual clash of their weapons. But even with such destruction, it was obvious that the two still weren't fighting seriously, they were just sizing each other up. Ha ha ha, but I know you very well, Vlad. More than you think. Yama backed away and raised his hand in the air, then an ominous miasma began to rapidly form in his hands, and soon a spear-shaped energy construct was created, and that spear started to catch fire. Yama threw the spear towards Vlad, who casually turned his head to the side, making the spear miss. The spear flew toward the ground, and when it touched the ground, a gigantic explosion was heard, followed by a mushroom-shaped smoke cloud. Vlad just looked neutrally at that amount of power. Yama created another spear of power and held it in his hand. Using the spear now as a weapon, he positioned himself and said. Finished warming up. Vlad casually glanced back at Yama, seeing the neutral look on the Demon King's face, the doubts he was feeling only heightened, and he didn't ignore that bad feeling. Therefore, he made the most logical decision here he was going to subdue the enemy as quickly as possible. Vlad raised his hand towards Yama and tried to control the blood in Yama's body, but he was surprised when he realized that he couldn't. Did you think I wouldn't countermeasure your power? Yama disappeared and reappeared behind the progenitor, Vlad. Yama tried to pierce Vlad's body, but just like before, they just passed through his body, or he dodged the attack. At least he thought so. Vlad pulls away from Yama and looks at his dark belly, which is cut open and leaking dark energy. I see. I understand now, you've done your research Yama. Vlad spoke in a very neutral tone as he watched the cut on his body instantly heal. Yama's body stiffened as he felt the atmosphere change and become more oppressive. Vlad raised his head and looked at Yama. Very well, you have my full attention. Yama's smiling face changed to a stern one, and two more arms were created below the normal arms. Vlad's entire body began to distort, his humanity form disappeared completely, and all that was left was something unknown, a kind of liquid biomass of crimson-hued darkness. Blood-red eyes began to open within this liquid, as well as sharp teeth, and soon an abysmal amount of this liquid flew towards Yama. Halfway through, that wave started to turn into a demonic one. Ruhuhuor. Yama threw his spear at the demonic beast, effectively evaporating the beast, the ensuing destruction leaving room for Vlad to interfere. Yama felt someone tapping his shoulder, and when he turned around, he saw Vlad's distorted face. Form and appearance are meaningless to me. I can be whatever I want, whenever I want. Yama's entire body. What? Life began to drain out of Yama's body, and soon his entire body was bursting with blood. As someone who said he knows about me, you died quite quickly, Demon King. Vlad's humanoid form started to reform again, and when he was about to turn around, he narrowed his eyes when he saw something forming on the ground. Of course. It wouldn't be that easy. And in the blink of an eye, Yama's entire body was rebuilt again. I expected that. But still, I couldn't react. 
you truly deserve the strongest vampire reputation, Vlad. My grandfather was right to respect him. When the crown of miasma and fire formed again on Yama's head, the demon king declared. As the strongest of the progenitors, something of equal caliber is needed. Fush. <laughs> Energy exploded from Yama's body and rose to the heavens in a crimson pillar. Warm-up time is over. Chapter 670, True Form Put more energy into the shield quickly. I'm doing it. And don't order me around. I'm in the same position as you. Really? Is this the time for that? It's always time for that. Only my king rules over me. Guys. The third general's voice spoke in a heavy tone, Concentrate. The fight grew more intense, and the two kings showed no signs of slowing down. With every encounter, an explosion happened. With each exchange of blows, the pace of battle increased even more. The first progenitor, Vlad Dracol Teeps, fought in an orthodox way. His posture was not visible, and even his own humanoid body was not visible. But to the more experienced, it was obvious that even in this messy form of a black and crimson type of liquid, Vlad still demonstrated refined martial arts. Tisk, this is how a progenitor fights? In such a cowardly way. The fight was making Yama impatient because just when he thought he was going to land a blow on Vlad, the man dissolved into some kind of dark liquid. The moment Yama spoke his words, the liquid that looked like living blood exploded everywhere, occupying all visible space. I am blood. Vlad's voice echoed everywhere. And the blood is me. The progenitor of vampires is the one who negotiates between life and death using blood as a bargaining chip to obtain the soul. Eyes began to appear all over the living liquid. That is the essence of the progenitor. Ruhuor. The living blood went towards Yama, and as it traveled, several human hands and the heads of monsters appeared. Yama opened his eyes wide, that's. He quickly backed away from where he was. Souls. Living souls. Hundreds of thousands of souls. Blood began to spread around even more as red clouds started to form in the sky, and soon, the sky began to rain blood as well. Why the surprise? Yama looked up and saw a giant blood red eye and several more slightly smaller red eyes. You know about me, right? You must know how I fight. Ugh. Yama looked at his arm and saw several small monsters made of blood biting his skin like a leech. Yama's body was surrounded by a black miasma, thus preventing the bloody rain from falling on his body. Yama felt something holding his leg and saw a hand of blood trying to pull him into the sea of blood. The hand tried to pierce his legs with spikes of blood, but Yama quickly incinerated the blood with the flames of hell and ascended to the heavens. This is dangerous. All this blood. This whole place is Vlad's weapon. He's a damn monster. Blood is my power. Blood is my authority. A means to reach the soul. A swirl of blood began to stir in the sea of bodies, and soon a man emerged. Wrong, a creature emerged. Large wings made of blood, slightly grey skin, eyes with black sclera with irises glowing crimson, slightly pointed ears and a mouth entirely made of sharp teeth with no hint of lips. The creature's hands were made of sharp claws, as were its feet which were long blade-like talons. Black spikes with crimson tips could be seen protruding from the elbows. The creature's entire body had patterns of black tattoos wandering across the body as if they were alive. Yama, as well as the demons who were watching the fight, opened their eyes wide at Vlad's change. Alexios who was watching from a distance, solemnly looked at Vlad's current form. I thought I would never see your real appearance in my lifetime, my king. Vampire count form. Yama spoke dismissively, do you think that's enough to defeat me, Vlad? Wrong. Alexios thought at the same time that Vlad spoke the same words as him. Wrong. Let me clear something up for the ignorant and incompetent. Vlad raised his hand and thousands of blood spikes began to appear around him. 
the vampire count form is nothing more than the most talented vampires recovering the ancient form that was used thousands of years ago in a time when even the current gods did not live. What you are looking at now is my true form. The form of ancient vampires. Our true form. The blood spikes began to rotate horizontally at high speed. The vampire count transformation is not the power boost everyone believes it to be. When a vampire achieves full vampire count form, he is only one step closer to returning to the origins of the past. Our original power. A power that even the strongest monsters of the past feared, and because of that fear, they joined with the other strongest monsters of the time and crippled our race. Vlad's eyes narrowed, and only one thorn flew toward Yama. That thorn caused several sonic booms, and it grazed Yama's cheek, as he barely managed to dodge. That's impossible. You're saying your race is that old? Older than the gods. It's impossible. If that kind of race existed, the self-centered gods would not allow their existence. You think rather small for a king. There are thousands of worlds out there, child. Do you think Earth is such a special place? Yama tried to say something, but he just closed his mouth because he realized that Vlad was correct. Look at Samar and Nightingale. They are completely different planets with their own gods and natives. These beings have their own culture, rules, and past. Is it so hard to believe that vampires weren't originally from this planet? For a demon, you carry the same mentality as humans who think they are so important that they think this tiny planet is the only planet with life in the universe, Vlad spoke in disdain. You dare compare me to such inferior creatures? Yama's eyes gleamed. Yama pointed his hand upwards, and a gigantic wave of flames was thrown into the sky, burning everything in the skies. Even the clouds of blood in the sky burned until they disappeared. Yama's judgment. A mighty surge of power rose to the heavens, and soon an immense rift in the red space was opened. Soon four gigantic hands grabbed the space of the crack. Outside the field of magic, the three generals were suffering a lot to keep everything stable. King Yama is overreacting, this was just supposed to be a test. Why is he doing this? A general shouted. Tisk, tisk, it's because he's a brat, even though he's a king of hell. Why does he get so emotional with Vlad? Does he want to date the man or something? The demons looked at the voice that said that and opened their eyes when they saw a familiar demon wearing full armor. Merlin. Yo, disciples, I see you are in trouble. He raised his hand in casual greeting. Merlin looked into the magic with interest. Vlad in his vampire count form. Or, as he said, his true form. And the brat using his trump card. Merlin felt like wanting to slap Yama. That wasn't the deal. Well, at least he took my advice and did it within the field magic, or it would get complicated to hide everything that's going on here. Merlin raised his hand, and soon several magic circles appeared around the field, reinforcing the magic even more. The three demon generals breathed a sigh of relief. Now that their teacher was here, things would be easier. Hmm? Oya? Oh yeah? Where are the captured vampires? At. Eh. The three demon generals looked around angrily for the vampires and saw that they had disappeared. You guys. Have you lost sight of the vampires? He roared at the lesser demons. W we were too focused on the battle. It wasn't every day you saw two kings fighting. Mah, mah. No need to get irritated. They weren't that important after all, and we had already accomplished our goals when we saw Vlad using his true form. The vampire king is as strong and healthy as ever. It seems that the poison has already been used up in his body. Hey? Did we have a goal? A taller, more muscular-looking demon general asked. Merlin rolled his eyes. That was what he didn't like about demons, most of them were very stupid. Of course you did. Didn't you read the report? I usually don't read the reports. I am a Kuroi. Hearing the strange pronunciation of a language he had never heard before, 
Merlin and the generals looked back at the fight and opened their eyes wide as the strongest vampire controlled the river of blood and corpses. The corpses began to move as if coming to life, and among these corpses, thousands of different monstrous creatures were seen. A hand that was in the rift of space suddenly rushed towards the blood, and as it flew, the hand was completely covered in fire, soon, the punch connected, evaporating everything. The fight was reaching ridiculous proportions. If the fight had taken place outside the magic field, all of South Africa would have already disappeared. The level of destruction happening in that place was apocalyptic. My energy is burning insanely fast, this fight needs to end, or all our plans will go to shit. Merlin thought in frustration at Yama's attitude. The point of everything here was just to test Vlad to see if he had weakened or not and to stroke Yama's ego by fighting the strongest vampire that was respected even by the former Yama. Tisk, he promised he would not overdo it, fucking brat. He even looks like Arthur with that reckless way of his. Roar. A dragon corpse's head came out of the blood and roared toward Yama, spitting fire. Merlin raised an eyebrow when he saw Yama standing still. Is this fool going to take the attack head on? Doesn't he know about the properties of the dragon's breath? Yes, of course, he doesn't know. Keep the magic as stable as possible. I'll be right back. Merlin spoke as he disappeared. Vlad was in a hurry, he didn't know about the technique Yama spoke of, but those hands behind the gap in space weren't a good sign. His instincts said so, and because of that, he went on the offensive. And imagine his surprise when, with the first punch the giant threw, all the souls contained in that river of blood it punched disappeared. What is that? Is it something created by the ruler's authority? Vlad questioned, but he didn't stop moving. Disappearing in the blood, he focused his attention on an ancient dragon he had fought in the past and absorbed. Soon the dragon's head appeared, and the dragon released its breath toward Yama. Seeing that Yama had no intention of leaving his spot, Vlad smiled inwardly. The fool was overconfident. Unfortunately, the fire could not reach Yama because a magic circle appeared in front of the fire, deflecting the fire in another direction. Merlin! Merlin! Vlad narrowed his eyes as he appeared on top of the dragon's head. King Vlad, it is a pleasure to see that you are as healthy as ever, Merlin spoke while bowing. Merlin, you have become a demon. Ironic, isn't it? I, who was once called a demon, ended up actually becoming one. But that's how life is, very unpredictable. The next moment, thousands of magic circles appeared in the sky. Diabolic Zone. Merlin chanted the name of the spell. The entire space around them was shrouded with a thick layer of demonic magic. Vlad raised an eyebrow and threw a blood spike into the dense layer of magic. A total of twelve times, the sound of something breaking was heard until it was stopped by a strong ward, and the thorn disappeared, soon after another twelve wards were re-erected. The look of shock on Vlad's face was visible as he understood what had just happened. A variation of Evie's mana zone. Vlad muttered in surprise. It's not that hard. No need to be shocked. Merlin commented in a humble tone, but by the satisfied smile on his face, it was obvious that he liked Vlad's reaction. Lord Yama, don't you know about the properties of dragon fire? Hmm. Yes, you didn't know. Ugh. Listen well, depending on the dragon's age, a dragon's breath can be extremely deadly to a being's body, be it divine or mortal. Dragon's breath is the only known power that can inflict a cursed type of damage on a being's body that is extremely troublesome to heal. Which means? Yama swallowed hard. If you had received the fire without protection, even if your power and clothing protected most of your body, the other burnt parts would be rendered useless. Therefore, you would have to amputate the aforementioned parts or seek out a mythical creature known as a phoenix for its power of rebirth to heal your body the option of asking a negative world tree for help is also viable. And as you know, both are extremely impossible to find. Fuck. Well, now that you understand, can you pull back? 
Merlin pointed upwards, and in the next moment, he added. We've already completed our objective, and Vlad's most faithful servant retrieved the hostage vampires. What? Disbelief was seen on Yama's face, followed by anger, those fools. I told you to keep an eye out for the vampires. Yama grumbled several times about the incompetence of his generals, and he pointed his hand toward the sky, and with a gesture, the six giant hands began to return to their invisible realm as the rift in space was closed. Anyway, Vampire King. I will see you around, see ya. Merlin made a hand gesture, and several magic circles began to be created under the demons. W wait. And in the next second, they disappeared from the place where Vlad was fighting. Looking around, Vlad raises his eyebrow, did they run away? Soon he started reverting back to his blonde-haired human form. Appearing in the distance, Merlin placed his hand on his chest and took a deep breath. That was close. It might seem like everything was in control, but Merlin was too scared of things going wrong. If it was in a normal situation where he could plan and lure Vlad into a trap in his territory, he would be confident of winning, just as he set several traps when Scat Hatch, Agnes and Natasha appeared in the Amazon realm. But what he did to Vlad was, in a nutshell, reckless. Damned monster destroyed all twelve protection with just one blood spike, I barely managed to defend before the thirteenth broke, and he did it casually. Merlin was sweating profusely now. Merlin. Why did you leave like that? It even felt like we were running away. It's because we were running away, fool. Merlin responded internally. Continuing the fight would just be reckless. Fortunately. Vlad only saw the beginning of your trump card, not the full technique. Well, the technique takes time to get ready. Ha, huh, why did you use the technique anyway? Merlin did not fall for Yama's rage act. I was excited. He spoke with an innocent smile. Merlin wanted to face Palm now. He really is a lot like Arthur before he was king. Look around, my lord. Yama looked around and saw the three generals lying on the ground breathing heavily with their whole bodies sweating like pigs. If the fight continued, we would run out of energy, and his strength would be revealed. We don't want Diablo to know that just yet. We must keep the profile that you only have the power of a high-level god like Thor, and Ares, with the potential to be stronger thanks to the boost of being a ruler. Compliment Vlad by saying he was stronger than you expected but don't say too much. Ugh, I know. Ha, I'm sorry. I got a little carried away. It's okay. I was able to find out a little more about vampire history, which is a welcome thing. Speaking of which, do you think it's true? Most likely so. After all, vampires and werewolves are much more powerful than the legends make them out to be. Wait. Do you think that werewolves are also from another planet? Yama asked. The probability is high. I've never seen a race as in tune with nature as werewolves. For some points in history, they even sound like elves who live in the Norse pantheon. Hmm, in tune with nature, hey. Are you talking about the werewolf transformation? Yes, the one that Volk's ancestor used in hell once. Come to think of it they weren't like the legends said. He didn't turn into a bipedal wolf, but an evolution of the hybrid form. Yama spoke aloud as he thought about the records he read when he was younger. Werewolves and vampires are strangely alike, the two are like opposites of the same coin. While vampires are focused on the quality of individuals, the werewolves have the numbers. While vampires can't walk in sunlight, younger, Less experienced werewolves can't walk in the moonlight, or they'd go mad. There are several factors, but that's a story for another time. For now, let's go back to hell. I got a message that the god of destruction, Shiva, has started to move, he will no longer allow Indra's incompetence. Shit, we need to shut down hell and make sure everything works fine. Should I act like my grandfather? Actually, just say Diablo's demons killed your grandfather. You know how to act. Very well. 
Chapter 671, Furious Maids Harina looked on at the horizon with a worried look on her face. Commander Harina Normally, I wouldn't question your decision, after all, you've always proven to think way ahead of what you seem. But... But... Is this really necessary? Kurika commented in a surprisingly quiet, confused, and nervous voice. For the first time, I'm questioning whether this is really a good idea. Harina thought to herself. She was quite indecisive right now. The sight in front of the two of them was just, unreal. A sea of black flames, followed by another sea of natural colored flames. Several demons floating in the air, clearly alive and thrashing around like pigs waiting to be slaughtered. Several stone statues of formerly living demons. Followed by hordes of hungry ghouls who devoured any visible demons and grew in numbers. What the two were seeing resembled the vision of hell those non-supernatural beings spoke about so much. I never thought those girls were so dangerous. Shutandaji commented as he gulped. He'd come as a backup, but apparently, his strength wasn't needed. In a way, this is the expected result, after all, they all carry the name of Alucard. Harina replied as a solemn expression appeared on her face when she thought of the man who caught her attention. A man who was currently missing in hell, nowhere to be found. I hope you're okay, Vic. She thought gently. H. Harina, what is that? Harina and Shatandaji looked at the place Kurika was looking. And what they saw made both of their eyes widen. A freaking giant snake slithered across the battlefield while the maid, Roberta Alucard, stood on top of the snake's head with her hair moving as if it were alive. Be basilisk. Shatandaji stuttered in shock. A shock was shared by Harina, just when did that creature appear? Harina, Kurika, and Shatan just watched in disbelief as the basilisk slithered across the battlefield while swallowing demons in its venomous fang-filled maw and using its eyes to petrify everyone it looked at. Good, my child. Dot. Roberta and Medusa's voices spoke in a sonorous tone as if two people were talking simultaneously. Honestly, it was disconcerting. Kill everyone, everyone who laid a hand on our husband. A cruel glint appeared in the woman's eyes. She was clearly taking her frustrations out on the demons. This result is natural. Hearing the sudden voice, the three looked to the side and saw Morgana and Mizuki approaching while looking at the chaos the maids were causing. No one would stand before an angry woman, especially those who are supernaturally powerful. Eve, Kagaya, Roberta, and Maria were completely irritated and frustrated with themselves, the demons were the perfect excuse. They were strong, and with that, they could use them for combat training. They were numerous, perfect targets for venting frustrations. And not least, the world would be a safer place when the hordes of whoever the leader of these demons was were slain. See? They are killing three birds with one stone. Efficiency is visible in the acts they were doing. Scathatch personally trained them, and Victor also trained them occasionally, not to mention that each one has Victor's blood inside them. This is a natural result. She repeated, emphasizing the fact. Silently, all three agreed with what Morgana said. Now that Morgana and Mizuki were here, Kagaya, who was previously acting as leader and commander, could let loose. And believe me, the maid had a lot of frustrations in her heart. You don't think it's cruel? Afk. Kagaya cut the throat of the elite demon, who was wearing ancient samurai robes. My master. My beloved master is nowhere to be found. And I'm not beside him. The shadows began to pierce the demon's body as it silently screamed. This never happened before. I have never been away from my master for so long. My beloved master. My beloved husband. This whole situation is because of you. Kagaya's eyes glowed a vicious red. Bunch of sneaky creatures. Kurika and Shutan couldn't help but shudder at the sight. Shutan Daji was really wondering who the demons were here. Kurika squinted at Harina, Morgana, and Mizuki who looked at this vision and thought it was normal. Okay, 
she understood that Harina saw a very dark part of the beings in the war to conquer Japan's supernatural side, but, shouldn't she react more to Kagaya's brutality? Why was she staring at this scene without reaction, like this was normal? It might not look like it, but Kagaya is a lot like Violet, hey! Mizuki commented. I think it's a normal reaction. How would you react if someone you love was taken from you? Morgana asked with a dangerous glint in her eye, giving away her current mood. Very angry, Mizuki growled with obvious annoyance. Correct, Morgana spoke. Oh. Morgana's attention shifted to Maria. Interesting. Maria can even control demon corpses. Is this unusual? Mizuki asked. Yes. When the ghoul's harmful poison reanimates the demon's body, normally, that body will go into a rage. They can't be controlled, in theory. Come on, children, fight, kill, die, and come back to life again. Come back to life to serve me and my beloved master. Her eyes gleamed with malice visible on her face. But this is clearly happening, Mizuki spoke, unfazed by the sight before her. Yes, that's why I said theory. But, as we know, nothing related to Victor and those close to him is normal. She is quite special, this ghoul queen, Morgana added. Remind me not to antagonize you guys. Shutendaji commented. Until now, he thought that Scathatch or even Harina were scary, but he had to reevaluate that perception when he saw how these women reacted. Oh, I forgot to mention, thanks for lending those two men, Harina spoke suddenly. Their skills are very useful, especially for that lucky human. Dot. It's okay, they are Victor's servants and loyal to him for having their lives changed by Victor. Morgana dismissed the thanks with honest words. Still, thank you. They are instrumental in discovering the demon's locations, especially the lucky one. That man has the gift of getting into trouble. Harina was still surprised when she received the report that Watanabe Jintoki, or as they nicknamed him, the lucky one, continuously managed to coincidentally encounter groups of demons on his walks. That human must have been born with his ass facing the moon or something, he's really weird. How can someone be so lucky and unlucky at the same time? Shutton spoke. Alucard once said that Jintoki's power acts more passively. He is lucky, but consequently, everything around him is unlucky. It's as if he sucks the luck from the environment and transfers it to himself. An outrageous skill if that theory is proven correct. Shutton couldn't help but comment. Yuya Shinji is another irregular, he is a living ghost. I have never seen such a unique case until today. Mizuki spoke. Silently everyone agreed with her. Anyway, use two as you see fit. They are now living in Nightingale and get paid a good wage for their hazardous activities, but try not to endanger them too much, after all, they are not war potential. Morgana warned. I know. I only send them out on missions they can complete. Harina replied. I'm happy to hear that. Morgana nodded. Lady Harina, Lady Harina. The group looked towards a fox servant that had three tails. She is here. He shouted as he took a deep breath, he was very tired. Who? The three-tailed fox took a few seconds to compose himself, and soon after, he replied. Amaterasu-sama. She's here to see you. Amaterasu and who else? Harina narrowed her eyes, she wasn't a big fan of the gods, even though Amaterasu was a god-king-level deity, there was no respect in Harina's tone or word choice. No one. She came alone. That's it. Strange. Morgana and Mizuki added. Yes. Very. Harina couldn't help but agree. She didn't even try to scold her subordinate, if Amaterasu wanted to come here, who would stop her? She was a god queen for a reason. She was the one who commanded hundreds of gods in Takamagahara, the Shinto pantheon's paradise. Sitting in front of a black-haired woman wearing the traditional clothes of a feudal queen, the group can't help but feel tense. After all, 
the leader of the gods herself was in front of them. The only ones who looked composed in the room were Harana and Morgana herself, who called Jean through Natalia for backup at some point. Just in case, they left Aphrodite, and the goddesses, in readiness, as well as Scathatch herself. It only took one word for Natalia, who was silently waiting for a response on her communicator, and a portal would appear. Of course, the same portal would appear if she suddenly lost contact with Jean. First. Amaterasu, speaking only after sipping her tea and lowering the cup, opened her eyes, I apologize for coming here without warning or sending a messenger. I understand that my visit may have brought about various problems due to the current, relations of the Yukai and gods. Harana raised her eyebrow at that statement, she didn't expect it. The expression of shock on Genji's face and Yoichi's was quite visible, they also didn't expect this reaction from the goddess. Harana noticed that Amaterasu looked askance at Morgana and Jean for a few seconds. And with that simple gesture that lasted less than a second, she understood, she's being cautious because of the two women. It seems that she realized the power of the two women. Especially Jean. Harana thought. Apology accepted. I only ask that, in the future, I receive some prior communication. Harana replied in a neutral tone with no hint of anything in her tone, just formality. This will not happen again. Amaterasu nodded her head slightly. Unfortunately, due to recent events, I've found myself with no time to spare for formalities. Even now, I have my hands full with my pantheon due to the post-war situation that you all know. So forgive me for being blunt. Amaterasu looked at Harana seriously. Harana Dono, I came here to engage the Yukai in a mutually beneficial deal for the Yukai and gods. Well, I definitely didn't expect that. But it definitely got Harana's attention. She didn't want to work with the gods, not after everything that had happened, but she also couldn't ignore that her faction needed several things, chief among them being connections to various groups and a steady source of income. Currently, the entire faction was being supported by Clan Alucard, even the funding they had came from Alucard, not to mention contacts with important beings like Jean and Morgana. She knew the two women wouldn't be here if she weren't somehow related to Victor. As a faction leader, she knew it was detrimental to depend on just one source, in this case, Victor. Instead, she needed her own influence. Not to mention that she couldn't just ignore the god queen of her local pantheon and just tell her to go home. She would only get her faction in trouble, therefore, she decided to listen. Continue. Chapter 672, God Queen Amaterasu Omikami Currently, we are experiencing a lot of problems managing hell. The souls devoted to our gods since ancient times cannot pass on because my mother, the current ruler, decided that it was not a good idea to continue doing her duties. Amaterasu continued to explain with the grace and attitude of a queen. However, even with this very polite attitude, it was obvious that when she spoke about her mother, a twitch on her face showed her anger towards the woman. The gods are busy trying to keep the system going, and in the meantime, we're looking for a successor worthy of the ruler title. The war has also impacted several lesser gods, and they are seriously injured. Some have even entered eternal sleep and can only function again after several centuries, such as the case of Tsukuyomi who fell in battle to the demons. Due to all these problems, it has become literally impossible to protect Japan, and as you know, a war is still going on, and I don't plan on letting Diablo's demons invade my territory. Protecting my territory is my job too. Which is why we have been exterminating the demons. Harana spoke as she opened her fan, which had the word determination written in Japanese, leaving only her fox eyes visible behind the fan as she continued to watch the goddess. And I thank the yukai for that, but... Once the number of demons goes down, you'll only intervene if there's another massive wave of demons, right? Harana didn't deny it or claim anything, but her silence was proof enough of Amaterasu's assumptions. Despite having killed demons and consequently helped humans, Harana's priority was to protect her people, the yukai. 
Humans indirectly benefited due to these actions, but it wasn't her intention. Once the preparations were done and all the Yukai moved into her territory, she would stop ordering her soldiers to help. After all, that was the work of the gods, not the Yukai. I fully understand that we are not in a position to ask the Yukai for help due to our past history, which is why I came here to hire you. Amaterasu opened her fan with details of a golden sun and pointed to the side. Soon a whirlwind of flames appeared, leaving everyone tense, except for Harana, Morgana and Jean, who watched everything with composure. A few seconds later, a woman with long black hair and two large raven wings appeared. To outsiders, the woman cannot be recognized, but you know her very well, right? Commander Harana. Yomi Haim, the commanders of the ravens, the wife of Tsuko Yomi, and the queen of the Tengu. Harana's eyes sparkled dangerously. Yomi flinched a little at the eyes Harana was giving her. From Harana's point of view, Yomi was nothing more than a traitor who had decided to ally herself with the gods and exploit her own kind. And she hated that kind of person, but... A commander doesn't act on their feelings. After all, if she were to act on her feelings, Genji wouldn't even be her general. Because just like Yomi, he was also a traitor who worked for a goddess. Correction, Lady Harana. Tsukuyomi's ex-wife, Yomi said. Oh. Due to my brother's condition. Secrets were discovered about him. Secrets that upset Lady Yomi. Amaterasu explained evasively without giving too many details. Just like Harana, Amaterasu opened her fan and covered her face. Currently, she is single and seeking marriage. Yomi squirmed when she heard what the woman was saying. I don't want to get married. Unfortunately, given her current sensitive position, she had no choice in the matter. What do you think? How about she marry one of your generals? The goddess asked kindly. I humbly decline. Oh yes. That is a shame. She commented, disappointed. In that case, how about she marry your ally? That way, we will have a triple alliance since she is still affiliated with the gods. Morgana, Jean and Harana narrowed their eyes dangerously at Amaterasu. I cannot speak for my ally, and currently, his representative is unavailable. And even if his representative were here, this alliance would be impossible. Harana knew she was exceeding her limits by saying that it would be an impossible alliance, but she didn't like what she heard one bit. I see. It's really a shame. In that case, I have no choice but to offer myself, right? Excuse me. Harana felt that her supersensitive supernatural ears were failing or something. I think it would be a healthy alliance. After all, a progenitor of vampires with the greatest potential seen since time immemorial marrying a god queen would establish an alliance between the noble vampires, the yukai and the shinto pantheon forever, right? As the saying goes, three birds with one stone. The silence that fell after Amaterasu's proclamation was deafening. Even the sound of a fly was painfully loud in the face of the room's silence. Yoichi and Genji, at that moment, wanted to be anywhere but in this room. Jean was holding Morgana's hand tightly so the woman wouldn't jump on the bitch goddess and try to kill her. Jean wasn't happy either, but her rationality was winning the battle against her instinct. She knew it wouldn't be wise to attack a god queen who came only to negotiate a contract. They would be seen as barbarians by the other supernatural beings if this news got out, which would not be a good thing for a newly formed faction like Harana's. Harana also knew that, and because of that, she was holding back. So she swallowed hard and took a deep breath. As I said before, that kind of decision is not under my authority. Clan Alucard is my ally and my equal. They are not my subordinates. That kind of decision can only be made by the progenitor himself or the wife in charge of external dealings. She was as professional and cordial as possible, but it was taking all her years of experience not to jump in Amaterasu's face. I see. May I know who is the wife responsible for this negotiation? Violet Snow, the heiress of the Snow Clan. Oh. 
is he already married to one of the Countess's heiresses? It seems his influence may be greater than I expected. At best, as progenitor, he has 50% of Nightingale's influence. At worst, he has relevant influence as he is a disciple of Scathatch and married into Clan Snow and Blank. I'm betting more on the first option. After all, you don't have that kind of military power with little influence. Amaterasu thought as she looked at Jean and Morgana. As a god queen, she could easily discern the strength of women. The woman with a demonic trait didn't seem to be that strong. At the very least, she is on the level of her brother Suzanu or Takemi Kazuchi himself. But. The blonde. The blonde was different. She was a monster, she felt the blonde could fight her, and the fight would not be an easy one. These women. I feel like I've seen them sometime in the past. Amaterasu could not erase this discomfort, she was not very attentive to international events. Still, she made a point of keeping an eye on the events of the great factions, such as vampires, werewolves, witches, and the neighboring pantheons that would be the Hindu and the ancient Chinese pantheon. Of course, the faction of angels led by the Heavenly Father was also a must-watch. Tisk, I can't remember. If I only knew their names, I might have a clue. All these thoughts happened in less than a few seconds in the God Queen's head. Violet, hey. Hmm, I'll talk to her later. Morgana and Jean felt their lips twitch at how brazen the Queen of the Shinto Pantheon was, had she no shame or decency. Didn't she live in a culture where that sort of thing was valued? Why was she throwing herself at Victor? May I ask why you are interested in the progenitor? It was Amaterasu's turn to look at Harina in disbelief, with a face that said, You're kidding me, right? Harina's question was very serious, so the god queen replied. Look at this. Amaterasu lifted her finger up, and the image of Victor standing in the middle of an arena with a slight smile on his face appeared. This image was clearly taken when Victor was in Japan and fought Harina. Tisk, I shouldn't have held a public event, but it was necessary at the time, ugh. Harina grumbled. Yomi gulped when she saw that man's appearance again. Despite feeling irritated at being used as a bargaining chip due to her fragile position, she definitely wouldn't mind being sold to that man. Look at this. She made an exaggerated gesture with both of her hands, emphasizing the importance, and tell me you don't want it. See? You can't. Even for a brawn brain like you, he's too attractive. She nodded in satisfaction. A vein popped on Harina's head. Realizing what she said, she says, Oh, I'm sorry for my attitude. I got really excited. She removed the image created with her power and adjusted her posture. Although his appearance is a big reason, as a god queen, I must always prioritize my people. And since I know that eventually, you will marry that man, I am also interested in joining the alliance. How can you say that I will marry the progenitor? Do you like women? or are you impotent? Excuse me. Harina really couldn't believe that this was the goddess who led an entire pantheon. I mean, nothing against it. That kind of relationship existed even in the past, and there were also eunuchs back then too. Veins were popping visibly on Harina's head now. But the point is that even women who like women would be attracted to him. I don't doubt that even straight men would be. So it's obvious to think that you will naturally end up getting pregnant by him and become his wife. It's the most logical solution given your faction's current situation. Harina inhaled and exhaled several times in an attempt to calm down. Goddess Amaterasu, I ask that we return to the main subject. What do you want from my people? She smiled gently. But all those close to Harina knew that she was already about to reach her breaking point. Hmm? Didn't we already talk about that? She asked, quite genuinely confused. No. You didn't. Fuck, what is this goddess's problem? Is she airheaded, or is she pretending? Ugh. Harina grumbled. We haven't talked about it yet. Okay. In that case. She snapped, 
and eight stacked boxes appeared beside her. These are advance payments for our services. In these boxes are various weapons and supplies that can greatly help your faction. Everything in there is crafted by our finest blacksmiths using deadly materials. You still haven't talked about the service you want. Harina interrupted. Oh. An uncomfortable silence fell over the place until Amaterasu continued as if nothing had happened. Anyway, the service is about protection. I need you guys to act as the protectors of Japan, keeping dangerous supernatural entities away. I will be making Lady Yomiheim and her Tengu available as scouts as well. As you know, the Tengu are experts at this. We haven't even taken the job yet. Eh? Are you going to refuse? She spoke with a disbelieving face, genuinely shocked. Apparently, in her head, this deal was already closed. Harina squeezed the fan hard, creating cracks, she really never felt so much like hitting someone before. Apparently, being shameless was the main requirement for being a Pantheon leader. Jean thought with humor, much calmer than before. Incredible. I've never seen material so well done before. Harina looked to the side and saw her grandfather checking the katana blade in front of the boxes. Harina felt her lips twitch when she saw her grandfather's nerve to check the products before she finished the negotiation. Right? We may not be at the forefront of building items like the Greek and Norse pantheon, but our gods aren't mediocre either. She spoke proudly, if it weren't for Hephaestus of the Greek pantheon and the dwarves of the Norse pantheon, our pantheon would be first in the matters of crafting items. Unlike the Greek and Nordic pantheons, which only make items for their own pantheons, the Shinto pantheon markets its items and collects a lot of money and products from outside thanks to this. Although not on the same level as the aforementioned pantheons, the forge of the Shinto pantheon is quite unique and difficult to recreate perfectly. After all, the one who forges these items is a god of culture and a god of the forge. As he is the god of culture, his divine power protects the items to prevent them from being copied or analyzed by other gods of the forge. And even Amaterasu herself helped in this area by providing the flames of the sun as a furnace to create the items. Items crafted by a god queen, a god of culture, and a god of forge are not mediocre. Anyway, now that the deal is closed, I will return to my pantheon. Wait, I haven't closed the deal yet. Eh, aren't you going to agree? This time even Harina's grandfather spoke in unison. I haven't decided yet, Harina spoke strongly. Impossible, Commander Harina, think about it carefully. Look at these items. I've never had such a good katana before. Harina's fan broke due to the force she put in, she really wanted to hit her grandfather right now. She was irritated and very embarrassed now. Stop acting like we're rednecks, old man. I will accept. Famu, good. Go over the details with Lady Yomi. As soon as the deal is completed, I will send another shipment of supplies and weapons. What is the prediction of you gods being active again? If all goes well, in less than a month, we'll be able to find a successor worthy of hell and get back to protection activities. Amaterasu put her hand inside her kimono and took out a token with the kanji sun written on it. Here, take it. She threw it towards Harina. The nine-tailed fox picked up the item and inspected it. This will allow you to talk to me personally and let me know your progress. Do you want a weekly or daily report? Weekly would be enough. Very well. In that case, I will come back. Thanks for the help. She spoke gratefully, then disappeared in a golden light. A hush fell over the room. Ha, she has quite the personality, hey, Yoichi spoke wearily, looking at the katana as if he had found a new toy. Harina, Morgana, and Jean looked at the old man with lifeless eyes. The man felt a shiver run down his spine and looked around for possible enemies. Is it my imagination? Just saying, if you guys harm me the deal will be off. The three women looked at Yomi, who looked like a deer trembling in a cave with three predators. Yomi gulped and feared for her future, but as a leader of her people, she will face it head on.
probably. These women are scary. Chapter 673, The New King of Hell Hell, Middle Floors After the horseman's battle against Alucard, Hell was thrown into chaos. Alucard, the conqueror, as he was affectionately nicknamed by the demons, advanced through Hell, riding his faithful horse Despair, doing what he knew best. Conquering Alucard's demon hordes grew with each conflict, each city he passed through, and the demon hordes grew even larger. After war's defeat, there were no doubts. There was no demon that could stop or prevent Alucard's conquest of Hell. All of the demonic elites were currently in the human world fighting a war that their own king started, even their own king was in the human world. The probability of the demon king, the incarnation of evil, Diablo going back to hell to deal with the threat? Unknown. For high-level demons to go to earth, it's not a simple task. Diablo needed to sacrifice an entire country for him and his elites to be summoned, so if he went back now, he would be trapped in hell, and his whole plan would go down the drain. To more informed demons like Zagan, that was obvious. Diablo won't come back. Not now. Not until the planes in the human world are conquered. And they knew something, too, while Diablo and his elites couldn't return, hell was in Alucard's hands. Alucard's own food. It wasn't long before a horde of hundreds of thousands of demons was seen heading toward the lowest floors of hell. Hell shuddered as if an earthquake were happening, where the horde of demons would pass, everything was dragged with them. Be they cities or demons. Submission or death, the question was clear, the answer even more obvious. And that was the result. Pillar demons knelt down without a fight, high-level demons that were once subordinates of the pillar demons, petty demons that were once citizens of the pillar demons' cities. All kinds of demons of various ranks were there, and they were all following behind a man who was galloping ahead on a black horse. His long black hair was covered in a mass of miasma. His skin was extremely pale as if he were dead, and he had intense blood-red eyes. In the man's hand, a large great sword covered with pure miasma could be seen, and right behind him were three female demons who followed him, either flying like Helena and Vipar or running like Vine. It was obvious that the three women had the highest ranking right after Victor himself, and no one complained about it for many reasons, but the main ones were. First, due to the power Victor gave them they became as strong as the top ten pillars. Second, they had proven themselves capable of their position. Third, fear. Nobody questioned Alucard, nobody would dare. If he says right, you'll go right without question. That was the authority and power that Alucard had gained through his actions. Alucard narrowed his eyes as his vision saw a gigantic gate in the distance. This was the gate leading to the lower levels of hell. The place where the rank 10 pillar demons lived, the place where the king of hell lived. And that gate was closed, something that never happened, at least that's what the memories Victor pulled from the hundreds of demons he consumed said. The gate is closed. Rank 10 pillar subordinates must have closed it as a precaution. Vine spoke. What do we do? We cannot cross if the gate is closed. Vipar spoke. We can demand that dot. Useless. The three women shuddered when they heard Victor's tone, and they quickly looked at the man and saw him raising his great sword to the sky. Fush. <laughs> Miasma, black and immaculate, exploded from Victor's body into the sky, causing the demons behind him to look up in shock. No matter how many times they saw it, the power Alucard wielded was awe inspiring. Envy, and lust for power always grew in the demons when they saw Alucard doing feats that no one in hell had ever achieved before. And it looks like, once again, he's going to do something that will rock all hell. And they weren't wrong. As the miasma gathered on the great sword, the weapon turned into pure darkness, as if Victor were holding darkness itself in his hands. Roxanne's energy surged within him, forcing even more into the great sword. Soon the great sword became the weapon with the greatest power of destruction ever seen in hell, and the proof of that was the next act. A mere gate will not stop me. 
Victor swung the great sword vertically. The world was silent for two seconds, and, in those seconds, it seemed that darkness descended on everyone as they all became blind and deaf. As the seconds passed, the noise of the explosion came, taking the silence along with the darkness. And the image that followed. It was an image that all the demons present here would never forget. The lower gate of hell, the gate that was said to have been created by Lucifer himself and that no one had ever managed to harm, the gate that separated the highest placed demons from the rest of hell, the gate that gave access to the city where the king of hell lived. That gate has been split in half, and the passage that was once closed was now open for all to enter. Holy fuck! Vine muttered in disbelief as she felt the wind of miasma from the lower floors of hell hit her face. I know I should get used to it. After all, he did something similar in the confrontation with war, but... It will take some time. Helena muttered in a tired tone. Something Vipar fully agreed with. It was just plain tiring to watch someone break so many unbreakable facts to hell. It was a fact that hell could not be harmed. No matter how many fights the demons had, hell as a dimension would never suffer. A fact that Victor broke in the fight with war. It was a fact that the gates of hell that separated the lower floors from the upper ones could never be broken or breached. The gate was an artifact itself that was created by Lucifer, a gate that used hell's own energy to sustain itself. A fact that Victor broke again. Although, after he permanently changed the landscape of hell, this feat shouldn't be something surprising. Vipar thought Riley to ease her shock, but it was obvious it wasn't working. During the entire moment, from Victor's attack to his declaration, the man never stopped riding toward the lower floors. He was like an unstoppable force of nature, and nothing could stop him. Those who aren't confident enough to withstand the miasma of the lower levels, wait outside. And when his order reached the ears of all the demons, Several lesser demons stopped flying and moved away from the door a little. They hadn't even entered the lowest level, and they were already shaking with the miasma's toxicity. They could only enter there when they got stronger. Something that frustrated them a lot because they wanted to see Alucard's next achievements. The man was like a very addictive drug, he did things that broke common sense, and although it scared them, it was also something fun to watch. They felt as if they had experienced a historic moment from hell that would be passed on to future generations. Vine put someone to observe and manage the lesser demons. In the future, I intend to make something like a smaller city here for all those who want to enter the lower floors of hell. Yes, my lord. Vine stopped following Victor for a few seconds as she looked at an elite demon and said, You come with me for a few seconds. Why yes. Soon she left with the elite demon to do Victor's bidding. Approaching the gate, Victor didn't even think about it and walked through it, and when he passed, he was faced with the sight of a gigantic city in the distance. I saw it in the demon's memories, but... It's still surprising. Far from what one would expect of hell, the city was brightly lit and clean. The miasma in the place was heavy, extremely heavy, and toxic as if the gravity of the place had increased several times as well. The lower levels of hell, contrary to what was thought, was the place that had the greatest accumulation of land to use. After all, the lower levels of hell were where the true hell was. Where the biggest sinners went and the highest ranked demons lived. The lower levels were the central part of hell. Hell worked like a pyramid while the upper levels had less miasma and fewer lands to explore. The lower levels had a lot of miasma and extensive unexplored land. No wonder this dimension is huge. Victor looked around with his vision and saw that even though this city was gigantic, there were still hundreds of unused lands in the distance. Hell was simply too massive. Victor felt murderous intent, and when he looked at the city again, specifically at the city gate, he saw hundreds of high-level demons in full armor. They looked ready for combat. Alucard. A powerful, booming voice resounded across the battlefield. Victor, and the demons behind him, looked up at a tall, muscular man holding a gigantic red and gold axe in one hand. Stop your foolish attempts at conquest and immediately return to where you entered. 
He dot. Victor's smile grew. And the demons behind him, including Vine, who had returned a few seconds ago, Vipar, and Helena shuddered. Despite not spending much time with Victor, everyone understood that when he flashed that smile, he was either very interested or very annoyed. And neither option was a good thing for the person involved. Victor, still on his horse, rode smoothly towards the big city, Victor's hordes of demons following behind him. Victor stopped in the distance and looked at the demon, his gaze as if he could see the demon's darkest secrets. The demon managed to contain the internal tremor and the fear he was feeling and continued to look at Victor. Alucard. I can feel your fear, demon. Before you demand something from me. First, look at me like you are not about to get your pants dirty. Victor's eyes flashed and a pressure as if gravity itself had increased several times fell throughout the city. The once arrogant and powerful man just fell to the ground as he took a deep breath, and the look of horror in his eyes was visible to everyone. I... I will only say it once. Victor's heavy voice fell around. Open the gates, and submit to me. Or I will open it myself, and when I do, you won't be among the living to tell the story. Now what will you choose? The man, for a moment, felt that he was in a completely different place, and he was surrounded by a sea of blood and corpses. Answer me. He looked up at the sky and saw thousands of blood-red eyes watching him. Hi. Giving a little girl scream of terror, he looked around and spoke. Open the gates. But Lord Amon. Didn't you hear me? Open the fucking gates. Why yes. Fuck this job, fuck my father and his stupid war. I wasn't paid well enough to handle this monster. Lord Amon? Is he a descendant of Amon? Vipar voiced his thoughts out loud. Apparently so, Helena spoke. He has the characteristics of Amon. Oh? Have you met him before? Once in the past, when I came to visit this city with my father. Hmm. Vipar just nodded her head as she looked at Vine who looked at Victor adoringly. Vipar shook her head at blatant fanaticism, even though she could understand. Only someone like her master could instill primal fear in demons. Soon the gate was opened, and Victor's voice resounded in the place. Do not destroy anything, do not kill anything unless they attack first. If any of you try to stir up strife because of your position as a member of my demon hordes, I will know. The demons who were planning to do this shuddered in fear. Power was intoxicating, especially the power of numbers. Victor was absolutely sure that the demons would let this power that wasn't theirs go to their heads. So he already gave a warning, which would be the only warning he would give. He would not forgive insubordination, broke a direct order from him. You will become dog food. Simple and effective. Demons would only follow the one with a firm grip. Kindness was not necessary, mercy was not necessary. They were demons, sin in humanoid form. They would only follow powerful tyrants. It was like that with Lucifer, it was like that with Diablo, and it will be like that with Victor. Spread out around the city, and create a defensive area. The old demonic pillars are in charge of ensuring that not a single soul leaves the city. Yes. Vine, Helena, Vipar. Come with me. Victor looked at the gigantic castle in the distance. It's time to take the throne of hell. Yes. The three spoke at the same time with visible animation on their faces. Soon Victor left towards the city's center, still riding his horse, Despair, which left burning hoof prints everywhere he galloped. This vision was seen by all the demons present. In Diablo's absence, a new king would be born. And Diablo, in the future, will bitterly regret having made the decision to leave Hell. Although it's not like he had a choice, either he left Hell, or all the plans he spent years preparing would go down the drain. Chapter 674, The New King of Hell 2. A gigantic door made of hellish metals opened, and four beings entered a large castle. Footsteps were heard in the large castle, 
and leading a group of three women was a man with long black hair covered in pure fluttering miasma. The small smile on the man's face was unmistakable, and he walked into the place as if he owned it. The group passed through several rooms until they arrived at the gigantic throne room. The moment the man stepped into the throne room, the entire place was lit up with green flames. The man looked at the gigantic throne in front of him, which was created to look down on beings from above, a psychological tactic that even worked for demons. Two identical demons, one with red skin and the other with dark grey skin, stood in front of the throne, acting as protectors for anyone who dared to enter this place. The eyes of the demons that were closed snapped open, and a red glow was seen as immense pressure fell around the intruders. Vine, Helena, and Vipar shrank back, it was obvious that the two demons were elites far above the women themselves. The man ignored this and continued walking while tightly gripping the great sword in his right hand. I'm Zahul. The grey-skinned one spoke. I'm Albu. The red-skinned one spoke. We are the keepers of hell. Vine and Vipar gasped when they heard the names of the two demons. Do you know them? Helena asked. Yes. Just as they declared, they are the guardians of hell. They were here even before Lucifer fell from heaven. Vipar explained. The functions of the guardian of hell is, as the name suggests, to protect hell from destruction, or from a king who is inept who would lead to the destruction of hell. An inept king? Helena asked, confused. Any king who threatens the existence of hell is considered an inept king by them. Vine explained. I see. Helena looked forward again as she followed Victor walking with the same confidence he entered this place with. With each step Victor took toward the demons, the pressure, like the world had fallen on them, grew stronger. The pressure was such that Vine, Helena, and Vipar had to stop accompanying Victor. Victor's smile widened a little, and a red power started to come out of his body as he pushed back the pressure of the two demons. Zahul and Albu opened their eyes wide, that power. It's the lady's power. Before they knew it, they were on their knees with their heads down. Hail the king of hell, the master of life and death, the true king of hell. The two spoke at the same time. Victor raised an eyebrow at the two demons' statement, but instead of asking anything, he walked past the demons and up the steps toward the giant throne. With each step he took toward the throne, the throne itself shrank as if adjusting to Victor's needs. When Victor arrived in front of the throne, the former giant throne was now of an appropriate size, its colors even changed to black and red. Victor let go of Junketsu, and the weapon floated beside the throne as if that had always been its place, and the moment Victor sat on the throne, the entire castle began to change. The colors and interior design changed, and in the next moment, knowledge of what this position required in the schemes of the universe flowed into his mind. All the duties of the king of hell and the being known as ruler flowed into Victor's head. Victor rested his head on his fist and closed his eyes, then a silence fell around him as he absorbed everything that was thrown into his mind. In the meantime, Albu and Zahul remained kneeling, but they continued to talk. As expected. The throne accepted him. Albu spoke. Of course, it accepted him. He is the true king. Zahul spoke. That is more than enough proof. Albu continued. Indeed. Diablo is no longer needed. Zahul added. The keys to hell need to be returned to their rightful owner as soon as possible. Albu declared. The conversation attracted Vine and Vipar, and they wanted to ask what they were talking about but couldn't. Now wasn't the moment. They were just looking somewhat paralyzed at Victor sitting on the most important throne in hell. The throne of the king of hell himself. He really did it, Helena muttered the words that Vine and Vipar were thinking about right now. Just how long? How long did he take to seize the throne for himself? Vipar asked. I don't know. Years have passed since I first met him. Vine spoke. For demons, time was irrelevant. They don't die by age after all, not to mention that time in hell was confusing the further you got into the lower levels. She knew that a lot of time had passed. After all, 
Victor didn't want to rush his conquest, and he always walked with thousands of demons following him, and because of that act, the conquest took even longer. They had to travel from territory to territory in the name of this conquest, and the cities of each demon pillar were hundreds of km away from each other. Even though the middle hell wasn't as massive as the lower hells, it was still a lot of ground to cover by traveling normally. But one thing is certain. Vine said with a twinkle in her eye, he was the fastest individual in history to usurp the throne of hell for himself. Victor opened his eyes as they began to emit a crimson glow. My authority is incomplete. Only when the king recovers the keys to hell from the former king's possession will authority be complete, Albu replied. I see that the flow of souls in hell is messed up. What is going on? Victor asked with a familiarity in his voice that made all three women uncomfortable. The reason for the familiarity is that Victor understood the role of the two demons in front of him in a simple to understand way, they were like big guy was for Roxanne. The interests of the two demons in front of them were only for the well-being of hell and the functionality of hell as a dimension that punished sinners and recycled souls. They were loyal to the king of hell, but only until they deemed the king of hell inept at fulfilling his own role. Diablo, that fool refused to become ruler and messed up the whole system, Zahul spoke. Previously, that role was being played by both Diablo and Lilith, but both currently cannot exert that influence because the ruler is out of hell, Albu commented in displeasure, obviously annoyed. How hasn't hell been destroyed yet? Helena, Vipar, and Vine felt a shiver run down their spines at Victor's casual words. Looking at the three women he chose as generals, he elaborated. When a hell ceases to do its work, that hell is destroyed by the judges of the abyss and the universal tree. Vipar and Vine just opened their eyes in horror at what they had just heard. Abyss judges? Universal tree? What are they? Helena asked, confused not understanding anything. They are the two primordial entities responsible for the soul, judgment, life, and maintenance of reality. The universal tree is a tree that encompasses all existence. He is the father of all world trees and the one who deals with life, reincarnation, and maintenance of reality. The judges of the abyss are the entities responsible for the administration of hell, paradise, and souls. The two work together to keep reality and life going. To make it easier, think of these two beings as the leaders of two renowned clans, and the rulers who are usually the leaders of Hell, and the God Kings, who are the leaders of the Pantheon, are their subordinates. It is clear that despite being your subordinates, these beings have complete autonomy, as long as the system that the two created is working. Helena opened her mouth, and the next moment she closed it. She tried to say something, but she just couldn't trying to digest what she had just heard. She didn't even doubt Victor's words. Why would she do that? She knew her king rarely lied. To answer the question, my king. The situation didn't come to that point because Diablo made a deal with the judges of the abyss in exchange for billions of souls, but I'm not aware of the deal's content. Still, we presume it was an agreement for the primordial entities not to intervene in their plan for a specific period of time. I see. Victor closed his eyes and thought, this explains many events since Diablo's invasion of the Limbo owner's territory and the passive way that the primordial entities were dealing with this matter. From the knowledge Victor now received, it was obvious that what Diablo was doing was disrupting the balance. He managed to stop Limbo while keeping the system running for a period of time. One thing was correct. Diablo was running out of time, he was going to make drastic decisions soon, and Victor didn't want to be trapped in hell when he made those decisions. Why are you calling me my king? From what I understand, the position of king of hell does not have the loyalty of you brothers. You are loyal to hell, not their king. You are special, my king, Zahul said. Our mother's energy is coursing through her veins. Albu spoke. You are the true king of hell. The two spoke at the same time. By your mother's energy, are you talking about this? Victor made a gesture with his finger, and a tree branch began to grow in front of the demons present. Oh! The two demons look at the tree branch with emotion. 
so much energy of negativity and life. Only the true king is able to do that. The two spoke simultaneously as they stared at the branch with fanaticism in their eyes. Ro Alpha D, Nuel, M, Roxanne? It's as you think, darling. The guardians of hell were beings created by Earth's world tree, at least the negative part of it. Since you have my energy in your body, which is very similar to my sister's, they think you are her son or something. Victor nodded. He didn't even need to get the demon's response, their reaction of idolizing the small branch of Roxab's tree was proof enough. L. Life in Hell Life in Hell Am I dreaming? Vine stuttered a lot. And no, you aren't, Vipar spoke. Helena just looked at Victor and then at the tree branch. She repeated this action several times until she just sighed. Sigh. She seemed to have given up a lot in that sigh, a feeling Victor's wives knew all too well. Aya. Uh, you broke them, darling. Roxanne laughed. I forgot that it's impossible for there to be life in hell. What I did is basically impossible without having your energy. Fu fu fu, exactly, worship me more. Now that you will have some rest time, I want my treat. I can arrange that. Yay. Victor made a gesture with his hand, and the small branch of the tree disappeared. What? The two demons screamed. Gentlemen. Victor's call awakened the two demons, and they quickly knelt in servitude. I'm sorry, our king. I will create a garden in the future for you to protect. In return, I want you to explain to me everything the memories of hell haven't told me, including the political climate in hell. The two demons' bodies visibly trembled, having a tree to protect? A tree from their mother? That was the greatest gift for them. They lowered their heads even deeper into the ground, long live the true king of hell. We are yours to command. Order us to do anything. They lifted their faces and looked at Victor with a look that made Victor smile inwardly. Two fanatics. Good, I can work with that. Very well. From now on, I hereby declare you two as the elders of hell. You will not only be the guardians but also the demons that will store all historical events in hell. The two demons opened their eyes even wider. A look that Victor's three generals shared as well. A are you sure? My king. Albu asked. As those who have existed from the beginning, this is your responsibility and your highest honor. History is important. It is through studying the past and understanding it that allows future demons not to make the same mistakes. And it also allows me to manipulate future generations into having an image that will paint me as if I'm Lucifer's second coming in hell or even someone superior to him. Victor wanted to control all demons, from the elite to even the lesser demons. Fear is good, and you can control many people with it. But only respect gives you the true power of the masses. Victor wanted the respect and fanaticism of the demons. He wanted the demons to see Victor as if he were their god. From now on, no one in hell can order you but me and anyone I say so. You will teach me everything you know about the current state of the political climate in hell and tell me everything you know about the former king and his decisions. Helena, Vine, and Vipar will be important individuals in my kingdom in the future, so you will teach them as well. Did I make myself clear? Yes, our king. Your wish is our command, and your will is our will. Chapter 675, A Move That Changed Everything Baal was accompanying Diablo in a destroyed city, and next to him was Lilith, the mother of all demons, who was reduced to an emotionless robot. The preparations are almost done. All that remains is for you to give the order. Diablo nodded his head lightly, the angels are very quiet. He looked towards the destroyed city. I don't like it. They're not falling for my trap. It's like they're expecting something. Diablo stopped walking suddenly. Your Highness. Baal looked at Diablo strangely. A dark red miasma began to seep from Diablo's body, H. He. The sound of teeth grinding was heard as destruction began to happen all around them with just Diablo's presence. The demon king, who was always calm, 
lost his temper, his demonic face distorting even more into a form that would strike fear into any being. This abomination was the very essence of what is called evil incarnate. Alucard. Diablo's distorted demonic voice echoed, destroying everything with pure demonic miasma. Bale jumped back as he watched Diablo with a cold sweat breaking out on his face. Lilith, who was standing in front of the demon, displayed a small smile, and her lifeless eyes had an unnoticeable sadistic gleam. Bale. Feeling a shiver run down his spine as his master called his name, Bale replied. Yes, my king. From now on, all those related to Alucard are enemies. If there are opportunities to kill them, kill them. Bale very much wanted to question Diablo's order because he understood that people who were Alucard's allies were not beings that could be easily destroyed or thoughtlessly antagonized. But with Diablo's current mood right now it was impossible for him to say that, he didn't want to be killed. Your wish is my command, my king. A woman with long immaculate white hair opened her eyes, and her light green eyes were revealed to everyone. The woman got up from where she was sitting and picked up a sword with a white blade and golden runes. Six wings opened behind the woman, and she proclaimed. The time has come. Lady Ariel, will you fight? Daniel, one of Ariel's subordinates, asked. Yes, I will. Determination was noticeable in her tone of voice. The demon's miasma must be purged, the scales must be brought back into balance, or it will be too late. Ariel looked to the side and saw one of her brothers. Like most angels, he had golden hair, green eyes, his unique feature being the six wings behind him, and a tattoo of a star under his eyes. Cassiel. Cassiel, the virtue of diligence, one of the seven virtues, and behind him were two women with their eyes covered by some kind of white mask that had the same symbol as Cassiel's tattoo. Just as our father predicted. Cassiel looked out over the horizon toward the miasma-filled lands. A new king of hell has emerged. Do we already know who it is? We don't know exactly who it is. But our sister, Chastity, spoke a name that appeared in her visions. Azrael. A chill was felt in all the angels present. I am possible. Azrael would not betray our father. Our Azrael wouldn't. Sister, Azrael, quite broadly, is just another name for death. You know our sister's visions are not very accurate. Yes, only you can understand her somehow. Ariel spoke, what does her vision mean then? The king of hell is not an angel, but he is not a demon either. He is someone who walks the fine line of balance. The fine line called life and death. A unique existence indeed. Ariel narrows her eyes. For someone who shouldn't know anything, you seem to know something, brother. I just know what I know, I don't know what I don't know, diligence is the key. Ugh. And there we go again with those vague phrases. Ariel really didn't like that. The new king of hell is not important. What he did to the old king is. With biblical hell in possession of a new king, Diablo can no longer call upon lesser demons, and he has suffered a significant blow to his strength. Ariel didn't comment on Cassiel's attempt to change the subject. She really didn't want to talk to her brother about what he knew. After all, she knew from experience that if he didn't want to say anything, only the Heavenly Father could force him to say it. Being the virtue of diligence, he is really stubborn. This is the perfect opportunity for an attack, the opportunity we've been waiting for. The moment Cassiel finished speaking, all the angels heard a voice in their heads. Sound the trumpets, my children. Judgment Day has arrived. Hundreds of angels flew in the sky with golden trumpets in their hands. Then, Heeding the Heavenly Father's order, they blew their trumpets. Soon, a sound that marked the beginning of the Second Total War was heard throughout the planet. The heavens cleared, and five angels came out, the highest ranking angels. The virtues, the elite of heaven. Come on, sister. We must not keep Michael waiting. Yes. Japan. Did you hear? Jean asked. Yes. Of course, 
Yes, it would be impossible not to hear it, Morgana spoke with a drawn face. The trumpets marked the resumption of war, and the angels would attack in full force, Jean spoke. Something happened that changed the passivity of the angels. We need to know what's going on, Morgana spoke. I don't like being in the dark about this. I feel like this shit is going to involve all supernatural creatures. I received a contact from Amaterasu, Harina said as she entered the place where Jean and Morgana were. Behind her were Kagaya, Eve, Bruna, Maria, and Roberta. Along with Kurika and Genji. What did she say? Morgana asked. To bolster the country's defenses. She will assign gods who are not hurt and who can fight as well. She also said that gigantic monsters are heading towards the battlefield. Monsters? Jean asked. Mythological monsters. Come Hakarna, or as he is known in the supernatural world, the ogres of the Hindu pantheon, he and his kind are heading towards the battlefield. As well as, Yamatano or Akai of the Japanese pantheon. Aren't those monsters supposed to be dead? Jean asked, confused. Yes, they should be. But that's the problem. Harina shuddered with disgust. Necromancy. They were revived as the undead. What? Kagaya, please, Harina spoke gently. Okay. Kagaya walked to the middle of the room and took an item from her shadows, she clicked on the item, and a hologram appeared in the room. Everyone watched in silence as a being covered in miasma revived a snake with eight heads and eight tails. Asmodeus. Morgana snarled, that bastard did he touch necromancy too? I still don't understand. Isn't it just witches who can do necromancy? Bruno asked. Necromancy goes far beyond using magic to reanimate a body and using that body to fight, or using the dead to try to divine the future as witches do. What do you mean? Necromancy is an art that uses dead souls and prevents them from being judged or moving on. What Asmodeus is doing now is far worse than what witches do. He is using innocent souls to reanimate this snake. He is committing one of the greatest sins of breaking a soul into a thousand pieces and preventing that soul from fulfilling its end. If Diablo ordered this to be done to these two monsters, it's safe to assume that he did this to several other monsters as well. Eve began to speak. In every pantheon, there are thousands of monsters that were killed by the gods of the respective pantheons. If he went around the world, taking advantage of the fact that each pantheon wasn't guarding their territory, it's safe to say that he has an army of the undead. A shudder ran through everyone present when they realized that he could have actually done this. We're also forgetting something. He annihilated an entire pantheon, and he might have used the monsters in that pantheon as well. Roberta reminded everyone. He's in a hurry, it's obvious. Something is going on, something we don't know about. Jean spoke. My guess. It's hell. Morgana spoke. We all know who Victor is. He won't just sit around waiting for God knows what to come to rescue him. True. My master is a very active person. If he is in hell and with no one supervising him, he will cause chaos. Kagaya had always watched Victor from the shadows, and she was with him during all of his night walks. She understood well what kind of person he was. Are you saying that Victor did something that unduly forced Diablo to act? I know Victor is exceptional, but isn't that overkill? Kurika spoke. The girls just looked at Kurika with a neutral gaze, not blaming or indicating anything. You say that because you don't know him, Maria said. Master is exceptional, and I am not saying these words because I am his maid but because it is a fact. I know he's exceptional, we all know that, but... It's hell, you know? It's a hostile place. Could he have done so much that affected the Demon King here in the human world? Genji spoke. Yes, he probably did. All the women spoke at once. Kurika and Genji opened their eyes a little when they heard the chorus of voices. Okay, Victor did something. What did he do? Morgana asked. 
Concord Hell. The maid said at the same time. Morgana felt her lips tremble a little, she trusted Victor, and she knew he was exceptional, but conquering Hell was something very difficult to accomplish, you know? Hell has many elites who... Ah, that. Morgana opened her eyes wide. What? Jean asked. Victor conquered Hell. Why are you so sure about that? All of Diablo's elites are here in the human world. In short, Hell is wider open than a whore's pussy. She spoke with a big happy smile. Woman, do you have to be so indecent? Everyone couldn't help but think. Victor is a genius, and time in Hell is pretty unstable. He's probably been there for several years already, and in that time, it wouldn't be surprising if he got stronger, strong enough to be unstoppable in Hell without the strongest elites of Diablo. The maids shuddered a little when they heard that Victor had spent years in Hell already, worry filled their hearts, but they tried not to focus on that feeling right now, after all, they couldn't do anything about it right now. We need to tell the girls this. Jean spoke after some time in silence. Her eyes glowed blood red, and it was fairly obvious that she was excited. If our guesses based on Victor's personality are correct, we can contact Victor in hell. What? A look of shock passed over the girls' faces, then all the girls looked seriously at Jean as all of their blood red eyes sparkled. Explain, Jean, Kagaya spoke in a neutral tone. If Victor truly became the new king of hell, that means he has some authority in hell. Even if that authority isn't complete because Diablo is probably still in possession of the keys to the gates of hell, he might still be able to allow someone to open a portal in hell. That way, we might be able to contact him. Alioth clan. Morgana murmured. Yes, we need help from Alexios. Only he has enough power for that feat. We're heading back now. Eve declared with visible animation on her face, and the maids, except for Kagaya, nodded. Girls, Kagaya spoke in a heavy tone. I know we're excited about what's happening, but, don't forget our allies. This made everyone stop and look at Harina, who maintained a neutral expression. Don't mind me. You've done more than enough in this place. Harina spoke calmly. Impermissible. This is a large-scale battle that could have consequences across the world. As allies, we protect each other. Kagai rejected what Harina said. Not to mention that if something happens to Harina, I don't even want to think about Victor's reaction. Kagai thought. I will stay. Morgana spoke. Someone of my level needs to be here in case some god tries something funny. Me too. Mizuki entered the room, she was wearing a light pink kimono with red leaf patterns. Although I want to talk a lot with Victor, I have to protect my homeland. Where were you? Kagaya asked. Dealing with some ONIs at Harina's request. She looked at Harina and continued, the job is done, the head is with Yoichi. Thank you, Mizuki. To think that I would thank an Onmyoji, my past self would find that ironic. Harina thought. You welcome. I will stay too, Kagaya spoke. The girls opened their eyes in shock as they looked at Kagaya. Mizuki and Morgana weren't surprised they wanted to stay, but Kagaya? This was a shock. Are you going to stay? Are you sure? Jean asked. Kagaya looked at Jean, yes. As head maid, wife and one who is in charge of Clan Alucard. I must prioritize my work and allies. I'm sure my master would want that. Just send me news of him. Jean nodded her head with a gentle smile on her face. The maids looked at each other, and nodded. We'll stay too, Eve stated. At. Eh. Maids weren't taught to walk alone. If our boss is staying, so are we. Maria laughed. Girls. Fu fu fu. You won't get rid of us that easily, Kagaya. Bruno laughed. Thanks, girls. Looks like I'm going alone, hey. Jean spoke with the same gentle smile on her face. She really enjoyed seeing this companionship that Victor's presence developed in the girls. 
Don't forget to send news, Morgana repeated. I know.